Section 26 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Snow Queen. Part 2. Fourth Story. Prince and Princess. Gerda was soon obligated to rest again. A big crow hopped up on the snow just in front of her. It had been sitting looking at her for a long time and wagging its head. Now it said, Caw, caw! Good day, good day! As well as it could. It meant to be kind to the little girl and asked her where she was going alone in the wide world. Gerda understood the word alone and knew how much there was in it, and she told the crow the whole story of her life and adventures and asked if it had seen Kay. The crow nodded his head gravely and said, Maybe I have, maybe I have. What do you really think you have? cried the little girl, nearly smothering him with her kisses. Gently, gently, said the crow. I believe it may have been Kay, but he has forgotten you by this time, I expect, for the princess. Does he live with the princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, said the crow, but it is so difficult to speak your language. If you understand crow's language, I can tell you about it much better. No, I have never learnt it, said Gerda, but grandmother knew it, and used to speak it, if only I had learned it. It doesn't matter, said the crow. I will tell you as well as I can, although I may do it rather badly. Then he told her what he had heard. In this kingdom, where we are now, said he, there lives a princess who was very clever. She has read all the newspapers. Children have a kind language, or gibberish, formed by adding letters or syllables to every word, which is called crow's language in the world, and forgotten them again. So clever is she. One day, she was sitting on her throne, which is not such an amusing thing to do either, they say, and she began humming a tune, which happened to be, Why should I not be married, oh why? Why not indeed, said she and she made up her mind to marry if she could find a husband who had an answer ready when a question was put to him she called all the court ladies together and when they had heard what she wanted they were delighted i like that now they said i was thinking the same thing myself the other day every word i say is true said the crow for i have a tame sweetheart who goes about the palace whenever she likes she told me the story of course his sweetheart was a crow for birds of a feather flock together, and one crow always chooses another. The newspapers all came out immediately with borders of hearts and the princess's initials. They gave notice that any young man who was handsome enough might go up to the palace to speak to the princess. The one who spoke as if he were quite at home and spoke well would be chosen by the princess as her husband. Yes, yes, you may believe me. It is as true as I sit here said the crow. The people came crowding in. There was such running and crushing, but no one was fortunate enough to be chosen, either on the first day or on the second. They could all of them talk well enough in the street, but when they entered the castle gates and saw the guard in silver uniforms, and when they went up the stairs through the row of lackeys and gold-embroidered liveries, their courage forsook them. When they reached the brilliantly lighted reception rooms, and stood in front of the throne where the princess was seated they could think of nothing to say they only echoed her last words and of course that was not what she wanted it was just as if they had all taken some kind of sleeping powder which made them lethargic they did not recover themselves until they got out into the street again and then they had plenty to say there was quite a long line of them reaching from the town gates up to the palace i want to see them myself said the crow. They were hungry and thirsty, but they got nothing at the palace, not even as a much as a glass of tepid water. Some of the wise ones had taken sandwiches with them, but they did not share them with their neighbors. They thought, if the others went in to the princess looking hungry, that there would be more chance for themselves. But Kay, little Kay, asked Gerda, when did he come? He was amongst the crowd? Give me time, give me time. We are just coming to him. It was on the third day that a little personage 
came marching cheerfully along, without either carriage or horse. His eyes sparkled like yours, and he had beautiful long hair, but his clothes were very shabby. Oh, that was Kay, said Gerda gleefully. Then I have found him, and she clapped her hands. He had a little knapsack on his back, said the crow. No, it must have been his sledge. He had it with him when he went away, said Gerda. It may be so, said the crow. It did not look very particularly, but I know from my sweetheart that when he entered the palace gates and saw the lifeguards in their silver uniforms and the lackeys on the stairs in their gold lace liveries, he was not in the least bit abashed. He just nodded to them and said, It must be very tiresome to stand upon the stairs. I am going inside. The rooms were blazing with lights. Privy councillors and excellencies without number were walking about barefoot, carrying golden vessels. It was enough to make you solemn. His boots creaked fearfully, too. But he wasn't a bit upset. Oh, I am sure that was Kay, said Gerda. I know he had a pair of new boots. I heard them creaking in Grandmother's room. Yes, indeed they did creak, said the crow. But nothing daunted. He went straight up to the princess, who was sitting on a pearl, as big as a spinning wheel. Poor simple boy. All the court ladies and their attendants, the courtiers and the gentlemen, each attended by a page, were standing round. The nearer the door they stood, so much the greater was their haughtiness, till the footman's boy, who always wore slippers and stood in the doorway, was almost too proud even to be looked at. It must be awful, said little Gerda, and yet Kay has won the princess? If I had not been a crow, I should have taken her myself, notwithstanding that I am engaged. They say he spoke as well as I could have done myself when I speak crow language, at least, so my sweetheart says. He was a picture of good looks and gallantry, and then he had not come with any idea of wooing the princess, but simply to hear her wisdom. He admired her just as much as she admired him. Indeed, it was Kay then, said Gerda. He was so clever, he could do mental arithmetic up to fractions. Oh, won't you take me to the palace? It's easy enough to talk, said the crow. But how are we to manage it? I will talk to thy tame sweetheart about it. She will have some advice to give us, I dare say. But I am bound to tell you that a little girl like you will never be admitted. Oh, indeed I shall, said Gerda. When Kay hears that I am here, he will come out at once to fetch me. Wait here for me, by the stile, said the crow. Then he wagged his head and flew off. The evening had darkened in before he came back. Caw, caw, he said. She sends you greeting, and here is a little roll for you. She got it out of the kitchen where there is bread enough, and I dare say you are hungry. It is not possible for you to get into the palace. You have bare feet. The guards in silver and the lackeys in gold would never allow you to pass. But don't cry. We shall get you in somehow. My sweetheart knows a little back staircase which leads up to the bedroom, and she knows where the key is kept. Then... They went into the garden, into the great avenue, where the leaves were, softly, one by one, and when the palace lights went out, one after the other, the crow led little Gerda to the back door, which was ajar. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with fear and longing! It was just as if she was about to do something wrong, and yet she only wanted to know if this really was little Kay. Oh, it must be him, she thought, picturing to herself his clever eyes and his long hair. She could see his very smile when they used to sit under the rose trees at home. She thought he would be very glad to see her, and to hear what a long way she had come to find him, and to hear how sad they had been at home when he did not come back. Oh, it was joy mingled with fear. They had now reached the stairs, where a little lamp was burning on the shelf. There stood the tame sweetheart, twisting and turning her head to look at Gerda, who made a curtsy, as grandmother had taught her. My betrothed has spoken so charmingly to me about you, my little miss, she said. Your life, Vita, as it is called, is most touching. If you will take the lamp, I will go on in front. We shall take the straight road here, and we shall meet no one. It seems to me that someone is coming up behind us, said Gerda, as she fancied something rushed past her throwing a shadow on the walls. Horses, with flowing manes and slender legs, huntsmen. Ladies and gentlemen, on horseback. Oh, those are only the dreams, said the crow. 
They come back to take the thoughts of the noble ladies and gentlemen out hunting. That's a good thing, for you will be able to see them all the better in bed. But don't forget, when you are taken into favor, that you show a grateful spirit. Now, there's no need to talk about that, said the crow from the woods. They now came into the first apartment. It was hung with rose-colored satin, embroidered with flowers. Here again the dreams overtook them. They flitted by so quickly that Gerda could not distinguish them. The apartments became one more beautiful than the other. They were enough to bewilder anybody. They now reached the bedroom. The ceiling was like a great palm with crystal leaves, and in the middle of the room, two beds, each like a lily hung from a golden stem. One was white, and in it lay the princess. The other was red, and there lay he, Gerda had come to seek, little Kay. She bent aside one of the crimson leaves, and she saw a little brown neck. It was Kay. She called his name aloud, and held the lamp close to him. Again the dreams rushed through the room on horseback. He awoke, turned his head, and it was not little Kay. It was only the prince's neck, which was like his, but he was young and handsome. The princess peeped out of her lily white bed and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda cried and told them all her story and what the crows had done to help her. You poor little thing, said the prince and princess, and they praised the crows and said that they were not at all angry with them, but they must not do it again. Then they gave them a reward. Would you like your liberty, said the princess, or would you prefer permanent posts? about the court as court crows with perquisites from the kitchen. Both crows curtsied and begged for the permanent posts, for they thought of their old age, and said, It was so good to have something for the old man, as they called it. The prince got up and allowed Gerda to sleep in his bed, and he could not have done more. She folded her little hands and thought, How good the people and animals are. Then she shut her eyes and fell fast asleep. All the dreams came flying back again. This time they looked like angels, and they were dragging a little sledge with Kay sitting on it, and he nodded. But it was only a dream, so it all vanished when she woke. Next day she was dressed in silk and velvet from head to foot. They asked her to stay at the palace and have a good time, but she only begged them to give her a little carriage and horse and a little pair of boots so that she might drive out into the wide world to look for Kay. They gave her a pair of boots and a muff. She was beautifully dressed, and when she was ready to start, there before the door stood a new chariot of pure gold. The prince's and princess's coat of arms were emblazoned on it, and shone like a star. Coachman, footman, and outrider, for there was even an outrider, all wore golden crowns. The prince and princess themselves helped her into the carriage and wished her joy. The wood crow, who was now married, accompanied her for the first three miles. He sat beside Gerda, for he could not ride with his back to the horses. The other crow stood at the door and flapped her wings. She did not go with them, for she suffered from headache, since she had been a kitchen pensioner, the consequence of eating too much. The chariot was stored with sugar biscuits and there were fruit and ginger nuts under the seat. Goodbye, goodbye, cried the prince and princess. Little Gerda wept, and the crow wept too. At the end of the first few miles, the crow said goodbye, and this was the hardest parting of all. It flew up into a tree and flapped its big black wings as long as it could see the chariot which shone like the brightest sunshine. Fifth Story The Little Robber Girl they drove on through a dark wood, where the chariot lighted up the way and blinded the robbers by its glare. It was more than they could bear. "'It's gold! It's gold!' they cried, and darting forward, seized the horses and killed the postilions, the coachman, and footmen. They then dragged little Gerda out of the carriage. "'She is fat, and she is pretty. She has been fattened on nuts,' said the old robber woman, who had a long beard and eyebrows that hung down over her eyes. She is as good as a fat lamb, and how nice she will taste. She drew out her sharp knife as she said this. It glittered horribly. Oh! screamed the old woman at the same moment. 
for her little daughter had come up behind her, and she was biting her ear. She hung on her back, as wild as a savage little animal, as you could wish to find. "'You bad, wicked child!' said the mother, but she was prevented from killing Gerda on this occasion. "'She shall play with me!' said the little robber girl. "'She shall give me her muff and her pretty dress, and she shall sleep in my bed.' Then she bit her mother again and made her dance. All the robbers laughed and said, "'Look at her dancing with her cub!' "'I want to get into the carriage,' said the little robber girl, and she always had her own way, because she was so spoiled and stubborn. She and Gerda got into the carriage, and then they drove over the stubble and stones further and further into the wood. The little robber girl was as big as Gerda, but much stronger. She had broader shoulders and darker skin. Her eyes were quite black, with almost a melancholy expression. She put her arm round Gerda's waist and said, they shan't kill you, as long as I don't get angry with you. You must surely be a princess. No, said little Gerda, and then she told her all her adventures, and how fond she was of Kay. The robber girl looked earnestly at her, gave her a little nod, and said, They shan't kill you, even if I'm angry with you. I will do it myself. Then she dried Gerda's eyes, and stuck her own hands into the pretty muff, which was so soft and warm. At last the chariot stopped. They were in the courtyard of a robber's castle, the walls of which were cracked from top to bottom. Ravens and crows flew in and out of every hole, and big bulldogs, which each looked ready to devour somebody, jumped about as high as they could, but they did not bark, for it was not allowed. A big fire was burning in the middle of the stone floor of the smoky old hall. The smoke all went up the ceiling, where it had to find a way out for itself. Soup was boiling in a big cauldron over the fire, and hares and rabbits were roasting on the spits. "'You shall sleep with me and all my little pets to-night,' said the robber girl. When they had had something to eat and drink, they went along to the corner, which was spread with straw and rugs. There were nearly a hundred pigeons roosting overhead on the rafters and beams. They seemed to be asleep, but they fluttered about a little when the children came in. They are all mine, said the little robber girl, squeezing one of the nearest. She held it by the legs and shook it till it flapped its wings. Kiss it, she cried, dashing it at Gerda's face. Those are the wood pigeons, she added, pointing to some laths fixed across a big hole high up on the walls. They are a regular rabble. They would fly away directly if they were not locked in. And here is my old sweetheart Bee, dragging forward a reindeer by the horn. It was tied up and it had a bright copper ring around its neck. We have to keep him close, too, or he would run off. Every single night I tickle his neck with my bright knife. He is so frightened of it. The little girl produced a long knife out of a hole in the wall and drew it across the reindeer's neck. The poor animal laughed and kicked, and the robber girl laughed and pulled Gerda down into the bed with her. Do you have that knife by you while you are asleep? asked Gerda, looking rather frightened. I always sleep with a knife, said the little robber girl. You never know what will happen. But now tell me again what you told me before about little Kay and why you went out into the world. So Gerda told her all about it again, and the wood pigeons cooed up in their cage above them. The other pigeons were asleep. The little robber girl put her arm around Gerda's neck and went to sleep with the knife in her other hand, and she was soon snoring. But Gerda would not close her eyes. She did not know whether she was to live or to die. The robbers sat round the fire, eating and drinking, and the old woman was turning somersaults. This sight terrified the poor little girl. Then the wood pigeon said, Coo, coo! We have seen little Kay. His sledge was drawn by a white chicken, and he was sitting in the Snow Queen's sledge. It was floating low down over the trees while we were in our nests. She blew upon us young ones, and they all died, except we two. Coo, coo! What are you saying up there? asked Gerda. Where the Snow Queen was going? Do you know anything about it? She was most likely going to Lapland, because there is always snow and ice there. Ask the reindeer who was tied up there. There is ice and snow, and it is a splendid place, said the reindeer. 
you can run and jump about where you like on those big littering plains. The Snow Queen has her summer tent there, but her permanent castle is up at the North Pole, on the island, which is called Spitzbergen. Okay, little Kay, said Gerda. Lie still, or I shall stick the knife into you, said the robber girl. In the morning, Gerda told her all that the wood pigeons had said, and the little robber girl looked quite solemn, but she nodded her head and said, No matter, no matter. Do you know where that land is? she asked the reindeer. Who should know better than I? said the animal. It's Eve's dancing. I was born and brought up there, and I used to leap about on the snowfields. Listen, said the robber girl. You see that all our men folks are away, but mother is still here, and she will stay. But later on in the morning, she will take a drink out of the big bottle there, and after that, she will have a nap. Then I will do something for you. She then jumped out of bed, ran along to her mother, and pulled her beard, and said, Good morning, my own dear nanny goat. And her mother flipped her nose till it was red and blue, but it was all affection. As soon as her mother had had her draught from the bottle and had dropped asleep, the little robber girl went along to the reindeer and said, I should have the greatest pleasure in the world in keeping you here, to tickle you with my knife, because you were such fun then. However, it does not matter. I will untie your halter and help you outside, so that you may run away to Lapland. But you must put your best foot foremost, and take this little girl for me to the Snow Queen's palace, where her playfellow is. I have no doubt you heard what she was telling me, for she spoke loud enough, and you are generally eavesdropping. The reindeer jumped into the air for joy. The robber girl lifted little Gerda up, and had the forethought to tie her on, nay, even to give her a little cushion to sit on. Here, after all, I will give you your fur boots back, for it will be very cold, but I shall keep your muff. It is too pretty to part with. Still you shan't be cold. Here are my mother's big mittens for you. They will reach up to your elbows. Here, stick your hands in. Now. Your hands look just like my nasty mother's. Gerda shed tears of joy. I don't like you to whisper, said the little robber girl. You ought to be looking delighted. And here are two loaves and a ham for you, so that you shan't starve. These things were tied onto the back of the reindeer. The little robber girl opened the door, called in all the big dogs, and then she cut the halter with her knife and said to the reindeer, Now run. But take care of my little girl. Gerda stretched out her hands and the big mittens to the robber girl and said goodbye. And then the reindeer darted over the briars and bushes through the big wood over swamps and plains as fast as it could go. The wolves howled and the ravens screamed while the red lights quivered up in the sky. There are my old northern lights, said the reindeer. See how they flash and on it rushed faster than ever, day and night. The loaves were eaten, and the ham too, and then they were in Lapland. Sixth Story The Lap Woman and the Finn Woman They stopped by a little hut, a very poverty-stricken one. The roof sloped right down to the ground, and the door was so low that the people had to creep on hands and knees when they wanted to go in or out. There was nobody at home here, but an old lap woman, who was frying fish over a train oil lamp. The reindeer told her all Gerda's story, but it told its own first, for it thought it was much the most important. Gerda was so overcome by the cold that she could not speak at all. Oh, you poor creatures, said the lap woman, you've got a long way to go yet. You will have to go hundreds of miles into Finnmark, for the Snow Queen is paying a country visit there, and she burns blue lights every night. I will write a few words on a dried stockfish, for I have no paper. I will give it to you to take to the Finn woman up there. She will be better able to direct you than I can. So when Gerda was warmed and had eaten and drunk something, the lap woman wrote a few words on the dried stockfish and gave it to her, bidding her take good care of it. Then she tied her on to the reindeer again, and off they flew. Flicker, flicker, went the beautiful blue northern lights up in the sky all night long. At last they came to Finnmark, 
and knocked on the Finn woman's chimney, for she had no door at all. There was such a heat inside that the Finn woman went about almost naked. She was little and very grubby. She at once loosened Gerda's things and took off the mittens and the boots, or she would have been too hot. Then she put a piece of ice on the reindeer's head, and after that she read what was written on the stockfish. She read it three times, and then she knew it by heart, and put the fish into the pot for dinner. There was no reason why it should not be eaten, and she never wasted anything. Again the reindeer told its own story first, and then little Gerda's. The Finn woman blinked with her wise eyes, but she said nothing. You are so clever, said the reindeer. I know you can bind all the winds of the world with a bit of sewing cotton. When a skipper unties one knot, he gets a good wind. When he unties two, it blows hard. And if he undoes the third and the fourth, he brings a storm about his head, wild enough to blow down the forest trees. Won't you give the little girl a drink, so that she may have the strength of twelve men to overcome the Snow Queen? The strength of twelve men, said the Finn woman. Yes, that will be about enough. She went along to a shelf and took down a big folded skin, which she unrolled. There were curious characters written on it, and the Finn woman read to the perspiration poured down her forehead. But the reindeer again implored her to give Gerda something, and Gerda looked at her with such beseeching eyes, full of tears, that the Finn woman began blinking again, and drew the reindeer along into a corner, where she whispered to it, at the same time putting a fresh ice on its head. Little Kay is certainly with the Snow Queen, and he is delighted with everything there. He thinks it is the best place in the world, but that is because he has got a splinter of glass in his heart, and a grain of glass in his eye. They will have to come out first, or he will never be human again, and the Snow Queen will keep him in her power. But can't you give little Gerda something to take which will give her power to conquer it all? I can't give her greater power than she already has. Don't you see how great it is? Don't you see how both man and beast have to serve her? How she has got on as well as she has on her bare feet? We must not tell her what power she has that is in her heart, because she is such a sweet, innocent child. If she can't reach the Snow Queen herself, then we can't help her. The Snow Queen's gardens begin just two miles from here. You can carry the little girl as far as that. Put her down by the big bush, standing there in the snow covered with red berries. Don't stand gossiping, but hurry back to me. Then the Finn woman lifted Gerda onto the reindeer's back, and it rushed off as hard as it could. Oh, I have not got my boots, and I have not got my mittens, cried little Gerda. She soon felt the want of them in that cutting wind, but the reindeer did not dare to stop. It ran on till it came to the bush with the red berries. There it put Gerda down and kissed her on the mouth, while big shining tears trickled down its face. Then it ran back again as fast as ever it could. There stood poor little Gerda, without shoes or gloves, in the middle of freezing ice-bound Finmark. She ran forward as quickly as she could. A whole regiment of snowflakes came rushing toward her. They did not fall from the sky, for it was quite clear, with the northern lights shining brightly. No, these snowflakes ran along the ground, and the nearer they came, the bigger they grew. Gerda remembered well how big and ingenious they looked under the magnifying glass. But the size of these was monstrous. They were alive. They were the Snow Queen's advanced guard, and they took the most curious shapes. Some looked like big, horrid porcupines, some like bundles of knotted snakes, with their heads sticking out. Others, again, were like fat little bears with bristling hair, but all were dazzling white and living snowflakes. Then little Gerda said the Lord's Prayer, and the cold was so great that her breath froze as it came out of her mouth, and she could see it like a cloud of smoke in front of her. It grew thicker and thicker, till it formed itself into bright little angels, who grew bigger and bigger when they touched the ground. They all wore helmets and carried shields and spears in their hands. More and more of them appeared, and when Gerda had finished her prayer, she was surrounded by a whole legion. They pierced the snowflakes with their spears and shivered them into hundreds of pieces. 
and little Gerda walked fearlessly and undauntingly through them. The angels touched her hands and her feet, and then she hardly felt how cold it was, but walked quickly on towards the palace of the Snow Queen. Now we must see what Kaya was about. He was not thinking about Gerda at all, least of all that she was just outside the palace. Seventh Story What Happened in the Snow Queen's Palace and Afterwards The palace walls were made of drifted snow, and the windows and doors of the biting winds. There were over a hundred rooms in it, shaped just as the snow had drifted. The biggest one stretched for many miles. They were all lighted by the strongest northern lights. All the rooms were immensely big and empty, and glittering in their iciness. There was never any gaiety in them, not even so much as a ball, for the little bears, when the storms might have turned up as the orchestra, and the polar bears might have walked about on their hind legs and shown off their grand manners. There was never even a little game-playing party, or such games as Touch Last or The Biter Bit. No, not even a little gossip over the coffee cups for the white fox misses. Immense, vast, and cold were the Snow Queen's halls. The northern lights came and went with such regularity that you could count the seconds between their coming and going. In the midst of these never-ending snow halls was a frozen lake. It was broken up on the surface into a thousand bits, but each piece was so exactly like the others that the whole formed a perfect work of art. The Snow Queen sat in the very middle of it when she sat at home. She then said that she was sitting on the mirror of reason, and that it was the best and only one in the world. Little Kay was blue with cold, nay, almost black, but he did not know it, for the Snow Queen had kissed away the icy shiverings, and his heart was little better than a lump of ice. He went about dragging some sharp, flat pieces of ice, which he placed in all sorts of patterns, trying to make something out of them, just as when we are at home have little tablets of wood, with which we make patterns and call them a Chinese puzzle. Kay's patterns were almost ingenious, because they were the ice puzzles of reason. In his eyes they were first-rate, and of the greatest importance. This was because of the grain of glass still in his eye. He made many patterns forming words, but he never could find out the right way to place them for one particular word, a word he was most anxious to make. It was eternity. The Snow Queen had said to him that if he could find out this word, he should be his own master and she would give him the whole world and a new pair of skates, but he could not discover it. Now I am going to fly away to the warm countries, said the Snow Queen. I want to go and peep into the black cauldrons. She meant the volcanoes Etna and Vesuvius by this. I must whiten them a little. It does them good, and the lemons and the grapes too. And away she flew. Kay sat quite alone and all those many miles of empty ice halls. He looked at his bits of ice, and thought and thought, till something gave way within him. It was so stiff and immovable that one might have thought he was frozen to death. Then it was that little Gerda walked into the palace, through the great gates, in a biting wind. She said her evening prayer, and the wind dropped, as if lulled to sleep, and she walked on into the big empty hall. She saw Kay, and knew him at once. She flung her arms around his neck, held him fast, and cried, Kay, little Kay, have I found you at last? But he sat still, rigid and cold. Then little Gerda shed hot tears. They fell upon his breast and penetrated to his heart. Here they thawed the lump of ice and melted the little bit of the mirror which was in it. He looked at her, and she sang, where roses deck the flowery vale, their infant Jesus thee we hail. Then Kay burst into tears. He cried so much that the grain of glass was washed out of his eye. He knew her, and shouted with joy, Gerda! Dear little Gerda, where have you been for such a long time? And where have I been? He looked round and said, How cold it is here! How empty and vast! He kept tight hold of Gerda, who laughed and cried for joy. 
Their happiness was so heavenly that even the bits of ice danced for joy around them, and when they settled down, there they lay, just in the very position the Snow Queen had told Kay he must find out if he was to become his own master and have the whole world and a new pair of skates. Gerda kissed his cheeks, and they grew rosy. She kissed his eyes, and they shone like hers. She kissed his hands and his feet, and he became well and strong. The Snow Queen might come home whenever she liked. His order of release was written there in shining letters of ice. They took hold of each other's hands and wandered out of the big palace. They talked about Grandmother and about the roses upon the roof. Wherever they went, the winds lay still, and the sun broke through the clouds. When they reached the bush with the red berries, they found the reindeer waiting for them. And he had brought another young reindeer with him, whose udders were full. The children drank their warm milk and kissed her on the mouth. And they carried Kay and Gerda first to the Finn woman, in whose heated hut they warmed themselves, and received directions about the homeward journey. Then they went on to the lap woman. She had made new clothes for them and prepared her sledge. Both the reindeer ran by their side to the boundaries of the country. Here the first green buds appeared, and they said goodbye to the reindeer and the lap woman. They heard the first little birds twittering and saw the buds in the forest. Out of it came riding a young girl on a beautiful horse, which Gerda knew, for it had drawn the golden chariot. She had a scarlet cap on her head and pistols in her belt. It was the little robber girl, who was tired of being at home. She was riding northwards to see how she liked it before she tried some other part of the world. She knew them again, and Gerda recognized her with delight. You are a nice fellow to go tramping off, she said to little Kay. I should like to know if you deserve to have somebody running to the end of the world for your sake. But Gerda patted her cheek and asked about the prince and princess. They are traveling in foreign countries, said the robber girl. But the crow? asked Gerda. Oh, the crow is dead, she answered. The tame sweetheart is a widow and goes about with a bit of black wool tied around her leg. She pities herself bitterly, but it's all nonsense. But tell me how you got on yourself and where you found him. Gerda and Kay both told her all about it. Snip, snap, snoor. It's all right at last, then, she said. And she took hold of their hands and promised that if she ever passed through their town, she would pay them a visit. Then she rode off into the wide world. But Kay and Gerda walked on, hand in hand, and wherever they went, they found the most beautiful spring and blooming flowers. Soon they recognized the big town where they lived, with its tall towers, in which the bells still rang their merry peals. They went straight on to Grandmother's door, up the stairs and into her room. Everything was just as they had left it, and the old clock ticked in the corner, and the hands pointed to the time. As they went through the door into the room, they perceived that they were grown up. The roses clustered round the open window, and there stood the two little chairs. Kay and Gerda sat down upon them, still holding each other by the hand. All the cold, empty grandeur of the Snow Queen's palace had passed from their memory like a bad dream. Grandmother sat, in God's warm sunshine, reading from her Bible. Without ye become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Kay and Gerda looked into each other's eyes, and then, all at once, the meaning of the old hymn came to them. Where roses deck the flowery vale, their infant Jesus we the hail. And there they both sat, grown up and yet children, children at heart, and it was summer, warm, beautiful summer. End of section 26「Section 27 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kanzaki Soul. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. A Rose from Homer's Grave The nightingale's love for the rose pervades all the songs of the East. In those silent starlight nights, 
the winged songster invariably brings a serenade to a scented flower. Not far from Smyrna, under the stately plantain trees where the merchant drives his laden camels, which tread heavily on the hollow ground, and carry their long necks proudly, I saw a blooming hedge of roses. Wild doves fluttered from branch to branch of the tall trees, and where the sunbeams caught their wings, they shone like mother of pearl. There was one flower on the rose hedge more beautiful than all the rest, and to this one the nightingale poured out all the yearning of its love. But the rose was silent. Not a single dewdrop lay like a tear of compassion upon its petal, while it bent his head towards a heap of stones. Here rests the greatest singer the world has ever known, said the rose. I will scent his grave and shrew my petals over it when the storm tears them off. The singer of the Iliad returned to earth here. This earth whence I sprang. I arose from Homer's grave, am too sacred to bloom for a mere nightingale. And the nightingale sang till from very grief his heart broke. The camel driver came with his laden camels and his black slaves. His little boy found the dead bird and buried the little songster in Homer's grave. The rose trembled in the wind. Night came. The rose folded her petals tightly and dreamt that it was a beautiful sunny day and that a crowd of strange Frankish men came on a pilgrimage to Homer's grave. Among the strangers was a singer from the north, from the home of mists and northern lights. He broke off the rose and pressed it in a book and so carried it with him to another part of the world, to his distant fatherland. And the rose withered away from grief, lying tightly pressed in the narrow book, till he opened it in his home and said, here is a rose from Homer's grave. Now this is what the flower dreamt, and it woke up shivering in the wind. A dewdrop fell from its petals upon the singer's grave. The sun rose and the day was very hot. The rose bloomed in greater beauty than ever in the warmth of Asia. Footsteps were heard, and the strange Franks whom the rose saw in its dream came up. Among the strangers was a poet from the north. He broke off the rose and pressed a kiss upon its dewy freshness, and carried it with him to the home of mists and northern lights. The relics of the rose rest now like a mummy between the leaves of his Iliad, and as in its dream it hears him say when he opens the book, Here is a rose from Homer's grave. End of section 27 Recording by Kanzaki Soul Section 28 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Par 90. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Emperor's New Clothes. Many years ago there was an emperor who was so excessively fond of new clothes that he spent all his money on them. He cared nothing about his soldiers, nor for the theatre, nor for driving in the woods except for the sake of showing off his new clothes. He had a costume for every hour in the day, and instead of saying as one does about any other king or emperor, he is in his council chamber, here one always said, the emperor is in his dressing room. Life was very gay in the great town where he lived. Hosts of strangers came to visit it every day, and among them, one day, two swindlers. They gave themselves out as weavers, and said that they knew how to weave the most beautiful stuffs imaginable. Not only were the colours and patterns unusually fine, but the clothes that were made of the stuffs had the peculiar quality of becoming invisible to every person who was not fit for the office he held, or if he was impossibly dull. Those must be splendid clothes, thought the emperor. By wearing them, I should be able to discover which men in my kingdom are unfitted for their posts. I shall distinguish the wise men from the fools. Yes, I certainly must order some of that stuff to be woven for me. He paid the two swindlers a lot of money in advance so that they might begin their work at once. They did put up two looms and pretended to weave, but they had nothing whatever upon their shuttles. At the outset they asked for a quantity of the finest silk and the purest gold thread, all of which they put into their own bags while they worked away at the empty looms far into the night. I should like to know how those weavers are getting on with the stuff, thought the emperor. But he felt a little queer when he reflected that anyone who was stupid or unfit for his post would not be able to see it. 
He certainly thought that he need have no fears for himself, but still he thought he would send somebody else first to see how it was getting on. Everybody in the town knew what wonderful power the stuff possessed, and everyone was anxious to see how stupid his neighbour was. I will send my faithful old minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He will be best able to see how the stuff looks, for he is a clever man and no one fulfils his duties better than he does. So the good old minister went into the room where the two swindlers sat working at the empty loom. Heaven preserve us, thought the old minister, opening his eyes very wide. Why, I can't see a thing. But he took care not to say so. Both the swindlers begged him to be good enough to step a little nearer, and asked if he did not think it a good pattern and beautiful colouring. They pointed to the empty loom, and the poor old minister stared as hard as he could, but he could not see anything, for of course there was nothing to see. Good heavens, thought he, is it possible that I am a fool? I have never thought so, and nobody must know it. Am I not fit for my post? It will never do to say that I cannot see the stuffs. Well, sir, you don't say anything about the stuff, said the one who was pretending to weave. Oh, it is beautiful, quite charming, said the old minister, looking through his spectacles. This pattern and these colours, I will certainly tell the emperor that this stuff pleases me very much. We are delighted to hear you say so, said the swindlers. And then they named all the colours and described the peculiar pattern. The old minister paid great attention to what they said, so as to be able to repeat it when he got home to the emperor. Then the swindlers went on to demand more money, more silk, and more gold, to be able to proceed with the weaving. But they put it all into their own pockets. Not a single strand was ever put into the loom, but they went on as before, weaving at the empty loom. The emperor soon sent another faithful official to see how the stuff was getting on, and if it would soon be ready. The same thing happened to him as to the minister. He looked and looked, but as there was only the empty loom, he could see nothing at all. "'Is not this a beautiful piece of stuff?' said both the swindlers, showing and explaining the beautiful pattern and colours which were not there to be seen. "'I know I am not a fool,' thought the man. "'So it must be that I am unfit for my good post. "'It is very strange, though. However, one must not let it appear.' So he praised the stuff he did not see, and assured them of his delight in the beautiful colours and the originality of the design. It is absolutely charming, he said to the emperor. Everybody in the town was talking about this splendid stuff. Now the emperor thought he would like to see it while it was still on the loom. So accompanied by a number of selected courtiers, among whom were the two faithful officials who had already seen the imaginary stuff, he went to visit the crafty impostors who were working away as hard as ever they could at the empty loom. It is magnificent, said both the honest officials. Only see, your majesty, what a design, what colours! And they pointed to the empty loom, for they thought no doubt the others could see the stuff. What? thought the emperor. I see nothing at all. This is terrible. Am I a fool? Am I not fit to be emperor? Why, nothing worse could happen to me. Oh, it is beautiful, said the emperor. It has my highest approval. And he nodded his satisfaction as he gazed at the empty loom. Nothing would induce him to say that he could not see anything. The whole suite gazed and gazed, but saw nothing more than all the others. However, they all exclaimed with his majesty, it is very beautiful, and they advised him to wear a suit made of this wonderful cloth on the occasion of a great procession which was just about to take place. It is magnificent, gorgeous, excellent, went from mouth to mouth. They were all equally delighted with it. The emperor gave each of the rogues an order of knighthood to be worn in their buttonholes and the title of Gentlemen Weavers. The swindlers sat up the whole night before the day on which the procession was to take place, burning sixteen candles, so that people might see how anxious they were to get the emperor's new clothes ready. They pretended to take the stuff off the loom, they cut it out in the air with a huge pair of scissors, and they stitched away with needles without any thread in them. At last they said, Now the emperor's new clothes are ready. The emperor, with his grandest courtiers, went to them himself, and both the swindlers raised one arm in the air as if they were holding something, and said, See, these are the trousers, this is the coat, here is the mantle, 
and so on. It is as light as a spider's web. One might think one had nothing on, but that is the very beauty of it. Yes, said all the courtiers. But they could not see anything, for there was nothing to see. Will your imperial majesty be graciously pleased to take off your clothes, said the impostors, so that we may put on the new ones along here before the great mirror? The emperor took off all his clothes, and the impostors pretended to give him one article of dress after the other, of the new ones which they had pretended to make. They pretended to fasten something round his waist and to tie on something. This was the train, and the emperor turned round and round in front of the mirror. How well his majesty looks in the new clothes! How becoming they are! cried all the people round. What a design, and what colours! They are most gorgeous robes! The canopy is waiting outside, which is to be carried over your majesty in the procession, said the master of the ceremonies. Well, I am quite ready, said the emperor. Don't the clothes fit well? And then he turned round again in front of the mirror, so that he should seem to be looking at his grand things. The chamberlains who were to carry the train stooped and pretended to lift it from the ground with both hands, and they walked along with their hands in the air. They dared not let it appear that they could not see anything. Then the emperor walked along in the procession under the gorgeous canopy, and everybody in the streets and at the windows exclaimed, How beautiful the emperor's new clothes are! What a splendid train! And they fit to perfection! Nobody would let it appear that he could see nothing, for then he would not be fit for his post, or else he was a fool. None of the emperor's clothes had been so successful before. But he's got nothing on, said the little child. Oh, listen to the innocent, said its father. And one person whispered to the other what the child had said. He has nothing on. A child says he has nothing on. But he has nothing on, at last cried all the people. The emperor writhed, for he knew it was true. But he thought, the procession must go on now, so held himself stiffer than ever, and the chamberlains held up the invisible train. End of section 28、section、29 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Pile 90. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Naughty Boy. There was once an old poet. He was a good, honest old poet. One evening, when he was sitting quietly at home, a terrible storm came on. The rain poured down in torrents, but the old poet was warm and cosy in his corner beside the stove. Where the fire blazed brightly and the apples were fizzling. There won't be a dry thread on any poor creature who is out in this rain, said he, for he was such a kind hearted man. Oh, please open the door for me, I'm so cold and so wet, cried a little child outside. It kept on crying and knocking at the door while the rain poured down and the wind shook the windows. Poor little creature, said the old poet as he went to open the door. There stood a little boy who was quite naked, and the water was streaming out of his yellow hair. He was shaking with cold, and if he had not been taken in, he must surely have died of the cold. You poor little fellow, said the old poet, taking him by the hand. Come to me, and I'll soon have you warm. You shall have some wine and a roasted apple, for you are a beautiful boy. And so he really was. His eyes were like two bright stars. And although dripping wet, his hair hung in lovely curls. He looked like a little angel child, but the cold made him very pale, and he was shivering in every limb. He had a beautiful crossbow in his hand, but it was quite spoilt by the rain. All the colours in the pretty arrows had run from the wet. The old poet sat down by the stove and took the little boy on his knee. He wrung the water out of his hair, warmed his hands, and heated some sweet wine for him. He soon recovered, and the roses came back to his cheeks. He jumped down and skipped and danced round the old poet. You are a merry boy, said the old man. What is your name? I'm called Cupid, he answered. Don't you know me? 
There lies my bow, and I know how to shoot with it, I can tell you. Look, it is getting quite fine again. The moon is shining. But your bow is spoilt, said the old poet. That is a pity, said the little boy, and he took it up and looked at it. Oh, it is quite dry again. It is not a bit the worse. The string is quite tight. See, I will try it. He then drew his bow, put an arrow in, took aim, and shot right into the old man's heart. Do you see now that my bow is not spoilt? said he as he ran away laughing. The naughty boy! To shoot the old poet who had been so kind to him, and had given him the warm wine and the best apple. The good old man lay upon the floor and wept. He had really been shot right through the heart. And he said, Fie, what a naughty boy that Cupid is! I will tell all the good children about him, so that they may take care never to play with him, or he will certainly do them some mischief. All the good boys and girls to whom he told this story took good care to avoid wicked little Cupid, but he cheats them over and over again, for he is so crafty. When the students go home from their lectures, he runs along by their side with a black gown on and a book under his arm. They don't recognise him, and take hold of his arm thinking he is a fellow student, but then he sends a dart into their bosoms. When the girls go home from their classes, and even when they are in church, he lays wait for them. He is the same for all time and everyone alike. He sits in the great chandelier in the theatre and makes such a bright hot flame. People fancy it is a lamp, but they are soon undeceived. He runs about the royal gardens and on the ramparts. Nay, once he even shot your father and mother right through the heart. Ask them about it and you will hear what they say. Oh, he is a bad boy, this same Cupid. Never have anything to do with him. He waylays everyone alike, and even your poor old grandmother did not escape his dart. It was a long time ago, and the effect has passed away, but that kind of thing is never forgotten. Fie, fie, wicked little Cupid! But now, you know all about him, so beware. End of section 29《ファイファイウィキッドリトルキューピッド》。Section 30 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. A LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Holger the Dane. There is an old castle in Denmark which is called Krongborg. It juts out into the Sound, and great ships sail past it every day by hundreds. There are Russian and English and Prussian ships, and many other nationalities. They all fire a salute when they pass the old castle. Boom, and the castle answers, boom. That is the way cannons say, "How do you do?" and "Thank you." No ships sail in the winter. The water is frozen over right up to the Swedish coast, and it becomes a great high road. Swedish and Danish flags fly, and the Danes and the Swedes say, "How do you do?" and "Thank you" to each other, not with cannons, but with a friendly shake of the hand. They buy fancy bread and cakes of each other, for strange food tastes best. But old Krongborg is always the chief feature, and down inside it, in the deep dark cellar, lives Holger the Dane. He is clad in steel and iron, and rests his head upon his strong arms, and his long beard hangs over the marble table, where it has grown fast. He sleeps and dreams, but in his dreams he sees all that is happening up there in Denmark. Every Christmas Eve, a holy angel comes and tells him that he has dreamt all right, and that he may go to sleep again, because Denmark. Is not yet in any real danger, but should danger come, then old Holger the Dane will rise up so that the table will burst asunder when he wrenches his beard away from it. Then he will come forward and strike a blow that will resound in all parts of the world. An old grandfather was sitting telling his little grandson all about Holger the Dane, and the little boy knew that all that his grandfather said was true. While the old man was talking, he sat carving a big wooden figure. It was to represent Holger the Dane. As the figurehead of a ship, for the old grandfather was a carver, the sort of man who carves a figurehead for each ship according to its name. Here he had carved Holger the Dane, who stood erect and proud with his long beard. He held in his hand a great broadsword and rested his other hand upon a shield with the Danish arms. The old grandfather had so much to tell about remarkable Danish men and women 
the little boy at last thought he must know as much as holger the dane who after all only dreamt about these things when the little fellow went to bed he thought so much about the things he had heard and he pressed his chin so hard into the quilt that he thought it was a long beard grown fast to it the old grandfather remained still at his work carving away at the last bit of it which was the arms on the shield at last it was finished he looked at it complete and thought of all the things he had heard and read and what he had been telling the little boy in the evening he nodded and wiped his spectacles and put them on again and said well i don't suppose holger the dane will come in my time but perhaps the boy in bed there may see him and have his share of the fighting when the time comes and the old grandfather nodded again and the more he looked at his holger the dane the more plain it became to him that the figure that he had made was a good one he even fancied that the color came into it and that the armor shone like polished steel the hearts in the danish arms got redder and redder and the crowns on the springing lions became golden it's the finest coat of arms in the world said the old man the lions are strength and the hearts are love and tenderness he looked at the uppermost lion and thought about king nuth who bound the mighty england to denmark's throne and he looked at the second lion and thought of valdemar who united denmark and subdued the vandals he looked at the third lion and thought of margaret who united denmark sweden and norway when he looked at the red hearts they shone more brightly than ever they began waving flames of fire and in his thoughts he followed each of them the first led him into a narrow dark prison he saw a prisoner a beautiful woman eleonora unfeld daughter of christian the fourth the flame placed itself like a rose upon her bosom and bloomed in harmony with her heart she was the noblest and best of denmark's women that is one heart in the arms of denmark said the old grandfather and his thoughts followed the next heart which led him out to sea among the thunder of cannon and ships enveloped in smoke and the flame attached itself like an order to vitfield's breast as he to save the fleet blew up his ship and himself with it the third heart led him to the miserable huts of greenland where hans egid the priest labored with loving words and deeds the flame was a star upon his breast one heart more for the danish arms the old grandfather's heart went in advance of the waving flames for he knew whither the flames were leading him frederick the sixth stood in the peasant woman's poor little room and wrote his name with chalk on the beams the flame trembled on his breast trembled in his heart in the peasant woman's room his heart became a heart in denmark's arms and the old grandfather wiped his eyes for he had known king frederick and lived for him king frederick with silvery hair and honest blue eyes and he folded his hands and sat looking pensively before him his daughter-in-law came and told him that it was late and he must rest the supper was ready what a grand figure you have made grandfather she said holger the dean in all our beautiful coat of arms i think i have seen that face before no that you haven't said the old man but i have seen it and often before tried to carve it in wood just as i remember it it was when the english lay in the roads on the second day of april and we knew you were true old danes where i stood on denmark in steen bill's squadron i had a man by my side it seemed as if the balls were afraid of him there he stood singing old ballads fighting and struggling as if he were more than a man i remember his face still but whence he came or whither he went i haven't an idea nor anyone else either i have often thought it must have been old holger the dane himself who had swum down from krongborg to help us in the hour of danger now that's my idea and there stands his portrait the figure threw its shadow right up the wall as high as the ceiling it looked as if it were the real holger the dane himself standing behind the shadow seemed to move but perhaps that was because the candle was not burning very steadily the old man's daughter-in-law kissed him and led him to the big armchair by the table and she and her husband who was the old man's son and father of the little boy in bed sat eating their supper and chatting the old grandfather's head was full of danish lions and danish hearts and strength and gentleness he could talk of nothing else he complained to them that there is another strength beside the strength of the sword and he pointed to the shelf where his books lay all holberg's plays which were so much read because they were so amusing all the characters from olden times were quite familiar to him you see he knew how to fight too said the old man 
he spent all his life in showing up in his plays the follies and peculiarities of those around him then the grandfather nodded to a place above the looking-glass where the almanac hung with a picture of the round tower on it and he said there was Tikobra. he was another who used a sword not to hack at legs and arms but to cut out a plainer path among the stars of heaven and then he whose father belonged to my calling torvaldsen the old woodcarver's son we have seen him ourselves with the silvery locks falling on his broad shoulders whose name is known to all the world ah he is a sculptor and i am only a woodcarver yes holger the dane comes in many guises that the strength of denmark may be known all over the world shall we drink to the health of bert l torvaldsen the little boy in bed distinctly saw the castle of kronborg and the real holger the dane who lived down below it with his beard grown fast to the marble table and dreaming about all that happens above holger the dane also dreamt about the poor little room where the woodcarver lived he heard everything that was said and nodded in his dreams murmuring yes remember me you danish people keep me in mind i shall come in time of need outside kronborg it was bright daylight and the wind bore the notes of the huntsman's horn from the opposite shore the ship sailed past with the greeting boom boom with the answer from kronborg boom boom holger the dane did not wake however loud they thundered because it was only how do you do and many thanks it will have to be a different kind of firing to rouse him but he will wake never fear there is grit in holger the dane end of section thirty Section 31 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo and Eva Davis. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. What the Moon Saw. It is very extraordinary, but when my feelings are most fervent and at their best, my tongue and my hands alike seem tied. I cannot reproduce my impressions, either in words or in painting, as I feel them burning within me. And yet I am an artist. My eye tells me so, and all who have seen my sketches and notes acknowledge the same. I am only a poor lad, and I live in one of the narrowest streets. But light is not wanting to me, for I live high up, and I have a fine view over the roof. For the first few days when I came to live in the town, it seemed very cramped and lonely. Instead of green woods and hills, I only had chimney pots on my horizon. I had not a single friend and there was not even the face of an acquaintance to greet me. One evening I was standing sadly by the window. I opened it and looked out, and there, how pleased I was, I saw a face I knew, a round, friendly face, my best friend at home. It was the moon, the dear old moon, unchanged and looking exactly the same as he used to look, when he peeped at me through the wallows in the marshes. I kissed my hand to him, and he shone straight into my room, and promised to look in at me every evening he was out. This promise he has faithfully kept, and it is only a pity that he stays so short a time. Every time he comes, he tells me something or another, which he has seen the night before. Now paint what I tell you, said he, and you will have a very fine picture book. I have done, as he said, for many evenings, and in my own way I could give a new rendering of the Thousand and One Nights, but that would be too many. Those I give here are not selected, but they come in the order in which I heard them. A highly gifted painter, a poet, or a musician might perhaps make more of them. What I have given here are only hasty sketches, with my own thoughts occasionally interspersed, for the moon did not come every night, 
There were some evenings when he was hidden by the clouds. First Evening Last evening, to give the moon's own words, as I was gliding through the clear atmosphere of India and reflecting myself in the Ganges, I tried to pierce the thick groves of plantain trees, the leaves of which overlay each other as tightly as the horny plates on the back of the turtle. From out of the thicket came a Hindu maiden. She was as light as a gazelle and as beautiful as Eve. There was such an airy grace about her, and yet such firmness of purpose in this daughter of India. I could read her intention in coming. The thorny creepers tore her sandals, but she stepped rapidly onwards. The deer, coming up from the river where they had quenched their thirst, bounded shyly past her, for the girl held in her hand a burning lamp. I could see the blood coursing in her delicate fingers as she bent them round the flame to form a shelter for it. She approached the river and placed the lamp upon the face of the waters, and it floated away on the stream. The flame flickered and seemed as if it would go out, but still it burned, and the dark, sparkling eyes of the girl followed it with a longing glance from under their silken fringes. She knew that if the lamp burned as long as she could follow it with her eyes, her lover lived. But if it went out, he was dead. The lamp burnt and flickered, and her heart burnt and trembled. She sank upon her knees in prayer. By her side in the grass lay a venomous snake, but she heeded it not. She only thought of Brahma and her bridegroom. He lives, she rejoiced. And from the hills came the echo. He lives. Second Evening It was yesterday, the moon told me. I peeped down into a little court surrounded by houses. In it sat a hen with eleven chickens. A charming little girl was skipping about among them. The hen clucked and spread her wings in alarm over her brood. Then the little girl's father came out and scolded her, and I slipped away without thinking any more about it. But tonight, only a few minutes ago, I looked into the same court. At first it was quite quiet. Then the same little girl came out. She crept softly along to the chicken house, lifted the latch, and slipped in beside the hen and chickens. They cackled and flapped their wings, and the little girl ran after them. I saw it all quite plainly, for I peeped in by a hole in the wall. I was quite angry with the naughty child, and felt pleased when her father came and scolded her, more angrily than yesterday. He took her by the arm, and she bent back her head, showing her big blue eyes full of tears. What are you doing here? asked he. She cried and said, I only wanted to get into the hen to kiss her, and to ask her to forgive me for frightening her yesterday, but I was afraid to tell you. The father kissed the sweet innocent upon the forehead, and I kissed her on the eyes and lips. Third Evening In the narrow street close by, it is so narrow that I can only let my beams glide down for a few minutes, but in those minutes I see enough to know what the people are who move about there. I saw a woman sixteen years ago. She was a child. Away in the country she played in the old vicarage garden. The rose hedges were old and past flowering. They were running wild over the paths and sending up long shoots into the apple trees. Here and there grew one poor rose, not lovely as the queen of flowers should be, but the color was there and the fragrance. The parson's little daughter seemed to me a far sweeter flower, 
sitting upon her footstool under the wild hedge, kissing the battered cheeks of her doll. Ten years later, I saw her again. I saw her in a brilliant ballroom. She was the lovely bride of a rich merchant. I was delighted with her happiness, and I often sought her in these quiet evenings. Alas, no one thought of my clear eye or my sharp glances. My rose was also sending out wild shoots, like the roses in the vicarage garden. There are tragedies in everyday life, too. Tonight I saw the last act. There in the narrow street, on a bed, she lay at death's door. The wicked landlord, rough and cruel, her only protector, tore aside the coverlet. Get up, he said. Your face is a sight. Dress yourself up. Paint your face and get some money or I will turn you into the street. Get up at once. Death is in my heart, she said. Oh, let me rest. But he forced her to get up and painted her cheeks and put a wreath of roses in her hair. Then he seated her by the window with the light close by and left her. I gazed upon her as she sat motionless with her hands in her lap, the window flew back, and one of the panes cracked, but she did not move. The curtain fluttered round her like a flame. She was dead. The dead woman at the open window preached a moral to me, my rose from the vicarage garden. Fourth Evening I went to a German play last night, said the moon. It was in a little town. A stable had been turned into a theatre. That is to say, the stalls were left standing and furnished up to make boxes. All the woodwork was covered up with bright paper. A little iron chandelier hung from the low ceiling, and so that it might disappear into the roof, as in a big theatre at the sound of the prompter's bell. An inverted tub was fixed above it. Ring-a-ting went the bell and the little chandelier made a spring of about a foot, and then one knew that the play had begun. A young prince and his consort, who were traveling through the town, were present at the performance. The house was crammed. Only the place under the chandelier was left like a little crater. Not a creature sat there, for the grease dropped. Drop, drop. I saw it all, for it was so warm, that all the loopholes had been open. The lads and lasses outside were peeping in, notwithstanding that the police inside kept threatening them with their sticks. The noble pair sat in a couple of old armchairs close to the orchestra. The burgomaster and his wife usually occupied these, but on this occasion they were obliged to sit on the wooden benches, just as if they had been ordinary citizens. There, you see, there is rank above rank, was the quiet remark of the good wives. And this incident gave a special air of festivity to the entertainment. The chandelier gave its little hops, the crowd was wrapped over the knuckles, and I, yes, the moon, saw the whole entertainment. Fifth Evening Yesterday, said the moon, I looked down upon the life of Paris, and my eye penetrated to some of the apartments in the Louvre. An old grandmother, poorly clad, belonging to the lower classes, accompanied by some of the subordinate attendants, entered the great empty throne room. She wanted to see it. She must see it. It had cost her many small sacrifices and much persuasiveness before she had attained her wish. She folded her thin hands and looked about her as reverently as if she were in a church. It was here, she said, here. And she approached the throne with its rich embroidered velvet hangings. There, she said, there. And she fell upon her knees and kissed the purple carpet. I believe she wept. 
It was not this very velvet, said the attendant, a smile playing round his mouth. But it was here, said the woman. It looked the same. The same, he answered, yet not the same. The windows were smashed to atoms, the doors torn off, and there was blood upon the floors. But still you may say that my grandson died upon the throne of France. Died, repeated the old woman. I don't think anything more was said. They left the room soon after. The twilight faded, and my light grew stronger upon the rich velvet on the throne of France. Who do you think the old woman was? I will tell you a story. It was evening, on the most brilliant day of victory in the July Revolution, when every house was a fortress, every window an embrasure. The populace stormed the Tuileries. Even women and children fought among the combatants. They pressed through the apartments of the palace. A poor, half-grown lad in rags fought bravely among the other insurgents. He fell fatally wounded by bayonet thrusts and sank to the ground in the throne room itself, and his bleeding form was laid upon the throne where his blood streamed over the imperial purple. What a picture that was! The noble room, the struggling groups, a torn banner upon the ground, the tricolor floating from the bayonets, and on the throne the poor dying boy with his pale transparent face and eyes turned towards heaven, while his limbs were already stiffening in death. His naked breast and torn clothing were half hidden by the purple velvet decked with the lilies of France. It had been prophesied at his cradle that he should die on the throne of France. The mother's heart had dreamt of a new Napoleon. My beams have kissed the wreath of immortelles on the lad's grave, and this night they kissed the forehead of the old grandmother while she dreamt and saw the picture you may sketch here, the poor boy upon the throne of France. Sixth Evening I have been in Uppsala, said the moon. I looked down upon the great plain covered with coarse grass in the barren fields. I looked at myself in the waters of the Fiorus River, while the steamers frightened the fishes in among the rushes. The clouds chased each other below me, and threw their shadows on to Odin's, Thor's, and Freya's graves, as they are called. Names have been cut all over the mounds in the short turf. There is no monument here, where travellers can have their names carved, nor rock walls where they may be painted. So the visitors have had the turf cut away, and their names stand out in the bare earth. There is a perfect network of these spread all over the mounds, a form of immortality, which only lasts till the fresh grass grows. A man was standing there, a poet. He emptied the mead horn of its broad silver rim and whispered a name, telling the wind not to betray it. But I heard it and knew it. A count's coronet sparkles over it, and therefore he did not speak it aloud. I smiled. A poet's crown sparkles over his. Eleanor Tess nobility gains luster from Tasso's name. I knew, too, where this rose of beauty blooms. Having said this, the moon was hidden by a cloud. May no clouds come between the poet and his rose. Seventh Evening Along the shore stretches a great forest of oak and beech. Sweet and fragrant is its scent. It is visited every year by hundreds of nightingales. The sea is close by the ever-changing sea, and the broad high road separates the two. One carriage after another rolls by. I do not follow them. My eye rather rests on one particular spot. It is a tumulus or barrow. Brambles and wild sloes grow among its stones, 
Here is real poetry in nature. How do you think people in general interpret it? I will tell you what I heard only last night. First, two rich farmers drove by. Those are some fine trees, said one. There are ten loads of wood in each, answered the other. This will be a hard winter, and last winter we got fourteen dollars a cord. And they were gone. This is a bad bit of road, said the next man who drove along. It's those cursed trees, answered his companion. You don't get a current of air, you only have the breeze from the sea. And then they rolled by. Next, the diligence came along. The passengers were all asleep at the prettiest part of the road. The driver blew his horn. He only thought, how well I am blowing it, and it sounds well here. I wonder what they think of it. And then, the diligence, too, was gone. The next to pass were two lads on horseback. Here we have youth and champagne in the blood, I thought. And indeed, they looked with a smile at the moss-grown hill and the dark thicket. Shouldn't I like a walk here with the miller's Christine, said one, and then they rushed on. The flower scented the air, and every breeze was hushed. It looked as if the sea was a part of the heavens outspread over a deep valley. A carriage drove by in which were six travelers. Four of them were asleep. The fifth was thinking of his new summer coat, and whether it became him. The sixth leant forward and asked the driver if there was anything remarkable about that heap of stones. No, answered the man, it's only a heap of stones, but those trees are remarkable. Tell me about them. Well, they are very remarkable, you see, sir, in winter, when the snow lies deep and every place looks alike. These trees are a landmark to me, and I know I must keep close to them, so as not to drive into the sea. In that way, you see, they are remarkable. And he drove on. Now an artist came along, and his eyes sparkled. He did not say a word, but he whistled, and the nightingale sang, the one louder than the other. Hold your tongues, he cried and took out his notebook and began noting down the colors in the most methodical manner. Blue, lilac, dark brown. It will make a splendid picture. He saw it as a mirror reflects a scene, and in the meantime he whistled a march by Rossini. The last to come by was a poor girl. She rested a moment by the barrow and put down her burden. She turned her pale, pretty face towards the wood, and her eyes shone when she looked upwards to the sky over the sea. She folded her hands, and I think she whispered a prayer. She did not herself understand the feelings which penetrated her, but I know that in years to come this night will often recur to her, with all the lovely scene around her. It will be much more beautiful and truer to nature in her memory then the painter's picture will be, with his exact coloring noted down in a book. My beams followed her, till the dawn kissed her forehead. Eighth evening. There were heavy clouds in the sky, and the moon did not appear at all. I was doubly lonely in my little room, looking up into the sky where the moon ought to have been. My thoughts wandered up to the kind friend, who had told me stories every evening and shown me pictures. What had he not experienced? He had sailed over the angry waters of the flood and looked down upon the ark, as he now did upon me, bringing consolation to the new world which was to arise. When the children of Israel stood weeping by the waters of Babylon, he peeped sadly through the willows where the harps were hung. When Romeo climbed onto the balcony, and a young love's kiss flew like a cherub's thought from earth to heaven, the round moon was hidden behind the dark cypresses in the transparent air. He saw the hero at St. Helena, where he stood on the rock, gazing out over the illimitable ocean, while great thoughts stirred his breast. Nay, 
what could not the moon tell us the life of the world is a story to him tonight i do not see you old friend and i have no picture to draw in remembrance of your visit but as i looked dreamily up at the clouds there appeared one beam from the moon but it was soon gone the black cloud swept over it still it was a greeting a friendly evening greeting to me from the moon ninth evening the air was clear again several evenings had passed while the moon was in its first quarter then i got a new idea for a sketch hear what the moon told me i have followed the polar birds and the swimming whales to the east coast of greenland gaunt ice-covered rocks and dark clouds overhung a valley where willows and bilberry bushes stood in thick bloom and the scented lychnis diffused its fragrance my light was dim and my crescent pale as the leaf of the water lily which has been floating for weeks upon the waters after being torn away from its stem the corona of the northern lights burned with a fierce light the rays spread out from its wide circle over the heavens like whirling columns of fire playing in green and red light the inhabitants were assembled for dancing and merry-making but they had no wonder to bestow on the glorious sight so accustomed to it were they let the souls of the dead play at ball with the walrus's head as much as they like they thought according to their superstitions their attention was entirely centered on the dancing and singing a greenlander without his fur coat stood in the middle of the circle with a small drum in his hand on which he played and at the same time sang a song in praise of seal hunting the chorus answered him with ya ya ah and at the same time hopped round the circle in their white fur coats looking like polar bears they wagged their heads and rolled their eyes in the wildest way then they held a mock court of justice the litigant stepped forward and the plaintiff rehearsed his opponent's faults all in a bold and mocking manner the rest meanwhile dancing to the music of the drum the defendant replied in the same spirit and the assemblage laughingly gave their judgment thunders resounded from the mountains when portions of the ice field slipped away and great masses broke off shivering into dust it was a typical greenland summer night a hundred paces away under a tent of skins lay a sick man life was still coursing through his veins yet he was to die he knew it himself and those standing round him knew it too so much so that his wife was already sewing up the skin robe around him so as not to have to touch the dead man later she asked him will you be buried on the fells in the hard snow or would you rather be sunk in the sea in the sea he whispered and nodded with a sad smile yes the sea is a cosy summer tent said the woman thousands of seals sport about in it and the walrus will sleep at your feet the chase is certain and plenty of it the children howled and tore away the tightened skin from the window so that the dying man might be borne down to the sea the swelling ocean which gave him food for life and now in death a resting place his headstone was the floating iceberg which changes from day to day seals slumber on the ice and the albatross spreads its great wings above it tenth evening i knew an old maid said the moon she used to wear a yellow satin pelisse in winter it was always new and she never varied the fashion of it every summer she used to wear the same straw hat and i believe a bluish gray dress she only used to go and see one old friend who lived across the street but for the last few years she did not go 
for her friend was dead. My old friend bustled about in her loneliness by her window, which was always full of beautiful flowers in summer, and in the winter she grew splendid mustard and cress on a piece of felt. For the last few months she has not appeared at the window, but I knew that she still lived, for I had not seen her take the great journey about which she and her friend talked so much. Yes, she used to say, when my time comes to die, I shall travel much further than I have ever done in my whole life. Our family burial place is twenty miles from here, and I am to be taken there for my last sleep with the rest of my family. Last night, a van stopped at the door and a coffin was carried out, so I knew that she was dead. They put straw round the coffin and drove off. In it slept the quiet old maid, who for the last few years had not been outside the house. The van rattled quickly out of the town, as if bent on a pleasure trip. They went faster still when they reached the high road. The driver looked over his shoulder every now and then. I believe he was half afraid of seeing the old lady sitting there, on the top of the coffin, in her yellow police. Then he whipped up the horses mercilessly and held them in so tightly that they foamed at the mouth. A hare darted across the road, and they got beyond the man's control. The quiet old maid, who, year in, year out, had moved so slowly in her daily round, now that she was dead, was being hurried at a headlong pace over stock and stone along the road. The coffin, which was wrapped in mats, slipped off the van and fell on to the road, while driver, horses, and van rushed away in their wild flight. A little lark flew up from the field and burst into its morning song, right over the coffin. It perched on it and pecked at the matting, as if to tear the shell asunder. Then it rose gaily warbling into the air, and I drew back behind the rosy clouds of dawn. Eleventh Evening It was a bridal feast, said the moon. Songs were sung, toasts were drunk, everything was gay and festive. The guests went away. It was past midnight. The mothers kissed the bride and the bridegroom. Then I saw them alone, but the curtains were almost closely drawn. The comfortable room was lit up by a lamp. Thank goodness they are all gone, said he, kissing her hands and her lips. She smiled and wept and leant her head upon his breast, trembling like the lotus flower upon the flowing waters. They talked together in tender, glowing words. Sleep sweetly, he exclaimed, and she drew aside the window curtain. How beautifully the moon is shining, she said. See how still and clear it is. Then she put out the lamp, and the cozy room was dark, except for my beams, which shone as brightly as his eyes. O oh, womanhood, kiss thou the poet's lyre, when he sings of the mysteries of life. Twelfth Evening I will give you a picture of Pompeii, said the moon. I was in the outskirts of the town, in the street of tombs, as it is called, where the beautiful monuments stand. It is the place where once joyous youths crowned with roses danced with the fair sisters of Lais. Now the stillness of death reigns. German soldiers in the Neapolitan pay keep guard and play at cards and dice. A crowd of strangers from the other side of the mountains came into the town with guides. They wanted to see this city risen from the grave under my full beams. I showed them the chariot tracks in the streets, paved with slabs of lava. I showed them the names on the doors and the signboards still hanging. In the small courtyards they saw the basins of the fountains decorated with shells, but no stream of water played, and no songs resounded from the richly painted chambers where the metal dog guarded the doors. 
it was indeed a city of the dead only vesuvius thundered forth its everlasting hymn the several verses of which are called by man a new eruption we went to the temple of venus built of dazzling white marble with its high altar in front of the broad steps and the weeping willow shooting up among the pillars the air was blue and transparent and in the background stood vesuvius inky black with its column of fire like the stem of a pine tree in the darkness the cloud of smoke looked like the crown of the tree only it was blood red illuminated by the internal flames a songstress was among the company a great and noted one i have seen the homage paid to her in the various capitals of europe when they reached the tragic theatre they all sat down on the stone steps of the amphitheatre they filled up a little corner of it as in centuries gone by the stage still stood with its walled side scenes and two arches in the background through which one sees the same decoration as was seen then nature herself the hills between amalfi and sorrento for a joke the singer mounted the stage and sang for the place inspired her i thought of the wild arab horse when it neighs tosses its mane and tears away her song was so light and yet so assured i also thought of the suffering mother beneath the cross of golgotha who was so full of deep feeling and pain roundabout echoed just as it had done a thousand years ago the sound of applause and delight happy gifted creature they all cried three minutes later the stage was empty and not a sound was to be heard the company departed but the ruins stood unchanged as they will stand for centuries and no one will know of the momentary burst of applause the notes of the beautiful songstress and her smiles they are past and gone even to me they are but a vanished memory thirteenth evening i peeped through the windows of an editor's office said the moon it was somewhere in germany it was well furnished there were many books and a perfect chaos of papers several young men were present and the editor stood by the desk two small books both by young authors were to be reviewed this one has been sent to me he said i have not read it yet but it is nicely got up what do you say about the contents oh said one who was himself a poet it is pretty good a little drawn out perhaps but he's a young man still the verses might be better but the thoughts are sound if a little commonplace what are you to say you can't always think of something new you will be quite safe in praising him although i don't suppose he will ever be a great poet he is well read a first-rate oriental scholar and he has judgment it was he who wrote that nice article on my reflections on domestic life one must be kind to a young man but he must be a regular ass said another man in the room nothing is worse in poetry than mediocrity and he will never rise above it poor fellow said a third and his aunt is so delighted with him it is she mr editor who found so many subscribers to your last translation oh the good woman well i have reviewed the book quite briefly unmistakable talent a welcome offering a flower in the garden of poetry well got up and so on but the other book i suppose the author wants me to buy it i hear it is being praised he has genius don't you think so oh they all harp upon that said the poet but he talks rather wildly and the punctuation is most peculiar it would do him good to pull him to pieces a bit and enrage him or he will think too highly of himself but that would be rather unreasonable cried another don't let us carp at his small faults rather let us rejoice over his good points and he has many he beats all the others heaven preserve us if he is such a genius he will be able to stand some rough handling there are plenty of people to praise him in private don't let us make him mad unmistakable talent wrote the editor with the usual want of care 
that he can write incorrect verses may be seen on page twenty five where there are two false quantities a study of the ancients is recommended and so on i went away said the moon and peeped through the window into the aunt's room where the cherished poet sat the tame one he was worshipped by all the guests and quite happy i sought the other poet the wild one he was also at a large party in the house of one of his admirers where they were talking of the other poet's book i mean to read yours too said mecenas but you know i never tell you anything but what i think and to tell the truth i do not expect great things of you you are too wild and too fantastic but i acknowledge that as a man you are very respectable a young girl sat in the corner and she read in a book these words let stifled genius lie below while you on dullness praise bestow so it has been from ages past and i will be while earth doth last fourteenth evening the moon said to me there are two cottages by the roadside in the wood the doors are low and the windows crooked but the buckthorn and the berberus cluster round them the roofs are overgrown with moss yellow flowers and house leek there are only cabbages and potatoes in the little garden but near the fence is a flowering elder bush and beneath it sat a little girl her brown eyes were fixed upon the old oak between the cottages it had a great gnarled trunk and the crown had been sawn off and the stork had built his nest on the top of the trunk he was standing there now clattering his beak a little boy came out and placed himself beside the girl they were brother and sister what are you looking at he asked i am looking at the stork she said the woman next door has told me that he is going to bring us a little brother or sister tonight, and I am watching to see them come. The stork won't bring one, said the boy. Our neighbor told me the same thing, but she laughed when she said it, and I asked if she dared swear by the name of God, and she dared not. So I know very well that all that nonsense about the stork is just something they make up for us children where will the little baby come from then asked the girl our lord will bring it said the boy god has it under his mantle but nobody can see god and so we shall not see him bring it just then a gust of wind rustled through the leaves of the elder bush and the children clasped their hands and looked at each other it must be god sending the baby they took hold of each other's hands the cottage door opened, and a woman appeared. Come in now, she said. Come in, and see what the stork has brought. It is a little brother. The children nodded. They knew well enough he had come. Fifteenth Evening I was passing over the Limburg Heath, said the moon, and I saw a lonely hut by the wayside. Some leafless trees grew round it on one of which a nightingale was singing. It had lost its way. I knew that it must die of the cold, and that it was its swan song I heard. At daybreak a caravan came along, of emigrant peasants on their way to Bremen or Hamburg to take the ship for America, where good fortune, the fortune of their dreams, was awaiting them. The women were carrying the babies, and the bigger children skipped along beside them. A wretched horse drew a van on which there were a few miserable articles of furniture. A cold wind blew, and a little girl clung closer to her mother, who looked up at my waning disc and thought what bitter need they had endured at home, and of the heavy taxes which could not be paid. Her thoughts were those of the whole caravan, so the red dawn shone upon them, like a glimmer from that sun of fortune which was about to arise they heard the song of the dying nightingale and to them it was no false prophet but rather a harbinger of good fortune the wind whistled sharply and they did not understand its song 
sail on securely over the ocean you have given all that you possessed in return for the journey poor and helpless you will land upon the shores of your canaan you must sell yourself your wife and your children but you shall not suffer long the goddess of death lurks behind the broad fragrant leaves her kiss of welcome will breathe pestilential fever into your blood sail on sail on over the surging waters but the travellers listened happily to the song of the nightingale for it promised them good fortune daylight shone through the floating clouds and peasants were wending their way over the heath to church the women in their black dresses and with white kerchiefs round their heads looked as if they might have stepped down out of the old pictures in the church round about there was only the great dead plain covered with brown withered heather and the white sand hills beyond the women held their prayer books in their hands and wandered on toward the church ah pray pray for those whose steps are leading them to the grave beyond the rolling waters sixteenth evening i know a punchinello said the moon the public shout directly they see him each of his movements is so comic that the whole house roars when he appears his personality makes them laugh not his art even when he was little playing about with the other boys he was already a punchinello nature had made him one she had given him a hump on his back and one on his chest but the inner man the soul ah that was richly endowed no one had deeper feelings or greater elasticity of mind than he the theatre was his ideal world if he had been slender and well made he would have been the first tragedian on any stage the great and the heroic filled his soul and yet he had to be a punchinello even his pain and his melancholy increased the comic dryness of his sharply cut features and called forth laughter from the multitudes who applauded their favorite the pretty columbine was kind and friendly but she preferred marrying the harlequin it would have been far too comic in real life if beauty and the beast had joined hands when punchinella was in low spirits she was the only person who could make him smile nay even laugh outright at first she would be melancholy too then gay and at last full of fun i know what is the matter with you well enough said she you are in love i in love he exclaimed we should be a nice pair how the public would applaud us you are in love she repeated you are in love with me that might very well be said when one knew there was no question of love punchinella laughed and bounded into the air all his melancholy was gone yet she had spoken the truth he loved her worshipped her as he worshipped all that was highest and best in art at her wedding he was the merriest person there but at night he wept bitter tears had the public seen his distorted face they would have indeed have applauded quite lately columbine had died and on the day of her burial harlequin had a holiday was he not a sorrowing widower the manager was obliged to produce something more than usual merry so that the public should not miss pretty columbine therefore punchinello had to be doubly lively he danced and bounded with despair in his heart and he was more applauded than ever bravo bravissimo punchinello was called forward he was indeed above all price last night after the performance the little hunchback wandered out of the town to the lonely churchyard the wreaths were already withering on columbine's grave he sat down upon it it would have made a touching picture with his hand under his chin his eyes turned towards me he was like a monument a punchinello on a grave 
characteristic and comical. If the public had seen their favorite, how they would have shouted, Bravo! Bravissimo! Punchinello! End of section 31section thirty two of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo and eva davis fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas what the moon saw seventeenth evening listen to what the moon told me i have seen the cadet become an officer and for the first time put on his handsome uniform i have seen the young girl in her ball dress and i have seen a royal bride rejoicing in her festal robes but i have never seen greater delight than i saw last night in a child a little four-year-old girl she had on a new blue frock and a pink hat they had just been put on, and the bystanders were calling for lights. The moon shining through the window gave too faint a light. They must have something brighter altogether. There stood the little girl, as stiff as any doll, holding her arms away from the dress, each finger stuck stiffly out. Oh, how her eyes glistened, and her whole face beamed with delight. Tomorrow you shall go out in them, said the mother and the little one looked down at her frock and smiled contentedly. Mother, she said, what will the dogs think when they see me in all my pretty things? Eighteenth Evening I have told you, said the moon, about Pompeii, that city of the dead resuscitated, and again ranking among living places. I know another town even more fantastic. It is not so much the corpse as it is the ghost of a city. I seem to hear the romance of the floating city wherever the fountains play into their marble basins. Yes, water must tell its story. The waves of the sea sing its song. A mist often floats over the stretches of its waters. That is its veil of widowhood. The bridegroom of the sea is dead. His palace and town are now his mausoleum. Do you know this city? Never has the roll of wheels or the clatter of horses' hoofs been heard in its streets. The fish swim in them, and the black gondola skims over the surface of its green waters. I will show you, continued the moon, the form of the town, its grand square and you may imagine yourself to have been in fairyland. The grass grows between its broad flags, and at dawn thousands of tame pigeons flutter round its solitary lofty tower. On three sides of it you are surrounded by colonnades. Under their shelter the silent Turk sits smoking his long pipe. A handsome Greek boy leans against the columns and looks up at the trophies and lofty mast raised around memorials of its ancient power the flags droop from them like morning scarves here a girl is resting she has put down her heavy water pails and the oak in which she carried them hangs on her shoulders she supports herself against the column of victory that is no fairy palace there in front of you it is a church its gilt cupolas and balls glitter in my beams. Those majestic bronze horses have traveled, like the bronze horse in the fairy tale. They came hither, went hence, and again returned. Do you see the gorgeous coloring on the walls and in the window panes? It looks as if genius had given way to the whims of some child in adorning the wonderful temple. Do you see the winged lion on its column? The gold still glitters, but its wings are bound. The lion is dead, for the king of the sea is dead. His great halls are empty, 
and there were only bare walls now where costly pictures used to hang the lazzaroni sleep now under the arches on whose floor only the highest nobles in the land dared at one time to tread from the deep wells or does it come from the leaden chambers near the bridge of sighs sounds a groan just as in the days when tambourines sounded from the gondolas with their gay trappings when the bridal ring flew from the brilliant bucentaur to adria queen of the sea o oh, adria wrap thyself in the mist let thy widow's veil cover thy bosom hang it over the mausoleum of the bridegroom o oh, venice thou city of ghostly marble palaces nineteenth evening i was looking down on a large theatre said the moon the whole house was crammed with spectators for a new actor was to make his debut my beams glided over a little window in the wall a painted face was pressed against its panes it was the hero of the evening the knightly beard curled around his chin but there were tears in the man's eyes for he had been hissed off the stage and rightly hissed off poor fellow but a poor fellow can't be tolerated in the kingdom of art his feelings were deep and he loved his art enthusiastically but art did not love him the call bell rang the hero enters boldly and gallantly was the stage direction he had to face an audience to whom he was a laughing stock when the piece came to an end i saw a man muffled in a cloak creep downstairs it was the crushed night of the evening the scene shifters whispered to each other i followed the poor wretch to his home hanging is an ugly death and one has not always got poison at hand i know he thought of both i saw him look at his pale face in the glass and half shut his eyes to see if he would be a handsome corpse a man may be most unhappy and yet very affected he thought of death of suicide i believe he wept over himself he wept bitterly and when a man has been able to shed tears he does not kill himself a whole year has passed since then there was a play being acted at a small theatre by a poor touring company i saw a well-known face the painted cheeks and curly beard he looked up at me and smiled and yet he had been hissed off the stage only a minute ago hissed by a miserable low-class audience in a wretched theatre tonight a poor hearse drove out of the town gates not a soul following it it was a suicide our poor painted despised hero the driver was the only mourner nobody else only the moon the suicide is laid at the corner of the churchyard under the wall the nettles will soon shoot up and the grave diggers will throw weeds and rubbish on it from other graves twentieth evening i come from rome said the moon there in the middle of the town on the summit of one of the seven hills stands the ruins of the palace of caesars the wild fig grows now in the crevices of the walls covering their nakedness with its broad grayish-green leaves the ass treads down its laurel hedges among the heaps of stones and browses on the barren thistle here whence once the eagles of rome fluttered came saw and conquered there is now the entrance to a poor little hovel plastered up with clay between the two broken marble columns the vine hangs like a mourning wreath over its crooked windows an old woman lives in it with her little granddaughter they now rule in the palace of the caesars and show its treasures to visitors there is only a bare wall left standing of the rich throne room the dark cypress points with its long shadows to where the throne once stood the earth is heaped high over the ruined floor and a little girl 
now sole daughter of the Caesars, often brings her footstool there when the evening bell rings. She calls the keyhole in the door close by her balcony, for she can see half Rome through it, as far as the mighty dome of St. Peter's. Silence reigned, as always this evening, when the little girl came out into the full light of my beams. She was carrying a water jar of antique shape on her head. Her feet were bare, her short skirt and the sleeves of her little chemise were ragged. I kissed the child's delicately rounded shoulders, her dark eyes and black shining hair. She climbed up the steps to the little house. They were steep and made of sharp bits of marble from the broken columns. Gaily colored lizards darted out among her feet, but they did not startle her. She was just raising her hand to the bell pole. This was a hare's foot at the end of a piece of string, such as the bell now in the palace of the Caesars. She paused a moment. What was she thinking about? Perhaps about the beautiful infant Jesus wrapped in gold and silver down in the chapel, where the silver lamps gleamed and where her little friends took part in singing the hymns which she knew too. I do not know. She moved forward again, tripped, and the jar fell from her head onto the steps, where it was broken to atoms among the fluted marble. She burst into tears, the beautiful daughter of the Caesars, weeping over the poor broken jar. There she stood with her bare feet, weeping, and dared not pull the string, the bell rope of the palace of the Caesars. 21st Evening The moon had not shone for over a fortnight, but now I saw it again. It rose round and bright above the slowly moving clouds. Listen to what it told me. I followed a caravan from one of the towns of the Fazan. They made a halt near the desert by one of the salt plains. It shone like a sheet of ice and was covered only in parts with quicksands. An elder among them with a water bottle hanging at his belt and a bag of unleavened bread lying by him drew a square with his staff in the sand and wrote in it some words from the Koran. After this, the whole caravan entered within the consecrated space. A young merchant, a child of the sun, I saw it in his eyes and in the beautiful lines of his figure, rode his fiery white steed thoughtfully. Was he perhaps thinking of his fair young wife? It was only two days since a camel covered with skins and costly shawls carried her, his lovely bride, round the walls of the town to the sound of drums and pipes. Women sang, and festive salvos were fired. The loudest and most frequent were fired by the bridegroom himself. And now, now he was leading the caravan through the desert. I followed them for many nights. I saw them rest by the walls among the dwarf palms. They stuck their knives into the breast of the fallen camel and roasted the meat by the fire. My beams cooled the burning sand. My beams showed them the buried rocks like submerged islands in a sea of sand. They encountered no unfriendly tribes on the trackless plain. No storms arose and no sandstorm swept mercilessly over the caravan. At home, the lovely wife prayed for her husband and her father. Are they dead? she asked my golden horns. Are they dead? she asked my shining disc. Now the desert lies behind them, and this evening they sit beneath the lofty palm trees, where the crane spreads its broad wings and the pelican watches them through the branches of the mimosa. The luxuriant thicket is trodden down by the heavy feet of the elephant. A troop of negroes are returning from the market far inland. The women have copper beads twisted round their heads of frizzled hair, and they are clad in skirts of indigo blue. 
they drive the heavily laden oxen on whose backs the naked black children lie sleeping a negro leads by a rope a young lion which he has bought they approach the caravan the young merchant sits motionless and silent thinking of his lovely bride dreaming in the land of the blacks of his white flower beyond the desert he lifts his head a cloud passed over the moon, and then another. I heard no more that evening. Twenty-second evening I saw a little girl crying, said the moon. She was crying at the wickedness of the world. The loveliest doll in the world had been given to her. Oh, it was most delicate and fragile, and certainly not fit to face adversity. But the little girl's brothers, great big boys, had taken the doll away and put it up into a high tree and then had run away. The poor little girl could not get it down or get at it in any way, so she sat down and cried. The doll, no doubt, was crying too. It stretched out its arms among the branches and looked most unhappy. Yes, this must be the adversity of the world, about which Mama talks so much. Oh, the poor doll! Evening was coming on. It was getting dark, and it would soon be night. Was it to stay out there all alone in the tree for the whole night? No, the little girl could not endure the thought. I will stay with you, she said, although she was not at all courageous, and she fancied already that she could see the little brownies in their high pointed caps peeping through the bushes, and there were long ghostly shadows dancing about in the dark walk. They came nearer and nearer and stretched out their hands towards the tree where the doll was sitting, and they laughed and pointed their fingers at her. Oh, how frightened the little girl was! But if one has committed no sin, she thought, evil can do one no harm. I wonder if I have sinned. Then she began to think. Oh, yes, she said. I laughed at the poor duck with a red rag around its leg. It looked so funny limping along, so I laughed, and it is a sin to laugh at dumb animals. Then she looked up at her doll. Have you ever laughed at dumb animals? And the doll seemed to shake its head. 23rd Evening I looked down in the Tyrol, said the moon. I let the dark pine trees throw their long shadows onto the rocks. I saw St. Christopher with the child Jesus on his back as they are painted on the walls of the houses. They are colossal in size, reaching from the ground to the tops of the gables. There is also St. Florian pouring water on the burning house, and the Savior hanging bleeding on the cross at the roadside. These are old pictures to the new generation, but I saw their origin. There is a solitary convent perched upon the mountainside, like a swallow's nest. Two of the sisters were standing up in the tower, ringing the bell. They were both young so their glances roamed over the mountains into the wide world beyond. A traveling carriage drove along the high road. The post-horn sounded gaily, and the poor nuns fixed their eyes, filled with the same thoughts, upon the carriage. A tear stood in those of the youngest. The sound of the horn grew fainter and fainter, till its dying notes were drowned by the convent bell. Twenty-fourth evening. Hear what the moon told me. Several years ago, I was in Copenhagen. I peeped in at the window of a poor little room. The father and mother were both asleep, but their little son was awake. I saw the flowered chintz curtains stirring, and the child peeped out. I thought at first that he was looking at the grandfather's clock from Bornholm. It was gaily painted in red and green, and a cuckoo sat at the top. 
it had heavy laden weights and the pendulum with its shining brass disc swung backwards and forwards tick tack but that was not what he was looking at no it was his mother's spinning wheel which stood under the clock it was the boy's dearest treasure in all the house but he dared not touch it or he would be wrapped over the knuckles he would stand for hours while his mother was spinning looking at the whirling spindle in the whizzing wheel and he had his own thoughts about them oh if only he dared spin with that wheel father and mother were asleep he looked at them he looked at the wheel and soon he put one bare little foot out of bed and then another little bare foot followed by two little legs bump there he stood upon the floor he turned round once more to see if father and mother were still asleep yes they were fast asleep so he went softly very softly in his short little shirt to the wheel and began to spin the cord flew off and the wheel ran faster and faster i kissed his yellow hair and his large blue eyes it was a pretty picture his mother woke just then she put the curtain aside and looked out and thought she saw a brownie or some other little sprite in heaven's name she said pushing her husband he opened his eyes rubbed them and looked at the busy little figure why it is our Bertol, he said and my eye turned away from the poor little room my glances extend so far that at the same moment i looked in at the galleries of the vatican where the sculptor gods stand i flooded the laocoon group with my light and the marble seemed to sigh i pressed a gentle kiss upon the bosom of the muses they almost seemed to move but my glance rested longest upon the great nile group with a colossal god he leant pensively against the sphinx dreamy and thoughtful as if he was pondering on the bygone years little cupids played around him sporting with the crocodiles one tiny little cupid sat inside the cornucopia with his arms folded looking at the great solemn river god he was a true picture of the little boy at the spinning wheel his features were the same this little marble child was lifelike and graceful in the extreme yet the wheel of time had turned more than a thousand times since he sprang from the marble just so many times as the little boy turned the spinning wheel in the humble little room had the greater wheel of time whirled round and yet will whirl before the present time creates marble gods like these now all this happened years ago continued the moon yesterday i looked down onto a bay on the east coast of zealand the cliffs round it were beautifully wooded and in the midst of the woods stood an old red castle with swans swimming in the moat a little country town lay near with its church buried among the apple trees a procession of boats with blazing torches glided over the smooth waters these torches were not lighted for spearing eels no it was a great festivity there were sounds of music and singing and in one of the boats stood the object of all the homage he was a tall powerful man wrapped in a cloak he had blue eyes and long white hair i knew him and thought of the vatican and the nile group among all the sculptured gods then i thought of the poor little room i believe it was in groniga where little bertel sat spinning in his little shirt the wheel of time had been turning and new gods have arisen from the marble since then from the boats came hurrah hurrah for bertel thor waltzen Twenty-fifth evening. I will give you a picture from Frankfurt, said the moon. I looked at one building in particular. It was not Goethe's birthplace, not the old town hall, 
where through the grated windows may still be seen the horns of the oxen which were roasted and given to the people at the coronation of the emperor no it was a burgher's house i looked at it was painted green and was quite plain it stood at the corner of the narrow jews street it was rothschild's house i looked in through the open door the staircase was brightly lighted footmen stood there holding burning lights in massive silver candlesticks bending low before the old woman who was being carried down in a carrying chair the owner of the house stood with bared head and pressed a respectful kiss upon her hand she was his mother she nodded kindly to him and the footmen and they carried her into a little house in the dark narrow street here she lived here she had borne her children from here their fortune had blossomed forth if she now left the little house in the mean street perhaps their luck would leave them this was her belief the moon told me no more her visit to-night was far too short but i thought of the old woman in the narrow mean street one word from her and she might have a palace on the banks of the thames one word and she would have had a villa on the bay of naples were i to leave this humble house where the fortunes of my sons originated their fortune might forsake them it is a superstition but a superstition of such a kind that if one knows the story and sees the picture it only needs two words to understand it a mother twenty-sixth evening yesterday at daybreak these were the moon's own words not a chimney was yet smoking in the great town and it was these very chimneys i was looking at when suddenly a little head popped out at the top of one of them followed by the upper part of a body with the arms resting on the edge of the chimney hurrah it was a little chimney sweep who had gone right up a chimney for the first time in his life and got his head out at the top hurrah this was a very different matter from creeping about in the narrow flues and smaller chimneys a fresh breeze met his face and he could see right out over the town away to the green woods beyond the sun was just rising big and round and it shone straight into his face which beamed with delight although it was thoroughly smudged with soot now the whole town can see me said he and the moon can see me and the sun too hurrah and he waved his brush above his head twenty-seventh evening last night i looked down upon a town in china said the moon my beams illumined the long blank walls which border the streets here and there you certainly find a door but it is always tightly shut for what does the chinaman care about the outside world the windows of the houses behind the walls are closely covered with jealousies the temple was the only place whence a dim light shone through the windows i looked in upon its gorgeous colors the walls from floor to ceiling are covered with pictures in strong colors and rich gilding they are representations of the labors of the gods here on earth there is an image of a god in every niche almost hidden by gorgeous draperies and floating banners before each of the gods which are all made of tin stands a little altar with holy water flowers and burning wax tapers at the upper end of the temple stands Fu, the chief of all the gods. He is draped in silk of the sacred yellow. At the foot of the altar sat a living being, a young priest. He seemed to be praying, but in the midst of his prayers, to fall into a reverie. And no doubt that was a sin, for his cheeks burnt, and his head sank lower and lower. Poor Sui Hung was he in his dream seeing himself behind those dreary walls in a little garden of his own working at the flower beds perhaps a labor much dearer to him than this of tending wax tapers in the temple 
or was it his desire to sit at a richly spread table wiping his lips between each course with tissue paper or was his sin so great that did he dare to express it the heavenly powers would punish him with death did his thoughts venture to stray with the barbarians ships to their home in far distant england no his thoughts did not fly so far afield and yet they were as sinful as only the hot blood of youth can conceive them sinful here in the temple before the image of few and the other gods i know whither his thoughts had wandered in the outskirts of the town upon the flat flagged roof of a house where the parapet seemed to be made of porcelain and among handsome vases full of large white bell-shaped flowers sat the lovely Pe, with her narrow roguish eyes full lips and tiny feet her shoes pinched but the pressure at her heart was far greater and she wearily raised her delicately modelled arms in their rustling satin sleeves in front of her stood a glass bowl with four goldfish in it she slowly stirred the water with a little painted and lacquered stick slowly oh very slowly for she was musing was she thinking how richly the fish were clad in gold and how securely they lived in their glass bowl with all their plentiful food and yet how much happier they would be if they had their freedom ah yes the fair pay thoroughly comprehended that her thoughts wandered from her home and sought the temple but not for the sake of god poor pay poor sui hung their earthly thoughts met but my cold beams fell between them like an angel's sword twenty eighth evening it was a dead calm said the moon the water was as transparent as the pure ear that i was traversing i could see the curious plants down under the water they were like giant forest trees stretching towards me many fathoms long the fish swam over their tops a flock of wild swans were flying past high up in the air one of them sank with outspread wings lower and lower it followed with its eyes the aerial caravan as the distance between them rapidly increased it held its wings outspread and motionless and sank as a soap bubble sinks in the quiet air when it touched the surface of the water it bent its head back between its wings and lay as still as the white lotus blossom on a tranquil lake a gentle breeze rose and swelled the glittering surface of the phosphorescent water brilliant as ether itself rolling on in great broad billows the swan lifted its head and the sparkling water dashed over its back and breast like blue flames dawn shed its rosy light around and the swan soared aloft with renewed vigor towards the rising sun towards the faint blue coastline whither the aerial caravan took its flight but it flew alone with longing in its breast solitary it flew over the swelling blue waters Twenty-ninth evening i will give you one more picture from sweden said the moon among gloomy forests near the melancholy shores of the roxen stands the old convent church of reita my beams fell through a grating in the wall into a spacious vault where kings slumber in their marble tombs a royal crown glitters on the wall above them as an emblem of earthly glory a royal crown but it is made of painted wood and kept in place by a wooden peg driven into the wall worms have gnawed through the gilded wood the spider has spun its web from the crown to the coffin it is a mourning banner frail and transient as the grief of mortals how calm their slumber i remember them distinctly i still see the confident smile around those lips 
which so authoritatively and decidedly uttered words of joy or grief. When the steamer comes up among the mountains like a bark from fairyland, many a stranger comes to the church and pays a visit to this burial vault. He asks the king's names, and they echo with a dead and forgotten sound. He looks at the worm-eaten crown, and if he has a pious mind, there is sadness in his smile. Sleep on, ye dead. The moon remembers you. The moon sends her cold beams in the night into your silent kingdom, over which the wooden crown hangs. Thirtieth Evening Close to the high road, said the moon, stands an inn, and immediately opposite to it is a great wagon shed, the roof of which was being thatched. I looked through the rafters and through the open trap door into the uncomfortable space below. A turkey cock was asleep on a beam, and a saddle was resting in an empty crib. A traveling carriage stood in the middle of the shed. Its owners slept in it as safely as possible, while the horses were being fed and watered, and the driver stretched his legs. Although, and I know it for a certainty, he had been fast asleep for more than half the way. The door of the groom's bedroom was open. The bed was topsy-turvy, and a candle guttered on the floor. The wind whistled cold through the shed. It was nearer daybreak than midnight. A party of strolling musicians were asleep in a stall. The father and mother, I dare say, were dreaming of the drops of liquid fire in their flask, and the pale girl bought the teardrop in her eye. A harp lay at their head, and a dog at their feet. Thirty-first evening It was in a little country town, said the moon. I saw it last year, but that doesn't matter for I saw it so distinctly. Tonight I read about it in the papers, but the story is not nearly so intelligible in them. A bear leader was sitting in the bar of a public house, eating his supper. His bear was tied up outside behind the woodshed. Poor bear, he wouldn't harm a creature, though he looked fierce enough. Three little children were playing in the light of my beams up in an attic. The eldest was perhaps six years old, the youngest not more than two. A muffled sound was heard coming up the stairs. Who could it be? The door flew open. It was the bear, great shaggy Bruin. He was bored by standing out there in the yard, and he had found his way upstairs. I saw it all, said the moon. The children were very much frightened when they first saw the big furry animal. They each crept into a different corner, but he found them out. He snuffed at them all, but did not hurt them. Why, it must be a great big dog, they thought, and they began to pat him. He lay down upon the floor, and the smallest boy rolled about on the top of him and played at hiding his golden locks in the bear's long black coat. Then the biggest boy got out his drum and played upon it as hard as ever he could. As soon as he heard it, the bear got up on his hind legs and danced. It was a pretty sight. Each boy shouldered his gun, and the bear, of course, had to have one too, and he held it as tightly as any of them. This was indeed a rare playmate they had got, and no mistake. They marched up and down, one, two, one, two. Just then someone came to the door and opened it. It was the children's mother. You should have seen the terrible, speechless agony in her ashen face, with open mouth and starting eyes. But the smallest boy nodded to her. He was ever so pleased, and cried out loud in his baby way, We are only playing soldiers, mother. And then the bear leader made his appearance. 32nd Evening the wind blew strong and cold. The clouds were chasing by, and the moon only appeared now and then. 
I looked down upon the flying clouds from the silence of space above, said he. I can see the clouds chasing over the earth. Just lately I was looking down into a prison, outside which stood a closed carriage. A prisoner was about to leave. My beams penetrated the grated window and shone upon the inside wall. The prisoner was tracing some lines upon the wall. It was his farewell. He did not write words but a tune, the outpouring of his heart on his last night in this place. The door opened and he was conducted to the carriage. He looked up at my round disc. Clouds flew between us, as if he might not see my face nor I his. He got into the carriage. The door was shut. The whip cracked, and off they went through the thick forest, where my beams could not reach. I looked in through the prison grating again, and my beams fell once more upon the wall where the melody was traced. His last farewell. Where words fail, melody may often speak. But my rays only lighted up a few isolated notes. The greater part will always remain dark to me. Was it a death hymn he wrote? Or were they caroling notes of joy? Was he driving to meet his death, or to the embrace of his beloved? The beams of the moon cannot read all that even mortals write. I look down on the flying clouds from the silence of space above, and I see big clouds chasing across the earth. Thirty-third evening I am very fond of children, said the moon. The little ones especially are so amusing. I often peep at them through the curtains when they least think I see them. It is so amusing to see them trying to undress themselves. First, a little round naked shoulder appears out of the frock. Then one arm slips out. Or I see a stocking pulled off a dimpled little leg, firm and round. And then comes out a little foot made to be kissed. And I kissed it, said the moon. I must tell you what I saw tonight. I looked in at a window where the blind did not reach the bottom, for there were no opposite neighbors. I saw a whole flock of little ones, brothers and sisters. One little girl is only four years old, but she knows our father as well as any of them, and her mother sits by her bed every evening to hear it. Then she kisses her and sits by her till she falls asleep, which generally happens as soon as she shuts her eyes. Tonight, the two eldest were rather wild. One of them hopped about on one leg in his long white nightgown. The second one stood on a chair with the clothes of all the others heaped upon him. He said it was a tableau, and they must guess what it meant. The third and fourth were putting their toys carefully away in a drawer, and of course that has to be done, but their mother said they must be quiet, for the little one was going to say her prayers. I peeped in over the lamp, said the moon. The little four-year-old girl lay in bed among all the fine white linen. Her little hands were folded, and her face quite grave and serious. And she began, Our Father, aloud. But what is this? said her mother, interrupting her in the middle. When you have said, Give us this day our daily bread, you say something more which I can't quite hear. What is it? You must tell me. The little girl hesitated and looked shyly at her mother. What do you say after give us this day our daily bread? Don't be angry, mother dear, said the little one. I say, please put plenty of butter on it. End of section 32 Section 33 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Lundstrom. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Tinderbox. A soldier came marching along the high road. One, two, one, two. He had his knapsack on his back and his sword at his side, for he had been to the wars, and he was on his way home now. He met an old witch on the road. She was so ugly, her lower lip hung right down onto her chin. She said, Good evening, soldier. What a nice sword you've got, and such a big knapsack. <laughs> you are a real soldier. You shall have as much money as ever you like. Thank you kindly, you old witch, said the soldier. Do you see that big tree? said the witch, pointing to a tree close by. It is hollow inside. Climb up to the top, and you will see a hole into which you can let yourself down, right down under the tree. I will tie a rope around your waist so that I can haul you up again when you call. <laughs> what am I to do down under the tree? asked the soldier. Fetch money, said the witch. You must know that when you get down to the bottom of the tree, you will find yourself in a wide passage. It's quite light there, for there are over a hundred blazing lamps. <laughs> You will see three doors which you can open, for the keys are there. If you go into the first room, you will see a big box in the middle of the floor. A dog is sitting on the top of it, and he has eyes as big as saucers. But you needn't mind that. I will give you my blue-checked apron, which you can spread out onto the floor. Then go quickly forward, take up the dog and put him on my apron, open the box and take out as much money as ever you like. It is all copper, but if you like silver better, go into the next room. There you will find a dog with eyes as big as millstones, but never mind that. Put him on my apron and take the money. If you prefer gold, you can have it too, as much as you can carry, if you go into the third room. But the dog sitting on that box has eyes each as big as the round tower. He is a dog indeed, as you may imagine. But don't let it trouble you. You only have to put him on to my apron, and then he won't hurt you, and you can take as much of the gold out of the box as you like. That's not so bad, said the soldier. But what am I to give you, old witch? For you'll want something, I'll be bound. No, said the witch. Not a single penny do I want. I only want you to bring me an old tinder box that my grandmother forgot the last time she was down there. Well, tie the rope round my waist, said the soldier. Here it is, said the witch, and here is my blue-checked apron. Then the soldier climbed up the tree, let himself slide down the hollow trunk, and found himself as the witch had said, in the wide passage where the many hundred lamps were burning. Now he opened the first door. Ugh! There sat the dog with eyes as big as saucers staring at him. You are a nice fellow, said the soldier, as he put him on to the witch's apron and took out as many pennies as he could cram into his pockets. Then he shut the box and put the dog on the top of it again and went into the next room. Hello! There sat the dog with eyes as big as millstones. You shouldn't stare at me so hard. You might get a pain in your eyes. Then he put the dog on the apron, but when he saw all the silver in the box, he threw away all the coppers and stuffed his pockets and his knapsack with silver. Then he went into the third room. Oh, how horrible! That dog really had two eyes as big as the round tower, and they rolled round and round like wheels. 
Good evening, said the soldier, saluting, for he had never seen such a dog in his life. But after looking at him for a bit, he thought, that will do. And then he lifted him down onto the apron and opened the chest. Preserve us! What a lot of gold! He could buy the whole of Copenhagen with it, and all the sugar pigs from the cake woman, all the tin soldiers, whips, and rocking horses in the world. That was money indeed. Now, the soldier threw away all the silver he had filled his pockets and his knapsack with, and put gold in its place. Yes, he crammed all his pockets, his knapsack, his cap, and his boots so full that he could hardly walk. Now he really had got a lot of money. He put the dog back onto the box, shut the door, and shouted up through the tree, Haul me up, you old witch! Have you got the tinder box? Oh, to be sure, said the soldier. I had quite forgotten it. And he went back to fetch it. The witch hauled him up, and there he was standing on the high road again with his pockets, boots, knapsack, and cap full of gold. What do you want the tinder box for? asked the soldier. That's no business of yours, said the witch. You've got the money. Give me the tinder box. Rubbish, said the soldier. Tell me directly what you want with it, or I will draw my sword and cut off your head. I won't, <laughs> said the witch. Then the soldier cut off her head. There she lay. But he tied all the money up in her apron and slung it onto his back like a pack, put the tinder box in his pocket, and marched off to the town. It was a beautiful town, and he went straight to the finest hotel, ordered the grandest rooms and all the food he liked best, because he was a rich man now that he had so much money. Certainly the servant who had to clean his boots thought they were funny old things for such a rich gentleman, but he had not had the time yet to buy any new ones. The next day he bought new boots and fine clothes. The soldier now became a fine gentleman, and the people told him all about the grand things in the town, and about their king, and what a lovely princess his daughter was. "'Where is she to be seen?' asked the soldier. "'You can't see her at all,' they all said. "'She lives in a great copper castle surrounded with walls and towers. Nobody but the king dare go in and out, for it has been prophesied that she will marry a common soldier, and the king doesn't like that.' I should like to see her well enough, thought the soldier, but there was no way of getting leave for that. He now led a very merry life, went to theaters, drove about in the king's park, and gave away a lot of money to poor people, which was very nice of him, for he remembered how disagreeable it used to be to not have a penny in his pocket. Now he was rich, wore fine clothes, and had a great many friends, who all said what a nice fellow he was. A thorough gentleman, and he liked to be told that. But as he went on spending money every day, and his store was never renewed, he at last found himself with only two pence left. Then he was obliged to move out of his fine rooms. He had to take a tiny little attic up under the roof, clean his own boots, and mend them himself with a darning needle. None of his friends went to see him, because there were far too many stairs. One dark evening, when he had not even enough money to buy a candle with, he suddenly remembered that there was a little bit in the old tinderbox he had brought out of the hollow tree, when the witch helped him down. He got out the tinderbox with the candle end in it and struck fire. But as the sparks flew out from the flint, the door burst open, and the dog with eyes as big as saucers, which he had seen down under the tree, stood before him and said, What does my lord command? By heaven, said the soldier, this is a nice kind of tinderbox, if I can get whatever I want like this. Get me some money, he said to the dog, and away it went. It was back in a twinkling, with a big bag full of pennies in its mouth. Now the soldier saw what a treasure he had in the tinderbox. If he struck once, the dog which sat on the box of copper came. 
If he struck twice, the dog on the silver box came. And if he struck three times, the one from the box of gold. He now moved down to the grand rooms and got his fine clothes again. And then all his friends knew him once more and liked him as much as ever. Then he suddenly began to think. After all, it's a curious thing that no man can get a sight of the princess. Everyone says she is so beautiful. But what is the good of that when she always has to be shut up in that big copper palace with all the towers? Can I not somehow manage to see her? Where is my tinderbox? Then he struck the flint, and whisk came the dog with eyes as big as saucers. It certainly is the middle of the night, said the soldier, but I am very anxious to see the princess, if only for a single moment. The dog was out of the door in an instant, and before the soldier had time to think about it, he was back again with the princess. There she was, fast asleep on the dog's back, and she was so lovely that anybody could see that she must be a real princess. The soldier could not help it, but he was obliged to kiss her for he was a true soldier. Then the dog ran back again with the princess, but in the morning, when the king and queen were having breakfast, the princess said that she had such a wonderful dream about a dog and a soldier. She had ridden on the dog's back, and the soldier had kissed her. That's a pretty tale, said the queen. After this, an old lady-in-waiting had to sit by her bed at night to see if this was really a dream, or what it could be. The soldier longed so intensely to see the princess again that at night the dog came to fetch her. He took her up and ran off with her as fast as he could, but the old lady-in-waiting put on her galoshes and ran just as fast behind them. When she saw that they disappeared into a large house, she thought, now I know where it is, and made a big cross with chalk on the gate. Then she went home and lay down, and presently the dog came back, too, with the princess. When he saw that there was a cross on the gate, he took a bit of chalk, too, and made crosses on all the gates in town. Now, this was very clever of him, for the lady-in-waiting could not possibly find the gate when there were crosses on all the gates. Early next morning, the king, the queen, the lady-in-waiting, and all the court officials went to see where the princess had been. There it is, said the king, when he saw the first door with the cross on it. No, my dear husband, it is there, said the queen, who saw another door with a cross on it. But there is one, and there is another, they all cried out. They soon saw that it was hopeless to try and find it. Now the queen was a very clever woman. She knew more than how to drive in a chariot. She took her big gold scissors and cut up a large piece of silk into small pieces and made a pretty little bag, which she filled with fine grains of buckwheat. She then tied it onto the back of the princess, and when that was done, she cut a little hole in the bag so that the grains could drop out all the way wherever the princess went. At night, the dog came again, took the princess on his back, and ran off with her to the soldier who was so fond of her that he longed to be a prince so that he might have her for his wife. The dog never noticed how the grain dropped out all along the road, from the palace to the soldier's window, where he ran up the wall with the princess. In the morning, the king and queen easily saw where their daughter had been, and they seized the soldier and threw him into the dungeons. There he lay! Oh, how dark and tiresome it was! And then one day they said to him, Tomorrow you are to be hanged. It was not amusing to be told that, especially as he had left his tinderbox behind him at the hotel. In the morning, he could see through the bars in the little window that the people were hurrying out of the town to see him hanged. He heard the drums and saw the soldiers marching along. All the world was going among them was a shoemaker's boy in his leather apron and slippers. He was in such a hurry that he lost one of his slippers, and it fell close under the soldier's window where he was peeping out through the bars. "'I say, you boy, don't be in such a hurry,' said the soldier to him. "'Nothing will happen till I get there, but 
if you will run to the house where I used to live and fetch me my tinderbox, you shall have a penny. You must put your best foot foremost. The boy was only too glad to have the penny, and tore off to get the tinderbox, gave it to the soldier, and, yes, now we shall hear. Outside the town, a high scaffold had been raised, and the soldiers were drawn up round about it, as well as crowds of the townspeople. The king and the queen sat upon a beautiful throne, exactly opposite the judge and all the counselors. The soldier mounted the ladder, but when they were about to put the rope round his neck, he said that before undergoing his punishment, a criminal was always allowed the gratification of a harmless wish, and he wanted very much to smoke a pipe, as it would be his last pipe in this world. The king would not deny him this, so the soldier took out his tinderbox and struck fire once, twice, three times, and there were all the dogs. The one with eyes like saucers, the one with eyes like millstones, and the one whose eyes were as big as the round tower. Help me, save me from being hanged cried the soldier, and then the dogs rushed at the soldiers and the counselors. They took one by the legs and another by the nose, and threw them up many fathoms into the air, and when they fell down, they were broken all to pieces. I won't, cried the king, but the biggest dog took both him and the queen and threw them after all the others. Then the soldiers became alarmed, and the people shouted, Oh, good soldier, you shall be our king and marry the beautiful princess. Then they conducted the soldier to the king's chariot, and all three dogs danced along in front of him and shouted, Hurrah! The boys all put their fingers in their mouths and whistled, and the soldiers presented arms. The princess came out of the copper palace and became queen, which pleased her very much. The wedding took place in a week and the dogs all had seats at the table, where they sat staring with all their eyes. End of section 33 Recording by Rachel Lundstrom Section 34 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Lundstrom. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Story of a Mother. A poor mother sat watching by the cradle of her little baby. She was very anxious and sorrowful. She dreaded that it was going to be taken from her. Its little eyes were closed, and it was deathly pale. It breathed very faintly, with now and then a long trembling breath, like a sigh. The mother grew sadder and sadder as she looked at it. There was a knock at the door, and a poor old man came in. He was wrapped in a big horse cloth, which he needed to keep him warm. It was so very cold. Outside everything was covered with ice and snow, and a biting wind whistled round the house. As the old man was shaking with cold, and the baby had dropped asleep for a moment, the mother got up and put some beer in a little mug on the stove to warm for him. The old man sat rocking the cradle, and the woman sat down on a chair close to him and watched the sick child, who drew its breath more deeply still, and feebly waved its little hand about. "'You think I shall keep him, don't you?' said she. "'The Lord won't take him from me?' And the old man, who was death himself, nodded in such a curious way that she did not know whether it meant yes or no. The mother bent her head, and the tears rolled down her cheeks. Her head was so heavy. She had not closed her eyes for three nights and days, and she fell asleep, but only for a moment." Then she started up, shivering with cold. "'What is it?' she said, looking about to every side. But the old man was gone, and her little child was gone. He had taken it with him. 
The old clock in the corner whirred and whirred, and the big lead weight ran right down to the ground with a bang, and then the clock stopped too. But the poor mother rushed out of the house calling for her child. Out there, all in the snow, sat a woman in long black clothes, and she said, Death has been into your room. I saw him hurrying away with your child. He goes faster than the wind, and he never brings back what he takes away. Only tell me which way he went, said the mother. Tell me the way, and I shall find him. I know the way, said the woman in the black clothes. But before I tell it you, you must sing me all the songs you used to sing to your baby. I like them. I have often heard them before. I am night. I saw your tears while you sang. I will sing them all, all, said the mother. But don't stop me. Let me go that I may find my little baby. But night stood still and silent, and the mother wrung her hands, sang, and wept. There were many songs, but many, many more tears. At last, night said, Go to the right into the dark pine wood. I saw death take that road with your child. In the heart of the wood, she came to a crossroad, and she did not know which way to go. There was a blackthorn bush just at the crossing with neither leaf nor flower on it, for it was the hard winter time, and icicles hung from the branches. Have you not seen death pass by with my little child? Yes, said the blackthorn bush, but I won't tell you which way he went unless you will warm me at your heart. I am dying of cold. I shall soon be nothing but ice. And she pressed the blackthorn bush to her heart so tightly to warm it that the thorns ran into her flesh and great drops of blood flowed. But fresh green leaves and flowers sprang out on the thorn bush that cold winter night. Such was the warmth of the sad mother's heart. And the thorn bush told her the way to go. Then she came to a great lake, on which there were neither ships nor boats. The lake was not frozen hard enough to bear her, nor was it open or shallow enough for her to wade through it. But over it somehow she must go if she would find her child. She lay down to drink up the water, but that was of course impossible. The poor mother thought, however, that a miracle might happen. Now, this will never do, said the lake. Let us see if we too can't make a bargain. I collect pearls, and your eyes are the brightest I have seen. If you will cry them out for me, I will carry you over to the great hothouse where death lives and looks after his plants and flowers, every one of which is a human life. Oh, what I would not give to reach my child, said the weeping mother, and she wept more than ever till her eyes dropped down to the bottom of the lake and became two precious pearls. Then the lake lifted her as if she had been in a swing, and she was borne in a moment from the shore where she stood to the other side. Here stood a curious house a mile wide. One could hardly tell whether it was a mountain covered with woods and hollows, or whether it was built up. But the poor mother could not see it, you know, for she had cried her eyes out. "'Where shall I find death, who carried off my little child?' she said. He has not come back here yet, said the old crone, whose business it was to tend to death's big hothouse. However did you get here, and who helped you? Our Lord has helped me, said she. He is merciful, and so will you be. Where shall I find my child? I don't know, said the woman, and you can't see. Many flowers and trees have withered in the night. Death will soon come and transplant them. You know that every human being has his or her tree of life, or flower, according as they are made. 
They look like other plants, but they have beating human hearts. A child's heart can beat, too. Walk about here. Perhaps you will recognize your child's. But what will you give me if I tell you what more you must do? I have nothing to give, said the mother sadly. But I will go to the end of the world for you. I've got nothing to do there, said the woman. But you can give me your long black hair. I'm sure you know yourself that it is beautiful, and I fancy it. I'll give you my white hair in place of that. That will always be something. Don't you ask more than that, said she. I will give it you gladly. And she gave her her beautiful black hair, and received the old woman's white hair in exchange. Then they went into death's big hot house, where the flowers and trees grew curiously mixed up together. Here were delicate hyacinths under bell glasses, and there were great strong peonies. Here were water plants, some quite fresh, others sickly with water snakes wound round them, and little black crayfish pinching their stems. Here were beautiful palm trees, oaks, and plane trees. There grew parsley and sweet-scented thyme. Every tree and every flower had its name. Each one was a human life, living still, one in China, one in Greenland, scattered round about the world. There were big trees in small pots, growing in a stunted way, ready to burst their pots, and there were also, in other places, little tiresome flowers in rich earth surrounded with moss and covered and tended. But the sad mother bent over all the tiniest plants and listened for the human heart beating in them. Among a million, she knew her child's at once. "'This is it!' she cried, stretching out her hands over a little blue crocus which hung feebly down to one side. "'Don't touch the flower!' said the old woman, but place yourself here, so that when death comes, for I expect him every minute, you may prevent him from pulling it up. Threaten him that you will do the same to the other flowers, then he will be frightened. He has to answer to our Lord for them, not one may be pulled up without his leave. All at once an icy wind whistled through the place, and the blind mother felt that death had come. "'How didst thou find thy way hither?' asked he. "'How couldst thou get here before me?' "'I am a mother,' she said. Then death stretched out his long hand towards the delicate little flower, but she clasped her hands tightly round his, in terror, lest he should touch one of the leaves. Death breathed upon her hands. She felt that his breath was colder than the coldest wind, and her hands fell numbly away from his. "'You have no power against me, you see,' said Death. "'But our Lord has,' said she. "'I only do his will,' said Death. I am his gardener. I take all his flowers and trees and plant them in the garden of paradise, in the unknown land. But how they grow and what they do there, I dare not tell thee. Give me back my child, said the mother, with tears and prayers. Suddenly she clutched with both hands two beautiful flowers growing close by and called out to death. I will pull up all your flowers, for I am in despair. "'Touch them not,' said Death. "'Thou sayest that thou art unhappy, "'yet wouldst thou make some other mother equally unhappy. "'Some other mother!' said the poor woman, "'letting go the flowers at once. "'Here hast thou thine eyes back again,' said Death. "'I fished them up out of the lake. "'They shone so brightly. "'I did not know that they were thine. "'Take them back again. "'They are brighter than ever.' Look down into the deep well close by. I will name the names of those flowers thou wast about to pluck, and thou shalt see their whole lives and all that future thou wast about to destroy. And she looked down into the well. It was happiness to see how one of them became a blessing to the world, 
and to see how much joy and pleasure was unfolded around him. Then she saw the life of the other, and that life was all sorrow, sin, and misery. Both lives are according to the will of God, said Death. Which is the flower of misery, and which of blessedness? That I may not tell thee, said Death. But I may tell thee that one of the flowers was thy own child's. It was thy child's fate thou sawest, thine own child's future. Then the mother shrieked in terror, which was my child? Tell me that. Save the wretched one. Save my child from all the misery. Rather, g carry it away. Bear it into God's kingdom. Forget my tears. Forget my prayers and all that I have said. I do not understand thee, said Death. Wilt thou have thy child back, or shall I take it whither thou knowest not? The mother wrung her hands fell upon her knees, and prayed to our father. Do not listen to me when I pray against thy will, which is best. Do not listen, do not listen. And she bent her head in humble submission. Then death carried her child into the unknown land. End of section 34 Recording by Rachel Lundstrom Section 35 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Marsh King's Daughter. Part 1. The storks have a great many stories, which they tell their little ones, all about the bogs and the marshes. They suit them to their ages and capacity. The youngest ones are quite satisfied with cribble-crabble or some such nonsense, but the older ones want something with more meaning in it, or at any rate something about the family. We all know one of the two oldest and longest tales which have been kept up among the storks. The one about Moses, who was placed by his mother on the waters of the Nile, and found there by the king's daughter. How she brought him up, and how he became a great man whose burial place nobody to this day knows. That is all common knowledge. The other story is not known yet, because the storks have kept it among themselves. It has been handed on from one mother stork to another for more than a thousand years, and each succeeding mother has told it better and better till we now tell it best of all. The first pair of storks who told it, and who actually lived it, had their summer quarters on the roof of the Viking's timbered house up by Vidmosen, the wild bog, in Winsisel. It is in the county of Hring, high up towards the Ska, in the north of Jutland, if we are to describe it according to the authorities. There is still a great bog there, which we may read about in the county chronicles. The district used to be under the sea at one time, but the ground has risen, and it stretches for miles. It is surrounded on every side by marshy meadows, quagmires, and peat bogs, on which grow cloudberries and stunted bushes. There is nearly always a damp mist hanging over it, and seventy years ago it was still overrun with wolves. It may well be called the wild bog and one can easily imagine how desolate and dreary it was among all these swamps and pools a thousand years ago. In detail, everything is as much the same now as it was then. The reeds grow to the same height, and have the same kind of long purple-brown leaves with feathery tips as now. The birch still grows there with its wild bark and its delicate, loosely hanging leaves. With regard to living creatures, the flies still wear their gauzy draperies of the same cut, and the storks, now as then, still dress in black and white, with long red stockings. The people certainly then had a very different cut for their clothes than at the present day, but if any of them, serf or huntsman, or anybody at all, stepped on the quagmires, the same fate befell him a thousand years ago as would overtake him now if he ventured on them. 
in he would go, and down he would sink to the Marsh King, as they called him. He rules down below over the whole kingdom of bogs and swamps. He might also be called King of the Quagmires, but we prefer to call him the Marsh King, as the storks did. We know very little about his rule, but that is perhaps just as well. Near the bogs, close to the arm of the Kattegat, called the Limfjord, lay the timbered hall of the Vikings with its stone cellar, its tower, and its three stories. The storks had built their nest on the top of the roof, and the mother stork was sitting on the eggs which she was quite sure would soon be successfully hatched. One evening father stork stayed out rather late, and when he came back he looked somewhat ruffled. "'I have something terrible to tell you,' he said to the mother stork. "'Don't tell it to me, then,' she answered. "'Remember that I am sitting. It might upset me, and that would be bad for the eggs.' "'You will have to know it,' said he. "'She has come here, the daughter of our host in Egypt. "'She has ventured to take the journey, and now she has disappeared.' "'She who is related to the fairies? Tell me all about it. "'You know I can't bear to be kept waiting now I am sitting.' Look here, mother. She must have believed what the doctor said, as you told me. She believed that the marsh flowers up here would do something for her father, and she flew over here in feather plumage with the other two princesses, who have come north every year to take the baths to make themselves young. She came, and she has vanished. You go into too many particulars, said the mother stork. The eggs might get a chill, and I can't stand being kept in suspense. I have been on the outlook, said the father stork, and tonight, when I was among the reeds where the quagmire will hardly bear me, I saw three swans flying along, and there was something about their flight which said to me, Watch them. They are not real swans. They are only in swan's plumage. You know, mother, as well as I, that one feels things intuitively, whether or not they are what they seem to be. Yes, indeed, she said. But tell me about the princess. I am quite tired of hearing about swan's plumage. You know that in the middle of the bog there is a kind of lake, said the father stork. You can see a bit of it if you raise your head. Well, there was a big alder stump between the bushes and the quagmire, and on this the three swans settled, flapping their wings and looking about them. Then one of them threw off the swan's plumage, and I at once recognized in her our princess from Egypt. There she sat, with no covering but her long black hair. I heard her beg the two others to take good care of the swan's plumage while she dived under the water to pick up the marsh flower, which she thought she could see. They nodded and raised their heads, and lifted up the loose plumage. What are they going to do with it? thought I, and she no doubt asked them the same thing, and the answer came. She had ocular demonstration of it. They flew up into the air with the feather garment. Just you duck down, they cried. Never again will you fly about in the guise of a swan. Never more will you see the land of Egypt. You may sit in your swamp. Then they tore the feather garment into a hundred bits, scattering the feathers all over the place like a snowstorm. Then away flew those two good-for-nothing princesses. What a terrible thing, said the mother stork. But I must have the end of it. The princess moaned and wept. Her tears trickled down upon the alder stump, and then it began to move, for it was the Marsh King himself who lives in the bog. I saw the stump turn round, and saw that it was no longer a stump. It stretched out long, miry branches like arms. The poor child was terrified, and she sprang away on the shaking quagmire where it would not even bear my weight, far less hers. She sank at once, and the alder stump after her. It was dragging her down. Great black bubbles rose in the slime, and then there was nothing more to be seen. Now she is buried in the wild bog, and never will she take back the flowers she came for to Egypt. You could not have endured the sight, mother. You shouldn't even tell me anything of the sort just now. It might have a bad effect upon the eggs. The princess must look after herself. She will get help somehow. If it had been you or I now, or one of our sort, all would have been over with us. I mean to keep a watch, though, every day, said the stork, and he kept his word. But a long time passed, 
and then one day he saw that a green stem shot out from the fathomless depths, and when it reached the surface of the water, a leaf appeared at the top which grew broader and broader. Next a bud appeared close by it, and one morning at dawn, just as the stork was passing, the bud opened out in the warm rays of the sun, and in the middle of it lay a lovely baby, a little girl, looking just as fresh as if she had just come out of a bath. She was so exactly like the princess from Egypt, that at first the stork thought it was she who had grown small, but when he put two and two together, he came to the conclusion that it was her child, and the Marsh King's. This explained why she appeared in a water lily. She can't stay there very long, thought the stork, and there are too many of us in my nest as it is, but an idea has just come into my head. The Viking's wife has no child, and she has often wished for one. As I am always said to bring the babies, this time I will do so in earnest. I will fly away to the Viking's wife with the baby, and that will indeed be a joy for her. So the stork took up the little girl, and flew away with her to the timbered house, where he picked a hole in the bladder skin which covered the window, and laid the baby in the arms of the Viking's wife. This done, he flew home, and told the mother stork all about it, and the young ones heard what he said. They were old enough to understand it. So you see that the princess is not dead. She must have sent the baby up here, and I have found a home for her. I said so from the very first, said the mother stork. Now just give a little attention to your own children. It is almost time to start on our own journey. I feel a tingling in my wings every now and then. The cuckoo and the nightingale are already gone, and I hear from the quails that we shall soon have a good wind. Our young people will do themselves credit at the maneuvers if I know them all right. How delighted the Viking's wife was when she woke in the morning and found the little baby on her bosom. She kissed and caressed it, but it screamed and kicked terribly, and seemed anything but happy. At last it cried itself to sleep, and as it lay there a prettier little thing could not have been seen. The Viking's wife was delighted, body and soul were filled with joy. She was sure that now her husband and all his men would soon come back as unexpectedly as the baby had come. So she and her household busied themselves in putting the house in order against their return. The long colored tapestries which she and her handmaids had woven with pictures of their gods, Odin, Thor, and Freya as they were called, were hung up. The serfs had to scour and polish the old shields which hung around the walls. Cushions were laid on the benches and logs upon the great hearth in the middle of the hall, so that the fire might be lighted at once. The Viking's wife helped with all this work herself, so that when evening came she was very tired and slept soundly. When she woke towards morning, she was much alarmed at finding that the little baby had disappeared. She sprang up and lighted a pine chip and looked about. There was no baby, but at the foot of the bed sat a hideous toad. She was horrified at the sight, and seized up a heavy stick to kill it, but it looked at her with such curious, sad eyes that she had not the heart to strike it. Once more she looked around, and the toad gave a faint, pitiful croak which made her start. She jumped out of bed, and threw open the window shutter. The sun was just rising, and its beams fell upon the bed and the great toad. All at once the monster's wide mouth seemed to contract and to become small and rosy, the limbs stretched and again took their lovely shapes, and it was her own dear little baby which lay there, and not a hideous frog. "'Whatever is this?' she cried. "'I have had a bad dream. This is my own darling elfin child.' She kissed it, and pressed it to her heart, but it struggled and bit like a wild kitten. Neither that day, nor the next, did the Viking Lord come home. Although he was on his way, but the winds were against him, they were blowing southwards for the storks. It is an ill wind that blows nobody good. In the course of a few days and nights, it became clear to the Viking's wife how matters stood with her little baby. Some magic power had a terrible hold over her. In the daytime it was as beautiful as any fairy, but it had a bad, wicked temper. At night, on the other hand, she became a hideous toad, 
quiet and pathetic, with sad, mournful eyes. There were two natures in her, both in soul and body, continually shifting. The reason of it was that the little girl brought by the frog, by day, had her mother's form and her father's evil nature, but at night her kinship with him appeared in her outward form, and her mother's sweet nature and gentle spirit beamed out of the misshapen monster. Who could release her from the power of this witchcraft? It caused the viking's wife much grief and trouble, and yet her heart yearned over the unfortunate being. She knew she would never dare to tell her husband the true state of affairs, because he would, without doubt, according to custom, have the poor child exposed on the highway for anyone who chose to look after it. The good woman had not the heart to do this, and so she determined that he should only see the child by broad daylight. One morning there was a sound of stork's wings swishing over the roof. During the night more than a hundred pairs of storks had made it their resting place, after the great maneuvers, and they were now trying their wings before starting on their long southward flight. "'Every man ready!' they cried. "'All the wives and children, too!' "'How light we feel!' cried the young storks. "'Our legs tingle as if we were full of live frogs. "'How splendid it is to be travelling to foreign lands!' "'Keep in line,' said father and mother. "'And don't let your beaks clatter so fast. "'It isn't good for the chest.' Then away they flew. At the very same moment a horn sounded over the heath. The Viking had landed with all his men. They were bringing home no end of rich booty from the Gallic coast, where the people cried in their terror, as did the people of Britain, Deliver us from the wild Northmen! What life and noise came to the Viking's home by the wild bog now! The mead cask was brought into the hall, the great fire lighted, and horses slaughtered for the feast, which was to be an uproarious one. The priest sprinkled the thralls with the warm blood of the horses as a consecration. The fire crackled and roared, driving the smoke up under the roof, and the soot dripped down from the beams. But they were used to all that. Guests were invited, and they received handsome presents. All feuds and double-dealing were forgotten. They drank deeply, and threw the knuckle-bones in each other's faces when they had gnawed them but that was the mark of good feeling. The scald, the minstrel of the times, but he was also a warrior, for he went with them on their expeditions, and he knew what he was singing about, gave them one of his ballads recounting all their warlike deeds and their prowess. After every verse came the same refrain. Fortunes may be lost, friends may die, one dies oneself, but a glorious name never dies. Then they banged on the shields, and hammered with knives or the knuckle-bones on the table before them, till the hall rang. The Viking's wife sat on the cross-bench in the banqueting hall. She was dressed in silk with gold bracelets and large amber beads. The scald brought her name into the song, too. He spoke of the golden treasures she had brought to her wealthy husband, and his delight at the beautiful child which at present he had only seen under its charming daylight guise. He rather admired her passionate nature, and said she would grow into a doughty shield maiden or Valkyrie, able to hold her own in battle. She would be of the kind who would not blink if a practiced hand cut off her eyebrows in jest with a sharp sword. The barrel of mead came to an end, and a new one was rolled up in its place. This one, too, was soon drained to the dregs, but they were a hard-headed people who could stand a great deal. They had a proverb, then. The beast knows when it is time to go home from grass, but the fool never knows when he has had enough. They knew it very well, but people often know one thing, and yet do another. They also knew that the dearest friend becomes a bore if he sits too long in one's house. But yet they sat on. Meat and drink are such good things. They were a jovial company. At night the thralls slept among the warm ashes and they dipped their fingers in the sooty grease and licked them. Those were rare times indeed. The Viking went out once more that year on a raid. Although the autumn winds were beginning, he sailed with his men to the coast of Britain. It was just over the water, he said. His wife remained at home with a little girl, 
and certain it was that the foster mother soon grew fonder of the poor toad with the pathetic eyes and plaintive sighs than she was of the little beauty who tore and bit. The raw, wet autumn fog, gnaw-worn, which gnaws the leaves off the trees, lay over wood and heath, and bird loose feather, as they call the snow, followed closely upon each other. Winter was on its way. The sparrows took the stork's nest under their protection, and discussed the absent owners in their own fashion. The stork couple and their young, where were they now? The storks were in the land of Egypt, under such a sun as we have on a warm summer's day. They were surrounded by flowering tamarinds and acacias. Mahomet's crescent glittered from every cupola on the mosques, and many a pair of storks stood on the slender towers resting after their long journey. Whole flocks of them had their nests side by side on the mighty pillars, or the ruined arches of the deserted temples. The date palm lifted high its screen of branches, as if to form a sunshade. The grayish-white pyramids stood like shadowy sketches against the clear atmosphere of the desert where the ostrich knew it would find space for its stride. The lion crouched gazing with its great wise eyes at the marble sinks half buried in the sand. The Nile waters had receded, and the land teemed with frogs. To the storks, this was the most splendid sight in all the land. The eyes of the young ones were quite dazzled with the sight. "'See what it is to be here, and we always have the same in our warm country,' said the mother stork, and the stomachs of the little ones tingled. "'Is there anything more to see?' they asked. "'Shall we go any further inland?' "'There is not much more to see,' said the mother stork. On the fertile side there are only secluded woods where the trees are interlaced by creeping plants. The elephant, with its strong clumsy legs, is the only creature which can force a way through. The snakes there are too big for us, and the lizards are too nimble. If you go out into the desert you will get sand in your eyes if the weather is good, and if it is bad you may be buried in a sandstorm. No, we are best here. There are plenty of frogs and grasshoppers. Here I stay, and you too and so she stayed. The old ones stayed in their nests on the slender minarets resting themselves, but at the same time busily smoothing their feathers and rubbing their beaks upon their red stockings. Or they would lift up their long necks and gravely bow their heads, their brown eyes beaming wisely. The young stork misses walked about gravely among the juicy reeds, casting glances at the young bachelor storks, or making acquaintances with them. They would swallow a frog at every third step, or walk about with a small snake dangling from their beak. It had such a good effect, they thought, and then it tasted so good. The young he-storks engaged in many a petty quarrel, in which they flapped their wings furiously, and stabbed each other with their beaks till the blood came. Then they took mates, and built nests for themselves. It was what they lived for. New quarrels soon arose. For in these warm countries people are terribly passionate. All the same, it was very pleasant to the old ones. Nothing could be wrong that their young ones did. There was sunshine every day, and plenty to eat. Nothing to think of but pleasure. But in the great palace of the Egyptian host, as they called him, matters were not so pleasant. The rich and mighty lord lay stretched upon his couch, as stiff in every limb as if he had been a mummy. The great painted hall was as gorgeous as if he had been lying within a tulip. Relatives and friends stood around him. He was not dead, yet he could hardly be called living. The healing marsh flower from the northern lands, which was to be found and plucked by the one who loved him best, would never be brought. His young and lovely daughter, who in the plumage of a swan had flown over sea and land to the far north, would never return. The two other swan princesses had come back, and this was the tale they told. We were all flying high up in the air when a huntsman saw us and shot his arrow. It pierced our young friend to the heart, and she slowly sank. As she sank, she sang her farewell song and fell into the midst of a forest pool. There by the shore, under a drooping birch, we buried her. But we had our revenge. We bound fire under the wings of a swallow, which had its nest under the eaves of his cottage. 
the roof took fire, and the cottage blazed up, and he was burned in it. The flames shone on the pool where she lay, earth of the earth, under the birch. Never more will she come back to the land of Egypt. Then they both wept, and the father stork who heard it clattered with his beak and said, Pack of lies! I should like to drive my beak right into their breasts. Where would it break off? And a nice sight you would be then, said the mother stork. Think of yourself first, and then of your family. Everything else comes second to that. I will perch upon the open cupola tomorrow, when all the wise and learned folk assemble to talk about the sick man. Perhaps they will get a little nearer to the truth. The sages met together and talked long and learnedly, but the stork could neither make head or tail of it. Nothing came of it, however, either for the sick man or for his daughter who was buried in the wild bog. But we may just as well hear what they said, and we may, perhaps, understand the story better, or at least as well as the stork. Love is the food of life. The highest love nourishes the highest life. Only through love can this life be won back. This had been said and well said, declared the sages. It is a beautiful idea, said the father stork at once. I don't rightly understand it, said the mother stork. However, that is not my fault, but the fault of the idea. It really does not matter to me, though. I have other things to think about. The sages had talked a great deal about love, the difference between the love of lovers and that of parent and child, light and vegetation, and how the sunbeams kissed the mire, and forthwith young shoots sprang into being. The whole discourse was so learned that the father stork could not take it in, far less repeat it. He became quite pensive, and stood on one leg for a whole day with his eyes half shut. Learning was a heavy burden to him. Yet one thing the stork had thoroughly comprehended. He had learned from high and low alike what a misfortune it was to thousands of people, and to the whole country, that this man should be lying sick without hope of recovery. It would indeed be a blessed day which should see his health restored. But where blossoms the flower of healing for him? They had asked of one another, and they had also consulted all their learned writings, the twinkling stars, the winds, and the waves. The only answer that the sages had been able to give was, Love is the food of life. But how to apply that saying, they knew not. At last all were agreed that Sakura Sakura must come through the princess who loved her father with her whole heart and soul. And they at last decided what she was to do. It was more than a year and a day since they had sent her at night, when there was a new moon out into the desert to the Sphinx. There she had to push away the sand from the door at the base of it, and walk through the long passage which led right into the middle of the pyramid, where one of the mightiest of their ancient kings lay swathed in his mummy's bands in the midst of his wealth and glory. There she was to bend her head to the corpse, and it would be revealed to her where she would find healing and salvation for her father. All this she had done, and the exact spot had been shown her in dreams, where in the depths of the morass she would find the lotus flower that would touch her bosom beneath the water. And this she was to bring home. So she flew away in her swan's plumage to the wild bog in the far north. Now all this the father and mother stork had known from the beginning, and we understand the matter better than we did. We know that the marsh king dragged her down to himself, and that to those at home she was dead and gone. The wisest of them said, like the mother stork, she will look out for herself. So they awaited her return, not knowing in fact what else to do. I think I will snatch away the swan's plumage from the two deceitful princesses, said the father stork. Then they could not go to the wild bog to do any more mischief. I will keep the plumages up there till we find a use for them. Up where will you keep them? asked the mother stork. In her nest at the wild bog, said he. The young ones and I can carry them between us, and if they are too cumbersome, there are places enough on the way where we can hide them till our next flight. One plumage would be enough for her, but two are better. It is a good plan to have plenty of wraps in a northern country. You will get no thanks for it, said the mother stork, but you are the master. I have nothing to say except when I am sitting. 
In the meantime, the little child in the Viking's hall by the wild bog, whither the storks flew in the spring, had had a name given her. It was Helga. But such a name was far too gentle for such a wild spirit as dwelt within her. Month by month it showed itself more, and year by year, whilst the storks took the same journey, in autumn towards the Nile, and in spring towards the wild bog. The little child grew to be a big girl, and before one knew how, she was the loveliest maiden possible of sixteen. The husk was lovely, but the colonel was hard and rough, wilder than most even in those hard, wild times. Her greatest pleasure was to dabble her white hands in the blood of the horses slaughtered for sacrifice. In her wild freaks she would bite the heads off the black cocks which the priest was about to slay, and she said in full earnest to her foster-father, If thy foe were to come and throw a rope round the beams of thy house and pull it about thine ears, I would not wake thee if I could. I should not hear him for the tingling of the blood in the ear, thou once boxed years ago, I do not forget. But the Viking did not believe what she said. He, like everybody else, was infatuated by her beauty. Nor did he know how body and soul changed places in his little Helga in the dark hours of the night. She rode a horse barebacked, as if she were a part of it. Nor did she jump off while her steed bit and fought with the other wild horses. She would often throw herself from the cliff into the sea in all her clothes, and swim out to meet the Viking when his boat neared the shore and she cut off the longest strand of her beautiful long hair to string her bow. "'Self-made is well made,' said she. The Viking's wife, though strong-willed and strong-minded after the fashion of the times, became towards her daughter like any other weak, anxious mother, because she knew that a spell rested over the terrible child. Often, when her mother stepped out on the balcony, Helga, from pure love of teasing, it seemed, would sit down upon the edge of the well, throw up her hands and feet, and go backwards plump into the dark narrow hole. Here with her frog's nature she would rise again and clamber out like a cat dripping with water, carrying a perfect stream into the banqueting hall, washing aside the green twigs strewn on the floor. One bond, however, always held little Helga in check, and that was twilight. When it drew near, she became quiet and pensive, allowing herself to be called and directed. An inner perception, as it were, drew her towards her mother, and when the sun sank and the transformation took place, she sat sad and quiet, shriveled up into the form of a toad. Her body was now much bigger than those creatures ever are, but for that reason all the more unsightly. She looked like a wretched dwarf with the head of a frog and webbed fingers. There was something so piteous in her eyes, and voice she had none, only a hollow croak like the smothered sobs of a dreaming child. Then the Viking's wife would take it on her knee, and, looking into its eyes, would forget the misshapen form, and would often say, I could almost wish that thou wouldst always remain my dumb frog-child. Thou art more terrible to look at when thou art clothed in beauty. Then she would write runes against sickness and sorcery, and throw them over the miserable girl but they did no good at all. "'One would never think she had been small enough to lie in a water lily,' said the father stork. "'Now she is grown up, and the very image of her Egyptian mother, whom we never saw again. She did not manage to take such good care of herself as you and the sages said she would. I have been flying across the marsh year in, year out, and never have I seen a trace of her.' Yes, I may as well tell you that all these years, when I have come on in advance of you to look after the nest and set it to rights, I have spent many a night flying about like an owl or a bat scanning the open water, but all to no purpose. Nor have we had any use for the two swan plumages which the young ones and I dragged up here with so much difficulty. It took us three journeys to get them here. They have lain for years in the bottom of the nest, and if ever a disaster happens— such as a fire in the timbered house, they will be entirely lost. And our good nest would be lost too, said the mother stork. But you think less of that than you do of your feather dresses and your marsh princess. You had better go down to her one day and stay in the mire for good. You are a bad father to your own chicks, 
and I have always said so since the first time I hatched a brood. If only we or the young ones don't get an arrow through our wings from that mad Viking girl. She doesn't know what she is about. We are rather more at home here than she is, and she ought to remember that. We never forget our obligations. Every year we pay our toll of a feather, an egg, and a young one, as it is only right we should. Do you think that while she is about I care to go down there as I used to do, and as I do in Egypt when I am hail fellow well met with everybody, and where I peep into their pots and kettles if I like? No, indeed, I sit up here vexing myself about her, the vixen, and you too. You should have left her in the water, Lily, and there would have been an end of her. You are much more estimable than your words, said the father stork. I know you better than you know yourself, my dear. Then he gave a hop and flapped his wings thrice, proudly stretched out his neck and soared away without moving his outspread wings. When he had gone some distance he made some more powerful strokes, his head and neck bending proudly forward, while his plumage gleamed in the sunshine. What strength and speed there were in his flight. He is the handsomest of them all yet, said the mother stork, but I don't tell him that. End of section 35「Section 36 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Marsh King's Daughter. Part 2. The Viking came home early that autumn with his booty and prisoners. Among these was a young Christian priest, one of those men who persecuted the heathen gods of the north. There had often been discussions of late, both in the hall and in the woman's bower, about the new faith which was spreading in all the countries to the south. Through the holy Ansgarius it had spread as far as Hedeby on the Schlei. Even little Helga had heard of the belief in the white Christ who from love to man had given himself for their salvation. As far as Helga was concerned, it had all gone in at one ear and out at the other, as one says. The very meaning of the word love only seemed to dawn upon her when she was shriveled up into the form of a frog in her secret chamber. But the Viking's wife had listened to the story, and had felt herself strangely moved by all these tales about the son of the only true God. The men on their return from their raids told them all about the temples built of costly polished stone, which were raised to him whose message was love. Once a couple of heavy golden vessels of cunning workmanship were brought home about which hung a peculiar spicy odor. They were censers used by the Christian priests to swing before the altars on which blood never flowed, but where the bread and wine were changed to the body and blood of him who gave himself for the yet unborn generations. The young priest was imprisoned in the deep stone cellars of the timber house, and his feet and hands were bound with strips of bark. He was as beautiful as Baldur, said the Viking's wife, and she felt pity for him, but young Helga proposed that he should be hamstrung and be tied to the tails of wild oxen. Then would I let the dogs loose on him, high and away over marshes and pools. That would be a merry sight, and merrier still would it be to follow in his course. However, this was not the death the Viking wished him to die, but rather that as a denier and persecutor of the great gods he should be offered up in the morning upon the bloodstone in the groves. For the first time a man was to be sacrificed here. Young Helga begged that she might sprinkle the effigies of the gods and the people with his blood. She polished her sharp knife, and when one of the great ferocious dogs, of which there were so many about the place, sprang towards her, she dug her knife into its side. To try it, she said. But the Viking's wife looked sadly at the wild, badly disposed girl. When the night came, and the girl's beauty of body and soul changed places, she spoke tender words of grief from her sorrowful heart. The ugly toad, with its ungainly body, stood fixing its sad brown eyes upon her, listening and seeming to understand with the mind of a human being. Never once to my husband has a word of my double grief through you passed my lips said the Viking's wife. My heart is full of grief for you, 
great is a mother's love, but love never entered your heart. It is like a lump of cold clay. However did you get into my house? Then the ungainly creature trembled, as if the words touched some invisible cord between body and soul, and great tears came into its eyes. A bitter time will come to you, said the Viking's wife, and it will be a terrible one to me, too. Better would it have been if, as a child, you had been exposed on the highway and lulled by the cold to the sleep of death. And the Viking's wife shed bitter tears and went away in anger and sorrow, passing under the curtain of skins which hung from the beams and divided the hall. The shriveled-up toad crouched in the corner, and a dead silence reigned. At intervals a half-stifled sigh rose within her. It was as if, in anguish, something came to life in her heart. She took a step forward and listened. Then she stepped forward again, and grasped the heavy bar of the door with her clumsy hands. Softly she drew it back, and silently lifted the latch. Then she took up the lamp which stood in the anteroom. It seemed as if a strong power gave her strength. She drew out the iron bolt from the barred cellar door, and slipped in to the prisoner. He was asleep. She touched him with her cold, clammy hand, and when he woke and saw the hideous creature, he shuddered, as if he beheld an evil apparition. She drew out her knife and cut his bonds asunder, and then beckoned him to follow her. He named the holy name and made the sign of the cross, and as the form remained unchanged, he repeated the words of the psalmist, Blessed is the man who hath pity on the poor and needy, the Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Then he asked, Who art thou, whose outward appearance is that of an animal, whilst thou willingly performest deeds of mercy? The toad only beckoned him, and led him behind the sheltering curtains down a long passage to the stable, pointing to a horse, on to which he sprang, and she after him. She sat in front of him, clutching the mane of the animal. The prisoner understood her, and they rode at a quick pace along a path he never would have found to the heath. He forgot her hideous form, knowing that the mercy of the Lord worked through the spirits of darkness. He prayed and sang holy songs which made her tremble. Was it the power of prayer and his singing working upon her? Or was it the chill air of the advancing dawn? What were her feelings? She raised herself and wanted to stop and jump off the horse. But the Christian priest held her tightly, with all his strength, and sang aloud a psalm, as if this could lift the spell which held her. The horse bounded on more wildly than before, the sky grew red, and the first sunbeams pierced the clouds. As the stream of light touched her, the transformation took place. She was once more a lovely maiden, but her demoniac spirit was the same. The priest held a blooming maiden in his arms, and he was terrified at the sight. He stopped the horse and sprang down, thinking he had met with a new device of the evil one. But young Helga sprang to the ground too. The short child's frock only reached to her knee. She tore the sharp knife from her belt and rushed upon the startled man. "'Let me get at thee!' she cried. "'Let me reach thee, and my knife shall pierce thee. Thou art ashen pale, beardless slave!' She closed upon him, and they wrestled together, but an invisible power seemed to give strength to the Christian. He held her tight, and the old oak under which they stood seemed to help him, for the loosened roots above the ground tripped her up. Close by rose a bubbling spring, and he sprinkled her with water and commanded the unclean spirit to leave her, making the sign of the cross over her according to Christian usage. But the baptismal water has no power if the spring of faith flows not from within. Yet even here something more than man's strength opposed itself, through him, against the evil which struggled within her. Her arms fell, and she looked with astonishment and paling cheeks at this man, who seemed to be a mighty magician skilled in secret arts. These were dark runes he was repeating, and cabalistic signs he was tracing in the air. She would not have blanched, had he flourished a shining sword or a sharp axe before her face, but she trembled now as he traced the sign of the cross upon her forehead and bosom, and sat before him with drooping head like a wild bird tamed. 
He spoke gently to her about the deed of love she had performed for him this night, when she came in the hideous shape of a toad, cut his bonds asunder, and led him out to light and life. She herself was bound, he said, and with stronger bonds than his, but she also, through him, should reach to light and life everlasting. He would take her to Hedeby, to the holy Ansgarius, and there, in that Christian city, the spell would be removed, but she must no longer sit in front of him on the horse. Even if she went of her own free will, he dared not carry her thus. Thou must sit behind me, not before me. Thy magic beauty has a power given by the evil one, which I dread. Yet shall I have the victory through Christ. He knelt down, and prayed humbly and earnestly. It seemed as if the quiet wood became a holy church consecrated by his worship. The birds began to sing, as if they too were also of this new congregation, and the fragrance of the wild flowers was as the ambrosial perfume of incense, while the young priest recited the words of holy writ. The day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death, to guide their feet into the way of peace. He spoke of the yearning of all nature for redemption, and while he spoke the horse which had carried them stood quietly by, only rustling among the bramble bushes, and making the ripe, juicy fruit fall into little Helga's hands, as if inviting her to refresh herself. Patiently she allowed herself to be lifted onto the horse's back, and sat there like one in a trance, who neither watches nor wanders. The Christian man bound together two branches in the shape of a cross, which he held aloft in his hand as he rode through the wood. The brushwood grew thicker and thicker, till at last it became a trackless wilderness. Brushes of the wild slow blocked the way, and they had to ride round them. The bubbling springs turned to standing pools, and these they also had to ride round. Still, they found strength and refreshment in the pure breezes of the forest, and no less a power in the tender words of faith and love spoken by the young priest in his fervent desire to lead this poor straying one into the way of light and love. It is said that raindrops can wear a hollow in the hardest stone, and the waves of the sea can smooth and round the jagged rocks. So did the dew of mercy falling upon little Helga soften all that was hard and smooth all that was rough in her. Not that these effects were yet to be seen. She did not even know that they had taken place, any more than the buried seed lying in the earth knows that the refreshing showers and the warm sunbeams will cause it to flourish and bloom. As the mother's song unconsciously falls upon the child's heart, it stammers the words after her without understanding them, but later they crystallize into thoughts, and in time become clear. In this way, the word also worked here in the heart of Helga. They rode out of the wood, over a heath, and again through trackless forests. Towards evening they met a band of robbers. "'Where hast thou stolen this beautiful child?' they cried, stopping the horse and pulling down the two riders, for they were a numerous party. The priest had no weapon, but the knife which he had taken from little Helga, and with this he struck out right and left. One of the robbers raised his axe to strike him, but the Christian succeeded in springing to one side, or he would certainly have been hit. But the blade flew into the horse's neck, so that the blood gushed forth, and it fell to the ground dead. Then little Helga, as if roused from a long, deep trance, rushed forward and threw herself onto the gasping horse. The priest placed himself in front of her as a shield and defense, but one of the robbers swung his iron club with such force at his head that the blood and the brains were scattered about and he fell dead upon the ground. The robbers seized little Helga by her white arms, but the sun was just going down, and as the last rays vanished she was changed into the form of a frog. A greenish-white mouth stretched half over her face. Her arms became thin and slimy, while broad hands with webbed fingers spread themselves out like fans. The robbers, in terror, let her go, and she stood among them a hideous monster, and, according to frog nature, she bounded away with great leaps as high as herself, and disappeared in the thicket. 
Then the robbers perceived that this must be Loki's evil spirit or some other witchcraft, and they hurried away affrighted. The full moon had risen, and was shining in all its splendor when poor little Helga, in the form of a frog, crept out of the thicket. She stopped by the body of the Christian priest and the dead horse. She looked at them with eyes which seemed to weep. A sob came from the toad like that of a child bursting to tears. She threw herself down, first upon one, and then on the other, and brought water in her hand, which, from being large and webbed, formed a cup. This she sprinkled them with, but they were dead, and dead they must remain. This she understood. Soon wild animals would come and devour them, but no, that should never be. So she dug into the ground as deep as she could. She wished to dig a grave for them. She had nothing but the branch of a tree in her two hands, and she tore the web between her fingers until the blood ran from them. She soon saw that the task would be beyond her, so she fetched fresh water and washed the face of the dead man, and strewed fresh green leaves over it. She also brought large boughs to cover him, and scattered dry leaves between the branches. Then she brought the heaviest stones she could carry and laid them over the dead body, filling up the spaces with moss. Now she thought the mound was strong and secure enough, but the difficult task had employed the whole night. The sun was just rising, and there stood little Helga in all her beauty, with bleeding hands and maidenly tears for the first time, on her blushing cheeks. It was in this transformation as if two natures were struggling in her. She trembled and glanced round as if she were just awakening from a troubled dream. She leaned for support against a slender beech, and at last climbed to the topmost branches like a cat, and seated herself firmly upon them. She sat there for the whole live-long day, like a frightened squirrel in the solitude of the wood, where all is still and dead, as they say. Dead. Well, there flew a couple of butterflies whirling around and round each other, and close by were some ant hills, each with its hundreds of busy little creatures swarming to and fro. In the air danced countless midges, and swarm upon swarm of flies, ladybirds, dragonflies with golden wings, and other little winged creatures. The earthworm crept forth from the moist ground, and the moles, but excepting these all was still and dead around. When people say this, they don't quite understand what they mean. None noticed little Helga but a flock of jackdaws which flew chattering around the tree where she sat. They hopped along the branch towards her, boldly inquisitive, but a glance from her eye was enough to drive them away. They could not make her out, though, any more than she could understand herself. When the evening drew near, and the sun began to sink, the approaching transformation roused her to fresh exertion. She slipped down gently from the tree, and when the last sunbeam was extinguished she sat there once more, the shriveled-up frog with her torn, webbed hands. But her eyes now shone with a new beauty, which they had hardly possessed in all the pride of her loveliness. These were the gentlest and tenderest maiden's eyes which now shone out of the face of the frog. They bore witness to the existence of deep feeling and a human heart. And the beauteous eyes overflowed with tears, weeping precious drops that lightened the heart. The cross made of branches, the last work of him who now was dead and cold, still lay by the grave. Little Helga took it up. The thought came unconsciously, and she placed it between the stones which covered man and horse. At the sad recollection her tears burst forth again, and in this mood she traced the same sign in the earth round the grave. And as she formed with both hands the sign of the cross, the webbed skin fell away from her fingers like a torn glove. She washed her hands at the spring, and gazed in astonishment at their delicate whiteness. Again she made the holy sign in the air, between herself and the dead man. Her lips trembled, her tongue moved, and the name which she in her ride through the forest had so often heard rose to her lips, and she uttered the words, Jesus Christ. The frog's skin fell away from her. She was the beautiful young maiden, but her head bent wearily and her lips required rest. She slept. But her sleep was short, 
She was awakened at midnight, before her stood the dead horse prancing and full of life, which shone forth from his eyes and his wounded neck. Close by his side appeared the murdered Christian priest, more beautiful than Baldur, the Viking's life might indeed have said, and yet he was surrounded by flames of fire. There was such earnestness in his large, mild eyes, and such righteous judgment in his penetrating glance which pierced into the remotest corners of her heart. Little Helga trembled, and every memory within her awakened as if it had been the day of judgment. Every kindness which had ever been shown her, every loving word which had ever been said to her, came vividly before her. She now understood that it was love which had sustained her in those days of trial, through which all creatures formed of dust and clay, soul and spirit, must wrestle and struggle. She acknowledged that she had but followed whither she was called, had done nothing for herself, all had been given her. She bent now in lowly humility, and full of shame, before him who could read every impulse of her heart. And in that moment she felt the purifying flame of the Holy Spirit thrill through her soul. Thou daughter of earth, said the Christian martyr, out of the earth art thou come, from the earth shalt thou rise again. The sunlight within thee shall consciously return to its origin, not the beams of the actual sun, but those from God. No soul will be lost, things temporal are full of weariness, but eternity is life-giving. I come from the land of the dead. Thou also must one day journey through the deep valleys to reach the radiant mountain summits, where dwell grace and all perfections. I cannot lead thee to Hedeby for Christian baptism. First must thou break the watery shield that covers the deep morass, and bring forth from its depths the living author of thy being and thy life. Thou must first carry out thy vocation before thy consecration may take place. Then he lifted her up on to the horse, and gave her a golden censer like those she had seen in the Viking's hall. A fragrant perfume arose from it, and the open wound on the martyr's forehead gleamed like a radiant diadem. He took the cross from the grave, holding it high above him, while they rode rapidly through the air, across the murmuring woods, and over the heights where the mighty warriors of old lay buried, each seated on his dead war-horse. These strong men of war arose and rode out to the summits of the mounds, the broad golden circlets round their foreheads gleaming in the moonlight, and their cloaks fluttering in the wind. The great dragon hoarding his treasure raised his head to look at them, and the whole hosts of dwarfs peeped forth from their hillocks, swarming with red, green, and blue lights, like sparks from the ashes of burnt paper. Away they flew over wood and heath, rivers and pools, up north towards the wild bog. Arrived there they hovered round in great circles. The martyr raised high the cross, it shone like gold, and his lips chanted the holy mass. Little Helga sang with him as a child joins in its mother's song. She swung the censer, and from it issued a fragrance of the altar so strong and so wonder-working, that the reeds and rushes burst into blossom, and numberless flower-stems shot up from the bottomless steps. Everything that had life within it lifted itself up and blossomed. The water-lilies spread themselves over the surface of the pool like a carpet of wrought flowers, and on this carpet lay a sleeping woman. She was young and beautiful. Little Helga fancied she saw herself, her picture mirrored in the quiet pool. It was her mother she saw, the wife of the Marsh King, the princess from the River Nile. The martyred priest commanded the sleeping woman to be lifted up on the horse, but the animal sank beneath the burden, as though it had no more substance than a winding sheet floating on the wind. But the sign of the cross gave strength to the phantom, and all three rode on through the air to dry ground. Just then the cock crew from the Viking's hall, and the vision melted away in the mist which was driven along by the wind. But mother and daughter stood side by side. Is it myself I see reflected in the deep water? said the mother. Do I see myself mirrored in a bright shield? said the daughter. But as they approached and clasped each other heart to heart, the mother's heart beat the fastest, and she understood. My child, 
my own heart's blossom, my lotus out of the deep waters. And she wept over her daughter. Her tears were a new baptism of love and life for little Helga. I came hither in a swan's plumage, and here I threw it off, said the mother. I sank down into the bog, which closed around me. Some power always dragged me down, deeper and deeper. I felt the hand of sleep pressing upon my eyelids. I fell asleep, and I dreamt. I seemed to be again in the vast Egyptian pyramid, but still before me stood the moving alder stump which had frightened me on the surface of the bog. I gazed at the fissures of the bark, and they shone out in bright colors and turned to hieroglyphs. It was the mummy's wrappings I was looking at. The coverings burst asunder, and out of them walked the mummy king of a thousand years ago, black as pitch, black as the shining wood sail, or the slimy mud of the swamp. Whether it were the mummy king or the marsh king I knew not. He threw his arms around me, and I felt that I must die. When life came back to me I felt something warm upon my bosom, a little bird fluttering its wings and twittering. It flew from my bosom high up towards the heavy dark canopy, but a long green ribbon still bound it to me. I heard and understood its notes of longing. Freedom! Sunshine! To the Father! I remembered my own father in the sunlit land of my home, my life and my love, and I loosened the ribbon and let it flutter away, home to my father. Since that hour I have dreamt no more. I must have slept a long and heavy sleep till this hour, when sweet music and fragrant odors awoke me and set me free. Where did now the green ribbon flutter which bound the mother's heart to the wings of the bird? Only the stork had seen it. The ribbon was the green stem, the bow the gleaming flower which cradled the little baby, now grown up to her full beauty, and once more resting on her mother's breast. While they stood there, pressed heart to heart, the stork was wheeling above their heads in great circles. At length he flew away to his nest and brought back the swan's plumages so long cherished there. He threw one over each of them. The feathers closed over them closely, and mother and daughter rose into the air as two white swans. Now let us talk, said the father stork for we can understand each other's language, even if one sort of bird has a different shaped beak from another. It is the most fortunate thing in the world that you appeared this evening. Tomorrow we should have been off, mother and I and the young ones. We are going to fly southwards. Yes, you may look at me. I am an old friend from the Nile, so is mother too. Her heart is not so sharp as her beak. She always said that the princess would take care of herself. I and the young ones carried the swan's plumage up here. How delighted I am, and how lucky it is that I am still here. As soon as the day dawns we will set off, a great company of storks. We will fly in front, you had better follow us, and then you won't lose your way, and we will keep an eye upon you. And the lotus flower which I was to take with me, said the Egyptian princess, flies by my side in a swan's plumage. I take the flower of my heart with me, and so the riddle is solved. Now for home, home. But Helga said she could not leave the Danish land without seeing her loving foster mother once more, the Viking's wife. For in Helga's memory now rose up every happy recollection, every tender word, and every tear her foster mother had shed over her, and it almost seemed as if she loved this mother best. Yes, we must go to the Viking's hall, said the father stork. Mother and the young ones are waiting for us there. How they will open their eyes and flap their wings. Mother doesn't say much. She is somewhat short and abrupt, but she means very well. Now I will make a great clattering to let them know we are coming. So he clattered with his beak, and he and the swans flew off to the Viking's hall. They all lay in a deep sleep within. The Viking's wife had gone late to rest, for she was in great anxiety about little Helga who had not been seen in three days. She had disappeared with the Christian priest, and she must have helped him away. It was her horse which was missing from the stable. By what power had this been brought to pass? The Viking's wife thought over all the many miracles which were said to have been performed by the white Christ, and by those who believed in him and followed him. All these thoughts took form in her dreams, and it seemed to her that she was still awake, 
sitting thoughtfully upon her bed while darkness reigned without. A storm arose. She heard the rolling of the waves east and west of her from the North Sea, and from the waters of the Catechet. The monstrous serpent, which, according to her faith, encompassed the earth in the depths of the ocean, was trembling in convulsions from the dread of Ragnarok, the night of the gods. He personified the day of judgment, when everything should pass away, even the great gods themselves. The Gyalar horn sounded, and away over the rainbow rode the gods, clad in steel, to fight their last battle. Before them flew the shield maidens, the Valkyrias, and the ranks were closed by the phantoms of the dead warriors. The whole atmosphere shone in the radiance of the northern lights, but darkness conquered in the end. It was a terrible hour, and in her dream little Helga sat close beside the frightened woman, crouching on the floor in the form of a hideous frog. She trembled and crept closer to her foster mother, who took her on her knee, and in her love pressed her to her bosom, notwithstanding the hideous frog's skin. And the air resounded with the clashing of sword and club and the whistling of arrows as though a fierce hailstorm were passing over them. The hour had come when heaven and earth were to pass away, the stars to fall, and everything to succumb to Surtur's fire. And yet a new earth and a new heaven would rise, and fields of corn would wave where the seas now rolled over the golden sands. The god whom none might name would reign, and to him would ascend Baldur the mild, the loving, Redeemed from the kingdom of the dead, he was coming. The Viking's wife saw him plainly. She knew his face. It was that of the Christian priest, their prisoner. White Christ, she cried aloud. And as she named the name, she pressed a kiss upon the forehead of the loathsome toad. The frog's skin fell away, and before her stood little Helga in all the radiance of her beauty, gentle as she had never been before and with beaming eyes. She kissed her foster mother's hands, and blessed her for all the care and love she had shown in the days of her trial and misery. She thanked her for the thoughts she had instilled into her, and for naming the name which she now repeated, White Christ. Little Helga rose up as a great white swan, and spread her wings, with the rushing sound of a flock of birds of passage on the wing. The Viking's wife was awakened by the rushing sound of wings outside. She knew it was the time when the storks took their flight, and it was these she heard. She wanted to see them once more and to bid them farewell, so she got up and went out on the balcony. She saw stork upon stork sitting up on the roofs of the outbuildings round the courtyard, and flocks of them were flying round and round in great circles. Just in front of her, on the edge of the well where little Helga so often had frightened her with her wildness, sat two white swans, who gazed at her with their wise eyes. Then she remembered her dream, which still seemed quite real to her. She thought of little Helga in the form of a swan. She thought of the Christian priest, and suddenly a great joy arose in her heart. The swans flapped their wings and bent their heads as if to greet her, and the Viking's wife stretched out her arms towards them as if she understood all about it, and she smiled at them with tears in her eyes. "'We are not going to wait for the swans,' said the mother stork. "'If they want to travel with us, they must come. We can't dawdle here till the plowers start. It is very nice to travel as we do, the whole family together, not like the chaffinches and the roughs, when the males and females fly separately. It's hardly decent. And why are those swans flapping their wings like that?' "'Well, everyone flies in his own way,' said the father stork. The swans fly in an oblique line, the cranes in the form of a triangle, and the plowers in a curved line like a snake. Don't talk about snakes while we're flying up here, said the mother stork. It puts desires into the young ones' heads which they can't gratify. Are those the high mountains I used to hear about? asked Helga in the swan's plumage. Those are the thunderclouds driving along beneath us, said her mother. What are those white clouds that rise so high? again inquired Helga. "'Those are the mountains covered with perpetual snows that you see yonder,' said her mother, as they flew across the Alps down towards the blue Mediterranean. "'Africa's land, Egypt's strand,' said the daughter of the Nile in her joy. 
as from far above in her swan's plumage her eye fell upon the narrow waving yellow line, her birthplace. The other birds saw it too, and hastened to their flight. "'I smell the Nile mud and the frogs,' said the mother stork. "'I am tingling all over. Now you will have something nice to taste and something to see too. There are the marabouts, the ibis, and the crane. They all belong to our family, but they are not nearly so handsome as we are. They are very stuck up, though, especially the ibis. They have been so spoilt by the Egyptians. They make mummies of him and stuff him with spices. I would rather be stuffed with living frogs, and so would you. And so you shall be. Better have something in your crops while you are alive than have a great fuss made over you after you are dead. That's my opinion, and I am always right. The storks have come back, was said in the great house on the Nile, where its lord lay in the great hall on his downy cushions, covered with a leopard skin, scarcely alive, and yet not dead either, waiting and hoping for the lotus flower from the deep morass in the north. Relatives and servants stood round his couch, when two great white swans who had come with the storks flew into the hall. They threw off their dazzling plumage, and there stood two beautiful women, as like each other as twin drops of dew. They bent over the pale, withered old man, throwing back their long hair. As little Helga bent over her grandfather, the color came back to his cheeks, and new life returned to his limbs. The old man rose with health and energy renewed. His daughter and granddaughter clasped him in their arms, as if with a joyous morning greeting after a long troubled night. Joy reigned throughout the house, and in the stork's nest, too. But there the rejoicing was chiefly over the abundance of food, especially the swarms of frogs. And while the sages hastily sketched the story of the two princesses, and the flower of healing, which brought such joy and blessing to the land, the parent storks told the same story in their own way to their family. But only when they had all satisfied their appetites, or they would have had something better to do than listen to stories. "'Surely you will be made something at last,' whispered the mother stork. "'It wouldn't be reasonable otherwise.' "'Oh, what should I be made?' said the father stork. "'And what have I done? Nothing at all. "'You have done more than all the others. "'Without you and the young ones, the two princesses would never have been in Egypt again, "'nor would the old man have recovered his health. "'You will become something. "'They will at least give you a doctor's degree, "'and our young ones will be born with the title.' and their young ones after them. Why, you look like an Egyptian doctor already, at least in my eyes. And now the learned men and the sages set to work to propound the inner principle, as they called it, that lay at the root of the matter. Love is the food of life, was their text. Then came the explanations. The princess was the warm sunbeam. She went down to the marsh king, and from their meeting sprang forth the blossom. I can't exactly repeat the words, said the father stork. He had been listening on the roof and now wanted to tell them all about it in the nest. What they said was so involved and so clever that they not only received rank but presents too. Even the head cook had a mark of distinction, most likely for the soup. And what did you get? asked the mother stork. They ought not to forget the most important person, and that is what you are. The sages have only cackled about it all but your turn will come, no doubt. Late at night, when the whole happy household were wrapped in peaceful slumbers, there was still one watcher. It was not Father Stork, although he stood up in the nest on one leg like a sentry asleep at his post. No, it was little Helga. She was watching, bending out over the balcony in the clear air, gazing at the shining stars, bigger and purer in their radiance than she had ever seen them in the north. And yet, they were the same. She thought of the Viking's wife by the wild bog. She thought of her foster mother's gentle eyes, and the tears she had shed over the poor frog child, who now stood in the bright starlight and delicious spring air by the waters of the Nile. She thought of the love in the heathen woman's breast, the love she had lavished on a miserable creature, who in human guise was a wild animal, and when in the form of an animal was hateful to the sight and to the touch. She looked at the shining stars, and remembered the dazzling light on the forehead of the martyred priest as he flew over moorland and forest. The tones of his voice came back to her, 
and words that he had said while she sat, overwhelmed and crushed, words concerning the sublime source of love, the highest love embracing all generations of mankind. What had not been won and achieved by this love? Day and night little Helga was absorbed in the thought of her happiness. She entirely lost herself in the contemplation of it, like a child who turns hurriedly from the giver to examine the beautiful gifts. Happy she was indeed, and her happiness seemed ever growing. More might come, would come. In these thoughts she indulged until she thought no more of the giver. It was in the wantonness of youth that she thus sinned. Her eyes sparkled with pride, but suddenly she was roused from her vain dream. She heard a great clatter in the courtyard below, and looking out, saw two great ostriches rushing hurriedly round in circles. Never before had she seen this great, heavy, clumsy bird, which looked as if its wings had been clipped, and the birds themselves had the appearance of having been roughly used. She asked what had happened to them, and for the first time heard the legend the Egyptians tell concerning the ostrich. Once, they say, the ostriches were a beautiful and glorious race of birds, with large, strong wings. One evening the great birds of the forest said to it, Brother, shall we tomorrow, God willing, go down to the river to drink? And the ostrich answered, I will. At the break of day, then, they flew off, first rising high in the air towards the sun, the eye of God. Still higher and higher the ostrich flew, far in front of the other birds, in its pride flying close up to the light. He trusted in his own strength, and not on that of the giver. He would not say, God willing. But the avenging angel drew back the veil from the flaming ocean of sunlight, and in a moment the wings of the proud bird were burnt, and he sank miserably to the earth. Since that time the ostrich and his race have never been able to rise in the air. He can only fly terror-stricken along the ground, or round and round in narrow circles. It is a warning to mankind, reminding us in every thought and action to say, God willing. Helga thoughtfully and seriously bent her head, and looked at the hunted ostrich, noticed its fear and its miserable pride at the sight of its own great shadow on the white moonlit wall. Her thoughts grew graver and more earnest. A life so rich in joy had already been given her. What more was to come? The best of all, perhaps. God willing. Early in the spring, when the storks were again about to take flight to the north, little Helga took off her gold bracelet, and, scratching her name on it, beckoned to Father Stork and put it round his neck. She told him to take it to the Viking's wife, who would see by it that her foster daughter still lived, was happy, and had not forgotten her. It is a heavy thing to carry, thought the father stork as it slipped onto his neck. But neither gold nor honor are to be thrown upon the highway. The stork brings good luck, they say up there. You lay gold and I lay eggs, said the mother stork, but you only lay once and I lay every year. But no one appreciates us. I call it very mortifying. One always has the consciousness of one's own worth, though, mother, said the father stork. "'But you can't hang it outside,' said the mother stork. "'It neither gives a fair wind nor a full meal.' And they took their departure. The little nightingale singing in the tamarind bushes was also going north soon. Helga had often heard it singing by the wild bog, so she determined to send a message by it too. She knew the bird language from having worn a swan's plumage, and she had kept it up by speaking to the storks and the swallows. The nightingale understood her quite well so she begged it to fly to the beechwood in Jutland, where she had made the grave of stones and branches. She bade it tell all the other little birds to guard the grave, and to sing over it. The nightingale flew away, and time flew away too. In the autumn an eagle perched on one of the pyramids saw a gorgeous train of heavily laden camels, and men clad in armor riding fiery Arab steeds as white as silver with quivering red nostrils, and flowing manes reaching to the ground. A royal prince from Arabia, as handsome as a prince should be, was arriving at the stately mansion where now the stork's nest stood empty. Its inhabitants were still in their northern home, but they would soon now return, nay, on the very day when the rejoicings were at their height, they returned. 
They were bridal festivities, and little Helga was the bride, clad in rich silk and many jewels. The bridegroom was the young prince from Arabia, and they sat together at the upper end of the table between their mother and her grandfather. But Helga was not looking at the bridegroom's handsome face round which his black beard curled, nor did she look into his fiery dark eyes which were fixed upon hers. She was gazing up at a brilliant twinkling star which was beaming in the heavens. Just then there was a rustle of great wings in the air outside. The storks had come back, and the old couple, tired as they were and needing rest, flew straight down to the railing of the veranda. They knew nothing about the festivities. They had heard on the frontiers of the country that little Helga had had them painted on the wall, for they belonged to the story of her life. It was prettily done of her, said the father stork. It is little enough, said the mother stork. They could hardly do less. When Helga saw them, she rose from the table, and went out to the veranda to stroke their wings. The old storks bowed their heads, and the very youngest ones looked on and felt honored. And Helga looked up at the shining star, which seemed to grow brighter and purer. Between herself and the star floated a form purer even than the air, and therefore visible to her. It floated quite close to her, and she saw that it was the martyred priest. He also had come to her great festival, come even from the heavenly kingdom. The glory and bliss yonder far outshines these earthly splendors, he said. Little Helga prayed more earnestly and meekly than she had ever done before, that for one single moment she might gaze into the kingdom of heaven. Then she felt herself lifted up above the earth in a stream of sweet sounds and thoughts. The unearthly music was not only around her, it was within her. No words can express it. Now we must return. You will be missed, said the martyr. Only one glance more, she pleaded. Only one short moment more. We must return to earth. The guests are departing. Only one look, the last. Little Helga stood once again on the veranda. But all the torches outside were extinguished, and all the lights in the banqueting hall were out, too. The storks were gone. No guests were to be seen. No bridegroom. All had vanished in those short three minutes. A great dread seized upon Helga. She walked through the great empty hall into the next chamber, where strange warriors were sleeping. She opened a side door, which led into her own room, but she found herself in a garden which had never been there before. Red gleams were in the sky. Dawn was approaching. Only three minutes in heaven, and a whole night on earth had passed away. Then she saw the storks. She called to them in her own language. Father Stork turned his head, listened, and came up to her. You speak our language, he said. What do you want? Why do you come here, you strange woman? It is I, it is Helga, don't you know me? We were talking to each other in the veranda three minutes ago. That is a mistake, said the stork. You must have dreamt it. No, no, she said, and she reminded him of the Viking stronghold and the wild bog and their journey together. Father Stork blinked his eyes and said, Why, that is a very old story. I believe it happened in the time of my great-great-grandmother. Yes, there certainly was a princess in Egypt who came from the Danish land, but she disappeared on her wedding night many hundreds of years ago. You may read all about it here on the monument in the garden. There are both storks and swans carved on it, and you are at the top yourself, all in white marble. And so it was. Helga understood all about it now and sank upon her knees. The sun burst forth, and, as in former times, the frog's skin fell away before his beams and revealed the beautiful girl. So now, in the baptism of light, a vision of beauty, brighter and purer than the air, a ray of light, rose to the Father. The earthly body dropped away in dust. Only a withered lotus flower lay where she had stood. Well, that is a new ending to the story said Father Stork. I hadn't expected that, but I like it very well. 
What will the young ones say about it? asked Mother Stork. Ah, that is a very important matter, said Father Stork. End of section 36《Section 37 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Nielsen www.mrtimay.com Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas The Galishes of Fortune Chapter 1 A grand party was assembled one evening in a big house in East Street, Copenhagen. It was one of those parties given no doubt in the expectation that invitations would already be received in return. Half the company were already seated at the card tables and the other half were waiting to see what would be the result of a remark of their hostess. Now we must see what we can do to amuse ourselves. They were at this point, and the conversation was getting on as well as it could. Among other subjects, it fell upon the Middle Ages. Some considered that period far superior to our own, Nay, Mr. Counselor Knapp defended this view so vigorously that he won over the hostess to his side, and both inveighed against Osersted's article in the Almanac on Ancient and Modern Times, in which preference is given to our own. The Counselor considered the times of King Hans as noblest and happiest. During all this talk, which was only interrupted for a moment by the arrival of the newspaper in which there was nothing worth reading, we will retire into an anti-room which was given to cloaks, sticks, umbrellas, and galishes. Two maidens were sitting here, one young and one old. It might be supposed that they had come to accompany their mistresses home, some old maid or widow lady. If, however, one looked a little closer, one soon saw that they were not ordinary maids. Their hands were too white, their bearing and their movements were too distinguished for that, and then the cut of their clothes was too elegant and uncommon. They were, in fact, two fairies. The youngest, though not Dame Fortune herself, was the messenger of one of her maids of honor, used to carry about smaller gifts of fortune. The elder one looked very serious. She was sorrow, and she always goes about herself to do her errands in person, for then she knows they are all well done. They were telling each other where they had been during the day. She, who was the handmaid of fortune, had only been employed on some trifling matters, such as saving a new hat from the downpour of rain, or procuring a greeting for an honest man from a grand nobody and so on. What she still had left to do was quite out of the ordinary way. I must tell you, she said, that today is my birthday, and in honor of it, I have had entrusted to me a pair of galishes which I am to convey to mankind. These galishes have this property, that whoever puts them on will immediately find himself in whatever place or period he would like. Every wish with regard to time or place will be at once gratified, and the wearer will thus for once find perfect happiness in the world. Ha! Huh, a likely story, said Sorrow. He will be sorely unhappy, and will bless the moment when he can get rid of those gaulishes. What nonsense are you talking? said the other. I will place them here near the door, and someone will take them by mistake, and in putting them on will find happiness. Thus ended the conversation. Chapter 2 What Happened to the Counselor It was late when Counselor Knapp, lost in thought about the good old times of King Hans, wanted to go home, 
and fate willed it so that instead of his own goloshes, he put those on of fortune, and went out into E Street. But, by the magic power of the goloshes, in doing so he stepped straight back three hundred years into the reign of King Hans, and therefore his feet sank into mud and slush of those times, the streets then not being paved. Oh, this is terrible, he said. What mud, and what has become of the footpath, and the lamps are extinguished. The moon had not yet risen, and it was rather foggy, so that everything melted away into darkness. At the nearest street corner, however, hung a lantern in front of an image of Madonna, but the light it gave was as good as none. He only saw it when he was close under it, and his eyes fell on the figures of the mother and child. It is most likely the Museum of Art. They have forgotten to take down the sign. Two persons in the dress of the Middle Ages passed by him. Who on earth are these? They must be coming from the masquerade. All at once he heard drums and fifes, and blazing torches shone around him. The counselor stopped to look, while the extraordinary procession passed him. First came the whole troop of drummers, beating their drums very cleverly. They were followed by halberdiers with long bows and crossbows. The principal person in the procession wore a clerical dress. In astonishment, the counselor asked what was the meaning of all this and who the man was. It is the Bishop of Zealand, he answered. Good gracious, he exclaimed. Whatever has the bishop taken into his head? Then he shook his head and murmured that it could not possibly be the bishop. Musing over this, and without looking either to the right or the left, the counselor walked on down East Street and over to High Bridge Place. He could not find the bridge to Palace Square at all, but only saw a shallow stream, and at last came upon two men with a boat. Does the gentleman want to be put over to home? asked they. Over to home, said the counselor, who had no idea what age he was now living. I want to go to Christian's Haven in Little Turf Street. The men stared at him. Only tell me where to find the bridge, he said. It's shameful that there are no lamps lighted, and that it's so muddy one might be walking in a swamp. But the more he talked to the boatmen, the less they understood each other. I don't understand your jargon, he cried at last, and turned his back on them. The bridge, however, he could not find, nor any railing. What a scandalous condition the place is in, he said. Never certainly had he found his own age so miserable as on this evening. I think it will be better for me to take a coach. But where are they? There was not one to be seen. I must go back to King's New Market Place, where there is a stand, or I shall never get back to Christian's Haven. So he walked back to E Street and had nearly traversed the length of it when the moon burst through a cloud. "'Good gracious! Whatever is this erection?' he exclaimed, as he caught sight of the East Gate, which in olden times used to be a stand at the end of East Street. At least he found a wicket gate, and passed through onto what is now the new marketplace. Nothing was to be seen but a great open meadow. A few solitary bushes stood here and there, and a wide stream flowed across it. On the opposite bank stood a few miserable wooden booths, used by Dutch watermen, whence it gained its name of the Dutch Meadow. Either I see a fate to Morgana, as they call it, or else I am drunk. The counselor groaned. What can it be? What is the matter with me? He turned back again, firmly convinced that he must be ill. On entering the street again, he looked more closely at the houses. Most of them were timbered and with thatched roofs. I am certainly quite out of sorts, he sighed, and yet I only drank one glass of punch. 
but I can't even stand that. And it really is too bad to give us punch with hot salmon. I shall have to tell our hostess so. Shall I go straight back and tell them what a condition I am in? It would look so foolish, and I should hardly expect anyone to be up now. He tried to find the house, but in vain. This is desperate. I don't know East Street again. Not a shop to be seen, only miserable, tumble-down hovels such as one might find in Roseguild or Rankstead. Oh, how ill am I. It's no good standing on ceremony. But where in the world is the agent's house? There is a house, but it looks not like itself. There are still some people up in it. I can hear them. Oh dear, I feel very queer. He found a half-open door through which a light streamed. It was a tavern of the olden times and seemed to be a kind of beer house. The room looked like one of those old-fashioned house places of Holstein with a clay floor. A number of good folks, consisting mostly of seamen, Copenhagen burgers, and a few scholars sat in a deep conversation over their mugs, and took very little notice of him as he stepped in. Pardon me, said the counselor to the landlady. I do not feel very well and I should be much obliged if you would send for a coach to take me home to Christian's Haven. The woman stared at him and shook her head. Then she spoke to him in German, from which the counselor concluded that she did not understand Danish, and repeated his request in German. This, as well as his strange dress, convinced the woman that he was a foreigner. She soon understood that he felt ill and brought him a mug of water which was certainly rather brackish, as it came from the well outside. The counselor rested his head on his hand, drew a deep breath, and pondered over all the wonders around him. Is that this evening's day? he asked, for the sake of saying something, as he saw the woman folding a large sheet of paper. She did not understand what he meant but handed him the sheet. It was a woodcut representing a comet seen in the city of Cologne. That is very old, said the counselor, becoming quite excited at discovering this ancient woodcut. Wherever did you get this rare print? It is very interesting, although the whole affair is a fable. Comets are easily explained in these days. They are northern lights, and are no doubt caused by electricity. Those who sat near him, and heard what he said, looked at him in astonishment, and one of them rose, took off his hat respectfully, and said in a very serious manner, You must be a very learned man, monsieur. Oh, no, replied the counsellor. I can only discourse a little on the topics, which everyone should understand. Modestia is a beautiful virtue said the man. Otherwise, I must say your speech is may secure vitor, yet in this case I willingly suspend my eudicium. May I ask whom I have the pleasure of addressing? said the counsellor. I am Baccalaureus Scripturae Secrae, said the man. This answer was enough for the counsellor, for the title agreed with the dress. Some old village schoolmaster, he thought, an odd fellow, such as one still may find in Jutland. This is certainly not a locus descendi, began the man. Still, I must beg you to continue the conversation. You must be deeply read in ancient writings. Oh, uh, pretty well, replied the counsellor. I am very fond of reading useful old books, and modern ones as well, with the exception of everyday stories, of which we really have more than enough in real life. Everyday stories, asked Baccarellus. Yes, I mean, these new novels. Oh, replied the man with a smile. And yet they are very witty, and are much read at court. The king is especially fond of the Romance of Iwan and Jaiwan, which describes King Arthur and his knights of the round table. 
He has joked about it with the gentlemen of his court. Well, I have certainly not read that. I suppose it is a new one which Heiberg just published. No, answered the man. It is not by Heiberg. Godfred von German brought it out. Oh, is he the publisher? That is a very old name. Why, he was the first printer we had in Denmark. Yes, he is our first printer, said the man. So far, all had passed off very well. Now one of the burghers began to speak of a terrible pestilence which had been raging a year or two before, meaning the plague of 1484. The councillor supposed that he alluded to the chlora, and they got on without finding out their mistake. The Freebooters' War of 1490 was still so near that it was the next topic. The English Freebooters had taken ships on the Redden, said they. The councillor, who was well up in the incident of 1801, was quite at one with them against the English. After that, the conversation was not so pleasant. Every moment, one contradicted the other. The honest Bacalaris was so ignorant that the simplest utterances of the councillor sounded to him wildly fantastic. They looked at each other, and when they became quite incomprehensible to each other, Bacalaris spoke Latin in the hope of being better understood. But it was all no use. How are you now? asked the landlady, pulling the counselor by the sleeve. This brought him to himself, for while he had been talking he had entirely forgotten what had passed before. Where am I? he said, his brain reeling as he tried to think. We have a claret, mead, and bremen beer, shouted one of the guests. And you shall drink with us. Two maids came in. One of them wore a party-colored hood. They filled the glasses and curtsied. A cold shiver ran down the counselor's back. What is this? What does it mean? Said he, but he was obliged to drink with them. They quite overpowered the good man. He was in despair, and when one of them said he was drunk, he never doubted the man's words, but begged them to fetch him a drosky and then they thought he was speaking the Muscovite tongue. Never had he been in such low, coarse company. One might have thought the country had gone back to heathdom again. Said he to himself, This is the most terrible moment of my life. Just then, it came into his head to stoop down under the table, creep to the door, and so try to get away. But just as he reached the door, the others perceived his intention and seized him by the feet, when, luckily for him, off came the Galishes, and with them all the enchantment. The counselor now saw quite plainly a brightly burning lamp in front of him, and behind it a large house. Every house round was familiar to him. He was in East Street just as we know it. He was lying with his feet against a gate, and the watchman sat opposite fast asleep. Good heavens! Have I lain here dreaming in the street? He said. Yes, to be sure, this, this is East Street, as bright and as well lighted as usual. It is terrible that one glass of punch should have had such an effect on me. Two minutes later, he was comfortably seated in a coach on his way to Christian's Haven. He thought of all the terror and anxiety he had undergone and with a full heart he prized the happy reality of his own time, which, with all of its shortcomings, was so much better than that of which he had lately made trial. Now this was very wise of the counselor. Chapter 3 The Watchman's Adventure Why, here is a pair of galishes, said the watchman. Hmm... They must belong to the lieutenant who lives up there. They are close to the door. The honest man would willingly have rung the bell and handed them in, for there were still lights burning, but he was afraid of disturbing the other people in the house. It must be nice and warm to have those things on, he said. The leather is so soft. He slipped his feet into them. 
How odd things are in this world. Now the lieutenant might be in his comfortable bed, but see if he is. No, he is marching up and down the room. He is a happy man. He has neither wife nor bairns. He goes out to parties every night. Shouldn't I like to be in his place? Then I should be a happy man. As he uttered his wish, the galishes began to have their effect, and the watchman became the lieutenant in body and soul. There he stood upstairs in his room holding a little pink paper between his fingers, upon which was written a poem he had just completed. Who at some point in his life has not been impelled to write poetry? One writes poetry when one is in love, but a wise man does not print it. The words lieutenant, love, and lack of gold form a triplet, or better still, a half of fortune's shattered die. The lieutenant felt this also, and so, as he leant against the window, he said with a sigh, Ah, the poor watchman out in the street is far happier than I. He does not know privation as I do. He has a home, wife, and children who weep with him in his sorrow, and rejoice with his joy. Oh, I should be happier than I am if I could change places with him. At this moment, the watchman again became the watchman, because it was through the galishes of fortune that he had become the lieutenant. As we see, he felt far less happy, and preferred to be what he really was, so the watchman was again a watchman. That was an ugly dream, said he. But curiously enough, I thought I was the lieutenant up there, and there was no pleasure in it. I missed me old woman, and the little ones. They're always ready to smother me with kisses. Then he sat nodding again. He could not get the dream quite out of his head, for he still had the galishes on. A shooting star darted across the sky. There it goes, he said. There are plenty of them. I should like well enough to see those affairs a bit nearer, especially the moon. It wouldn't slip through my fingers. The student for whom my wife washes says that when we die we fly from one to the other of them. It's a lie, of course, but it wouldn't be bad. If I could have a little trip up there, I'd be willing to leave my body behind. Now there are certain things in this world we should be aware of expressing, especially if we have fortune's galishes on our feet. Just listen to the watchman's adventure. Few among us are not acquainted with the rapidity of steam traveling either on land by railway or at sea by boat, but these flights are only like the wanderings of a sloth, or the march of a snail, compared with the velocity of light. Light travels nineteen million times faster than the best racehorse, but it is again outstripped by electricity. Death is an electric shock which touches the heart. The soul when freed is born on the wings of electricity. The sunlight takes eight minutes and some seconds to perform a journey of over 20 million miles, but the soul performs the same distance in an infinitely shorter space of time. The space between the heavenly bodies is, for it, not greater than would be to us the distance between our friends' houses in a town, even if these were rather close together. In the meantime, this electric shock entirely deprives us of the use of our bodies. Unless, like the watchman, we are wearing the galishes of fortune. In a few seconds, the watchman had traversed the 52,000 miles to the moon, which is, as we know, made of a much softer material than our earth. It is more like new fallen snow. He found himself on one of the numerous mountains which we all know from Dr. Madlier's large map of the moon. The interior of the mountain was like a large cauldron, a whole Danish mile in depth. At the bottom of this cauldron lay a town, of whose appearance an idea may be formed by putting the white of an egg into a glass of water, the substance of which was made being quite soft. 
while similar towers with copulas and hanging balconies, all perfectly transparent, hovered in the thin clear air. Our earth floated above his head like a great blood-red ball. Crowds of beings, all no doubt what we should call persons, moved about, but their appearance was very different from ours. They also had a language which nobody could expect the soul of the watchman to understand. This, however, it did. The soul of the watchman understood the language of the moon dwellers perfectly well. They were disputing about our earth, and doubting whether it could be inhabited. The air, they thought, must be too thick for any sensible moon being to live on it. Most of them were of the opinion that the moon alone was inhabited. It was the original globe in which the old world people lived. Now we must return to E Street to see what has become of our watchman's body. Lifeless on the steps it lay. The morning star had fallen out of its hand, and the eyes looked up towards the moon, where its honest companion the soul was wandering. What o'clock is it, watchman? asked a passerby. But the watchman did not answer, so the inquirer gently tapped him on the nose, and away went his balance. The body fell down the full length, for the watchman was dead, you know. A great fright had come over the man who had pushed him. The watchman was dead, and dead he remained. The death was notified, and at dawn the body was taken to the hospital. It might be a rare joke for a soul when it came back, if, as in all probability, it went to East Street to look for the body, and failed to find it there. Probably it would first go to the police station, then to the lost property office to advise for it, among other things, lost or stolen. And last of all, it might go to the hospital. However, it may console us to know that the soul is wisest when left to itself. It is the body which makes it stupid. As we said before, the watchman's body went to the hospital, where it was first taken into the bathroom, and the galoshes were, of course, taken off. Then the soul had to come back again. It immediately took possession of the body, and the man came to life at once. He declared it had been the most terrible night of his life, and not for a shilling would he go through it again. However, all was over now. He was discharged the same day, but the galoshes were left at the hospital. Chapter 4 A Critical Moment An Evening's Dramatic Reading a most unusual journey. Everyone in Copenhagen knows what the Frederick's Hospital looks like, but, as probably some strangers may read this tale, we must give a short description of it. The hospital is separated from the street by a rather high railing, of which the thick iron bars are just so far apart that a thin student, so the story goes, could squeeze through them and so pays little visits to the outside world. The part of the body most difficult to squeeze through was the head. In this case, as so often in the world, a small head was the most convenient. This will be a sufficient introduction. One of the young medical students, of whom only a physical sense could it be said that he was thick-headed, happened to be on duty that night. It was pouring with rain. Notwithstanding these two hindrances, he pinned to get out, if only for a quarter of an hour. It was not worth while, he thought, confiding in the porter, if he could slip out through the railings. There lay the galoshes the watchman had forgotten. Little did he think they were fortunes, but they might be useful in such weather so he slipped them on. Now came the question whether he could slip through the railings. He had never tried before. There he stood. How I wish I had my head through, he said, and immediately, although it was far too big, it slipped through quite easily. 
the Galishes understood all about it. Now, to get the body through. Ugh, I am too stout, said he. I thought the head was the greatest difficulty. I shall never get through. Then he tried to draw his head back quickly, but it wouldn't come. He could move his neck about, but that was all he could do. He first felt very angry, and then his spirits sank below zero. The goddesses of fortune had brought him into a terrible position, and unfortunately it never occurred to him to wish himself free again. Instead of wishing, he struggled to free himself, but in vain. The rain poured down. Not a creature was seen in the street. He could not reach the bell by the gate. How was he to get away? He foresaw that he might have to stand there till morning. Then a smith would have to be fetched to file the bars. And it would be a very slow business. All the blue coat boys from the school opposite would be on the move. The people from Nyboder would appear on the scene for the fun of seeing him in the pillory. There would be a much bigger crowd than there was at the meeting for the wrestling championship last year. Ah, oh, he cried, the blood is rushing to my head. I shall go mad. Oh, if I were only free again, I should be all right. Now he should have said this before. No sooner was his wish expressed than it was fulfilled. His head was free. He rushed into the hospital quite distracted by the terror which the Gaulishes of fortune had caused him. We must not suppose that his adventures were over. No, indeed. The worst is to come. The night passed, and the following day. But no one sent for the Gaulishes. In the evening there was to be a performance in the small theater in Kinnick Street. The house was crammed and between the acts a new poem was to be recited. It was called My Aunt's Spectacles. It was the story of a pair of spectacles which enabled the wearer to look into futridity. The poem was excellently recited, and it was received with much applause. Among the audience was the medical student, who seemed entirely to have forgotten his adventure of the previous evening. Again he was wearing the galoshes, as no one had claimed them, and the streets being very muddy, they would do him good service, he thought. He was much taken with the poem, and the idea of it haunted him. He would like such a pair of spectacles well enough for himself. Perhaps, if they were rightly used, one might be able to look straight into people's hearts. And this would be much more interesting, he thought, than to know what would happen next year. Future events must, in due course, be revealed, whereas the secrets of the heart would never be divulged. I can picture to myself the whole row of ladies and gentlemen on the front bench. If one could only look straight into their hearts, what a revelation there would be! A sort of shop would open before me, and how I should use my eyes. In the heart of the lady opposite, for instance, I should expect a whole millinery of establishment. The next one would be quite empty, but it would be none the worse for a thorough cleaning. There would also be shops of a more substantial nature. Ah, yes, he sighed. I know one in which everything is substantial and good, but unfortunately there is already a shopman in it. More is the pity. From many I should hear the words, Be so good as to walk inside. Ah, if only he could walk in, as a nice little thought passes through the heart. This was quite enough for the Galishes. The student shrank up into nothing, and began a journey of the most unusual kind, right through the hearts of the people in the front row. The first heart he entered was that of a lady, but at first he imagined himself to be in an orthopedic hospital, where people go to have their limbs straightened and to be cured of their deformities. He was in a room hung round with plastered casts of misshapen limbs. 
But the difference here was that whereas the hospital casts were taken when the patients were admitted, these in the heart were taken and preserved after the originals had left. They were, in fact, the casts of the bodily and mental deformities of her friends, thus carefully preserved. Quickly, he passed on into the heart of another woman. This one appeared to him as a great sacred church. The white dove of innocence hovered over the altar. How gladly would he have fallen on his knees before it, and worshipped, but he was hurried on into the next heart. Still, however, the notes of the organ echoed in his heart, and he seemed to have become another and better man, and not utterly unworthy to enter the next sanctuary. Here was revealed to him a poor little attic, where lay a sick mother. Poor though it was, God's warm sunshine streamed brightly in. Lovely roses nodded their heads from the little wooden box on the roof, while two birds warbled sweetly of the joys of childhood, and a sick mother called down a blessing on her daughter. Now he crept on the hands and knees through an overcrowded butcher's shop. Flesh, flesh, and nothing but flesh. It was the heart of a rich, respectable man, whose name no doubt will be found in the directory. He next entered the heart of the man's wife. It was an old deserted dovecot. The husband's portrait was used as a weathercock, which was connected with the doors, so that these opened and shut as the man turned about. Thence he passed into a cabinet of mirrors such as we have in the castle of Rosenborg. Only these had the power of magnifying to an extraordinary extent. In the middle of the room, on the floor, like the Grand Lama of Tibet, sat the insignificant ego of a person, astonished with the contemplation of his own greatness. After this he found himself in a narrow needle case, full of sharp needles. This must surely be the heart of some old maid, he thought, but this was not the case. It was the heart of a quite young officer with many medals and orders, and who was considered a man of spirit and refinement. The wretched student passed out of the last heart and into a state of great bewilderment. He could not collect his thoughts at all, but fancied that his vivid imagination had run away with him. Good heavens! he sighed. I must be on the high road to madness. It is so desperately hot here. It makes the blood rush to my head. All at once he remembered the terrible events of the night before how his head had been stuck between the bars of the railing at the hospital. I must have brought it on there, he said. There's nothing like taking things in time. A Turkish bath would be the best thing. I wish I were on the upper shelf there. Accordingly, he found himself on the upper shelf in the sudarium, but he lay there in all his clothes, boots, and galoshes. The drops of hot water trickled onto his face from the ceiling. Hello, he shouted, and rushed down to get a shower bath. The attendant also shouted when he saw a man with all his clothes on in the shower bath. The student collected himself sufficiently to a whisper. It's a wager! The first thing he did when he got home was to put a blister onto his neck and his back to draw out the madness. The next morning his back was raw, and that was all he gained by the galoshes. Chapter 5 The Metamorphosis of the Copying Clerk In the meantime the watchman, whom we have not forgotten, remembered the galoshes he had found, which had gone to the hospital with him. He fetched them away, but as neither the lieutenant nor anyone else in the street would own them, they were left at the police station. They're exactly like my own galoshes, said one of the clerks, as he examined the castaways and measured them with his own. You would have to have a keener eye than a shoemaker to see any difference between them. Mr. Clerk, said an attendant who came in with some papers. The clerk returned to speak to the man, and when he was gone and he returned to his examination of the galoshes, 
he could no longer remember whether the right-hand pair or the left-hand pair were his. Those which are wet must be mine, he thought, but in this he made a mistake, for they were fortunes. Surely the police may make mistakes sometimes, as well as other people. So he put them on, stuffed some papers into his pockets, and took some others under his arm, for they were to be read and revised at home. It happened to be Sunday morning, and a very fine day, so he thought a walk in Fredericksburg Garden would do him good, and out he went. No one could be a quieter or more industrious person than this young man, and right glad are we that he should have this little walk. It could only do him good after so much sitting. At first he walked along not thinking of anything in particular, so the Galishes had no opportunity of exercising their magic power. He met a friend in the avenue, a young poet, who told him that this summer holiday was to begin on the following day. Hello, are you off again? said the clerk. You are a lucky fellow. You can fly off whenever you like. We others are tied by the leg. Ah, but one end of the chain is attached to the breadfruit tree, you must remember, answered the poet. You have no cares about your daily bread, and then you have a pension. Still, you are far better off, said the clerk. You can sit writing poetry. What a pleasure that is. Everybody says pleasant things about you, and you are your own master. I should like you to sit writing all these trivial affairs in an office. The poet shook his head, and the clerk shook his too and neither of them changed their opinions in the least. They then took leave of each other. They're quite queer cattle, these poets, said the clerk. I should like to understand them and their ways, and to become a poet myself. I'm certain I shouldn't write such lackadaisical rhymes as other people. What a lovely spring day this is! A perfect poet's day! The air is so clear, the clouds are so beautiful, and there is such delicious scent from the flowers and shrubs. I have not felt as I do today for years. We already perceive that he has become a poet, though there was no great outward change in him, for it is a foolish idea that poets look different from other people. There may be many far more poetical natures among persons who are not known as poets than in those of the acknowledged poets. The only difference is that the poet has a better memory. He can hold fast to a feeling or an idea till it comes forth clearly embodied in beautiful words, and this the others cannot do. But to pass from a commonplace person into one of originality must always be a great change. And this is what had now befallen the clerk. What fragrant air, he said. This reminds me of Aunt Madeline's violets. Ah, oh, that was when I was a little boy. What an age it is since I thought about her, my good old aunt. She used to live up there, behind the exchange. She always had a few buds or green shoots in the water, however severe winter might be. I used to smell the violets while I put the heated pennies on the frozen window panes to make peepholes. What a view that was! There were the ships frozen up in the canal, deserted by the sailors, one cowing crow being the whole crew in charge. As soon as the fresh spring breezes returned, everything received a new life. Amid the songs and merriments, the ice was sawn up. The ships were tarred and rigged, and then off they went to foreign parts. I have remained here, and always must remain, sitting at the office seeing other people taking their passports to foreign countries. Such is my lot, he said, sighing deeply, but suddenly he stopped. Good heavens, what is the matter with me? I have never felt like this before. It must be the effect of the spring air. It gives me almost as much pain as pleasure. He felt in his pockets for the papers. 
These will give me something else to think about, he said, running his eyes over the first page. Dame Sigbreth, an original tragedy in five acts, he read. Why, what is this? Yet it is in my own handwriting. Did I write this tragedy? The Intrigue on the Ramparts, a comedy. Where on earth did this come from? Somebody must have put it in my pocket. Here is a letter, too. It is from the manager of a theater. The pieces were rejected, and the letter was anything but civil. Hum, 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 said the clerk, sitting down on a bench. His ideas were so fresh and his heart so softened. Mechanically, he plucked a flower growing near. It was a simple little daisy, yet what botanists can only explain to us in several lectures, this little flower teaches us at once. She related the myth of her birth. She told him about the power of the sun, which unfolded her tender leaves and drew forth her fragrance. This made him reflect on the battle of life, which in a like manner rouses the slumbering feelings in our breasts. Light and air both woo the flower. The light is the favored lover, and to him she turns continually. When light disappears, she shuts up her petals and sleeps in the safe guardianship of the air. It is light which makes me so beautiful, said the flower. But it is air which gives light, whispered the poet's voice. Close by stood a boy stirring up the mud in a ditch with a stick. The water splashed up into the green branches above. The clerk thought of the millions of invisible insects hurled up in the drops of water, and to whom such an evolution must have been as terrible as it would be for us to be whirled about the clouds. As these thoughts came into his head, and all the changes which had taken place in him, he smiled. I must be fast asleep and dreaming. But how wonderful it is, how naturally one dreams, knowing all the time that it is but a dream. If only I could remember when I wake all that I have been dreaming. I seem to be wonderfully clear-headed just now. I see everything plainly. But I am sure in the morning, if I have any recollection of my dreams at all, they will be nothing but nonsense. I have tried it before. All the clever and brilliant things one says in hears and dreams are like the gold of underground gnomes, rich and bright when it is given you, but see it by daylight, and you will have nothing but stones and dead leaves. Alas, he said, sighing sadly as he looked at the little birds singing gaily and hopping from branch to branch. They are much better off than I am. Flying is a delightful accomplishment if you are born to it. If I were to change into anything else, it should be into a little lark like that. At once the sleeves and tails of his coat stuck together and became wings. His clothes changed to feathers, and his galoshes to claws. He perceived the change at once and laughed inwardly. Ho oh, ho! Now I am sure I am dreaming, he said. But such a stupid dream as this I have never had before. He flew up among the branches with a song, but there was no poetry in it, for his poet's nature was gone. The galoshes, like everyone who does anything thoroughly, could only do one thing at a time. The clerk wished to be a poet, and he became one. Now he wanted to be a little bird, and a bird he became. But on becoming a bird, he lost his previous characteristics. Ah, this is nice enough, he said. During the day I can sit at the office attending the gravest matters, and at night I can dream that I am flying about like a lark in Fredericksburg Gardens. What a capital farce it would make! Then he flew down onto the grass, twisting and turning his head about among the waving stalks, which, in proportion to his present size, were as tall as the palms of northern Africa. It was but for a few minutes. All at once it grew as dark as night around him. A huge object, 
as it seemed to him, was thrown over him. It was a big cap with which a schoolboy from Nimboder had covered him. A hand crept in and clutched the clerk by the back wings so tightly that he piped, and in his terror he called out quite loud, You impudent young puppy! I am a clerk in the police service! But to the boy it only sounded like peep peep, and he hit him on the beak and walked off with him. In the avenue he met two schoolboys of the upper classes, in rank at least, and learning they were amongst the lowest in the school. They bought the bird for a few pence, and in this way the clerk got back to Copenhagen, where he was taken to a house in Goth Street. It's well that I am only dreaming, said the clerk, or I should be in a fine rage. First I was a poet, now I'm a lark. It was my poetical temperament which made me change into a bird. But it's a miserable business when one falls into the hands of boys. I should like to know what the end of it will be. The boys took him into a very elegantly furnished room, where a stout merry lady received them. But she was by no means pleased at their bringing in a common little field bird, as she called the lark. She would let them keep it for today, she said, and they might put it in the empty cage near the window. Perhaps it would please Polly the parrot, added she, laughing at a big green parrot, which was swinging backwards and forwards in a stately manner in its gorgeous brass cage. It's Polly's birthday, she added, with affected gaiety. So the little field bird must come and congratulate. Polly did not answer a word, but went on swinging. A pretty little canary in the next cage, which had been brought from its own warm fatherland, began singing loudly. Be quiet, screamer, said the lady, throwing a handkerchief over the cage. Peep, peep, it sighed. What a fearful snowstorm. The clerk, or, as the lady called him, the field bird, was put into a little cage close to the canary, and not far from the parrot. The only words the parrot could chatter, and which often came in oddly enough, were, Now let us be men! All its other utterances were just as incomprehensible as the twittering of a canary, except to the clerk, who, being a bird himself, understood his companions perfectly. I used to fly about under the green palms and flowering almonds, sang the canary. I used to fly with my brothers and sisters, among the gorgeous flowers and over the glassy lake, where the plants at the bottom nodded to us. There were lots of bright parrots who used to tell us the funniest stories in the world. They were wild birds, answered the parrot. Oh, they had no education. Oh, now let us be men. Do you remember the pretty girls dancing in the great outspread tent under the flowering trees? Do you remember the luscious fruits and the cooling juice of the wild grapes? Oh, oh yes, said the parrot. But I am far better off here. I have good food, and I am treated with great consideration. I know how clever I am, and I desire nothing more. Oh, now let us be men. You have a poet's soul, as they call it. I have sound accomplishments and wit. You have genius, but no discretion. You give yourself away by bursting out into those piercing notes of yours, and then they smother you. They never presume to cover me up, for I cost them so much. Then I impress them with my beak and confound them with all my wit. Oh, wit, wit, wit. Now let us be men. Oh, my beloved flowerly fatherland sang the canary. I will pipe of your dark green trees, of your little bays where the drooping branches kiss the waters. I will ever sing of the rejoicing of my brilliant brothers and sisters hovering over the cactus plants, wells of the desert, as they are called. Oh, stop that lackadaisical strain, said the parrot. Say something that one can laugh at. 
Laughter is a sign of the highest mental cultivation. Can a dog or horse laugh? No, they can cry. But laughter is only given to mankind. Ah ha ha! laughed the parrot, adding its unusual phrase. Now let us be men! You little grey Danish bird, said the canary. They have made a captive of you. It must be cold in your woods, but still there is freedom in them. Fly away. They have forgotten to fasten your cage, and the window is open at the top. Fly! Fly! The clerk immediately hopped out of his cage. Just at that moment, the half-open door to the next room creaked, and the cat crept stealthily in with its green shining eyes and gave chase. The canary fluttered in its cage. The parrot flapped its wings and shouted, Oh, let us be men! The clerk was terribly frightened and flew off through the window, over the housetops and over the streets. At last he was obliged to take a little rest. There was something familiar about the opposite house. There was an open window and he flew in. It was his own room and he perched upon the table. Let us be men, he said without thinking of what he was saying, only repeating the parrot's phrase mechanically. At the same moment, he became the clerk again. There he was sitting on the table. Good heavens, said he. However did I get here sleeping on the table? And very disturbed dreams I've been having too. Ah, stupid nonsense, the whole story. Chapter 6 the last best gift of the Galishes. Next day, in the early morning, while the clerk was still in bed, someone knocked at the door. It was his neighbor, the divinity student, who lived on the same floor and now walked in. Lend me your Galishes, he said. It's so wet in the garden, but the sun is shining and I want to smoke a pipe. He put on the Galishes and went down into the garden which possessed one apple and one pear tree. Even that was a great treasure in the heart of the town. The student walked up and down the path. It was only six o'clock. A post horn sounded in the street. Oh, to travel, to travel! Surely it is the most delightful thing in the world. It is the great desire of my heart. If I could travel, this restlessness which overcomes me would be quieted. But it must be far away. I should like to see beautiful Switzerland, travel to Italy, and... It was a good thing the Galishes began to have an effect at once, or he would have traveled about too much either for himself or for us. Well, he traveled. He was in the heart of Switzerland, but packed into a diligence with eight other people. He had a headache and a crick in his neck, his legs were swollen from sitting so long, and his boots pinched him. He was half asleep and half awake. He had a letter of credit in his right hand pocket and his passport in the left, and a little leather purse with some Lewis oars sewn up in it in his breast pocket. Every time he dropped off, he dreamed that one or the other of these was lost, and he started up in a feverish haste. The first movement of his hand was a triangle from the right to the left and up to his breast to feel if they were still there. Umbrellas, sticks, and hats swayed about in the net above their heads and considerably impaired the view, which was grand in the extreme. He stole glances at it while his heart sang jubilantly words which we know at least one other poet has sung, but which have not up to this present time been printed. The landscape was stupendous, dark, and solemn. The pine woods looked like mere heather on the high mountains, whose summits were lost in the wraiths of mist. Soon it began to snow, and a piercing wind sprang up. Oh! he shuddered. If only we were on the other side of the Alps. It would be summer, and I should have got some money on my letter of credit. The fear of losing it spoils all my pleasure in Switzerland. Oh, if only I were on the other side. 
and there he was, on the other side, far in the interior of Italy between Florence and Rome. The lake of Thrasmine lay before him like a flaming sheet of gold amongst the dark blue mountains. Here, where Hannibal defeated Flaminus, the vines now entwined in their graceful tendrils, charming half-naked children guarded a flock of coal-black pigs among a group of scented laurels by the wayside. If we could paint this picture so as to do it justice, everyone who saw it would rejoice over beautiful Italy. But neither the student nor any of his companions in the carriage would have said it. Thousands of poisonous flies and gnats swarmed around them, and in vain they attempted to drive them out with myrtle branches. They bit all the same. Not a man in the carriage, but his face was swollen and disfigured from the bites. The poor horses looked like a carrion. The flies settled in masses upon them. They only had a moment's relief when the driver got down and scraped them off. When the sun went down, a sharp wind whistled round, which was anything but pleasant. A beautiful green light rested on the mountains and clouds. You must go and see it thoroughly to appreciate it. It was wonderful. The travelers thought so too, only their stomachs were empty, their limbs weary, and all their thoughts turned towards quarters of the night. But where were these? They looked much more anxiously for an inn than at a beautiful view. Their road ran through an olive wood, just as at a home it might have wound through stunted willows. Here lay the solitary inn. Half a score of crippled beggars were encamped outside, the best of whom looked like Femaine's eldest son, Snarly Yo, and Captain Murat's dog fiend. The others were either blind, or had withered feet and crept on their hands, or contracted arms and fingerless hands. It was indeed misery in rags. Ichilenza, miserabili, they moaned, stretching out their maimed limbs. The hostess herself had bare feet, uncombed hair, and was clad in a dirty dress. The doors were tied up with string. The floors consisted of half-uprooted cobblestones. Bats flew about under the ceiling, and the odor. It would be as well as if we had the supper served in the stable, said one of the travelers. There at least one knows what the air is one braves. The windows were open to let in a little fresh air, but quicker than the air, in came the withered arms and the everlasting wines. Miserably, each lenza. There were many inscriptions on the walls, many of them uncomplimentary to La Bella Italia. The dinner was brought. It consisted of water soup flavored with pepper and rancid oil. The same oil figured in the salad. Stale eggs and roasted coxcombs were the grandest dishes. Even the wine had a disagreeable taste. It was a nauseous mixture. At night, the boxes were piled against the door, and one of the travelers kept watch while the others slept. The student had first watch. Oh, how close it was. The heat was oppressive, the gnats stung, and the miserabili outside whined in their sleep. Traveling would be well, said the traveler. If one had no body, if it could rest in the spirit soar alone. Wherever I go, there is always something wanting which oppresses the heart, something better than the present, and that I must have. Something better, the best of all, but where, and what is it? I know very well what I want. I want to reach a happy goal. The happiest of all, as the words escaped his lips, he found himself back at home. Long white curtains hung before the windows, and a coffin stood in the middle of the floor, and he himself lay in it, in the quiet sleep of death. His wish was fulfilled, his body was at rest, and his spirit free. 
call no man happy before he is in his grave, were Solon's words, which here received a fresh confirmation. Every corpse is an enigma to immortality. Neither could this sphinx before us answer the question which the living man had written down two days before. Strong death, thy very silence wakes our dread. As to the grave our wandering steps are led. Shall now my soul up Jacob's ladder pass? Into death's garden, there but the spring as grass. Our greatest suffering oft the world sees not. O thou, to whom fell sad and lonely lot, Thou knowest that heavier are our woes passed by Than all the earth that on our graves doth lie. Two figures were moving in the room. We know them both. They were sorrow and fortune's handmaid. They bent over the dead man. Seest thou now, said sorrow, what sort of happiness thy gaulish has brought to mankind? They at least brought him who sleeps here, good of a lasting kind, <laughs> answered Joy. Oh no, said Sorrow. He went of his own accord. He was not called away. His spiritual powers were not given strength enough to accomplish the task which had been set him. I will do him a true kindness. Saying which, she took off the galishes. The sleep of death was over, and the dead man rose to life again with renewed strength. Sorrow vanished, taking with her the galishes. She seemed to look upon them as her property. End of section 37 Recording by Timothy Nielsen www dot mr timmy dot com section thirty eight of fairy tales from hans christian anderson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Roger Mathewson, Exeter, England. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Bronze Ball In the town of Florence, not far from the Piazza del Granduca, runs a little cross street. I think it is called Porta Rossa. In front of a kind of market in this street, where green stuff is sold, stands a skilfully worked bronze boar. A stream of fresh, clear water gushes out of its mouth. It has turned dark green from age. Only its snout shines as if it had been polished. And so it has, by the many hundreds of children and poor people who take hold of it with their hands and put their mouths to its mouth to drink the water. It is a picture in itself to see the well-formed animal embraced by a handsome, half-naked boy putting his fresh lips to its snout. Most people who go to Florence find the place. One only has to ask the first beggar one sees about the bronze boar, and he will find it. It was late on a winter evening. The mountains were covered with snow, but it was moonlight, and the moon in Italy gives a light which is as good as that of a dark winter's day in the north. Nay, it is better, for the clear air seems to raise us above the earth, while in the north the cold, grey, leaden clouds press us to the ground, the cold, wet ground, which one day will press upon our coffins. Along in the ducal gardens, under the shelter of the stone pines, where thousands of roses bloom in the winter, a little ragged boy had been sitting all day. A boy who might have stood for typical Italy. He was so handsome, so merry, and yet so suffering. He was hungry and thirsty, but no one gave him a copper, and when it got dark and the gardens were to be closed, the porter drove him away. 
he stood for a long time dreaming on the bridge over the arno looking at the glittering stars reflected in the water beneath the stately marble bridge he took the road to the bronze boar and knelt before it threw his arms round its neck and put his little mouth to its shining snout and drank great draughts of the fresh water close by lay a few salad leaves and some chestnuts and these were his supper there was not a creature in the street he was quite alone he got onto the boar's back leant forward so that his little curly head rested on the animal's head and before he knew what he was about he fell fast asleep it was midnight the bronze boar moved he heard it say quite plainly hold tight for i'm going to run off you little boy and then off it ran with him what an odd ride that was first they came to the piazza del granduca and the bronze horse which carried the duke's statue neighed aloud the many-coloured coats of arms on the old town hall shone like transparent pictures and michael angelo's david slung his sling it was a curious mixture of life the bronze groups of perseus and of the rape of the sabines were only too much alive a death shriek from them resounded through the stately solitary piazza the bronze boar stopped by the uffizi palace under the colonnade where the nobles assembled during lent for the carnival hold tight said the animal hold tight for now i am going up the stairs the little fellow had not yet said a word he was half frightened half delighted they stepped into a long gallery and he knew it well he had been there before the walls were crowded with pictures and the statues and busts were all in as bright a light as if it were day but the most splendid of all was when the door to one of the adjoining rooms was opened the little boy remembered the splendours here but to-night everything was positively magnificent here stood the statue of a woman as beautiful as only the costliest marble and the master hand of the sculptor could make her she moved her lovely limbs dolphins sprang at her feet and immortality shone from her eyes she is known to the world as the venus de medici marble statues of splendid men were grouped around her one of them was wetting his sword he is called the grinder the next group was the wrestling gladiators the sword was whetted and the giants struggled for the goddess of beauty the boy was dazzled by the glitter the walls were radiant with colour and everything there was full of life and movement the picture of venus earthly venus with her rounded limbs and glowing with life as titian saw her shone out in redoubled splendour near her the portraits of two beautiful women stretched upon soft cushions with heaving bosoms and luxuriant locks falling over their rounded shoulders while their dark eyes betrayed their burning thoughts but none of all these pictures ventured quite out of their frames the goddess of beauty herself the gladiators and the grinder remained in their places subdued by the halo round the madonna with the infant jesus and st john the sacred pictures were no longer pictures they were the saints themselves what brilliance and what beauty as they passed from gallery to gallery the little boy saw them all the bronze boar went slowly through all the glories one sight crowded out the previous one one picture only really took hold of his thoughts and that was chiefly because of the happy children in it once by daylight the little boy had nodded to them many probably passed this picture lightly and yet it contains a treasury of poetry it is a christ descending to the nether regions but he is not surrounded by souls in torment no these are the heathen the picture is by the florentine angiolio bronzino most beautiful is the expression of the children's faces in their certainty that they are going to heaven two little creatures are already bracing each other 
one little one stretches out a hand to a companion below pointing to himself as much as to say i am going to heaven all the older people stand round doubting or hoping or bending humbly before the saviour the boy looked longer at this picture than at any of the others the bronze boar stood still before it a gentle sigh was heard did it come from the picture or from the animal's breast the boy held out his hand towards the smiling children then the animal tore off with him tore away through the open gallery thank you thank you you beautiful animal said the little boy patting the boar which went bump bump down the stairs with him thank you said the bronze boar i have helped you and you have helped me because i only get strength to run when i have an innocent child on my back nay i dare even step under the rays of the lamp before the madonna i can carry you anywhere except into a church but when you are with me i can stand outside and look in at the open door don't get down off my back if you do i shall be dead just as you see me in the daytime at the porta rossa i will stay with you my beloved creature said the little boy and then they rushed at a furious pace through the streets of florence to the piazza before the church of santa croce the folding doors flew open and the lights on the altar streamed through the church and out into the solitary piazza there was a wonderful blaze of light from a sculptured tomb in the left aisle thousands of twinkling stars formed a kind of halo round it the tomb was surmounted by a coat of arms a red ladder gleaming like a flame of fire on a blue field it was the grave of galileo it is a simple monument the red ladder may be emblematic of art signifying that the way to fame is always upwards on a flaming ladder all genius soars to heaven like elias of old in the right aisle of the church every statue on the costly sarcophagi seemed endowed with life here stood michelangelo there dante with a wreath of laurel round his brows alfieri machiavelli these great men rest side by side the pride of italy it is a very beautiful church far more beautiful if not so large as the marble cathedral of florence the marble garments appeared to move as if their great wearers once again raised their heads and looked towards the glowing altar with its many lights where the white-robed boys swung their golden censers amid song and music while the fragrance of the incense filled the church and streamed out into the piazza the boy stretched out his hands towards the light but at the same moment the bronze boar rushed on again and he had to clutch it tightly the wind whistled in his ears he heard the church doors creak on their hinges as they were shut he seemed to lose consciousness and felt a rush of icy air and then he opened his eyes it was morning he had half slipped off the bronze boar which stood in its usual place at the porta rossa fear and trembling seized the lad as he thought of the woman he called his mother she had sent him out yesterday to get money and he had got none he was hungry and thirsty and again he flung his arms round the boar's neck kissed its snout nodded to it and walked off to one of the narrowest streets only wide enough for a well-laden ass a big iron-studded door stood half open he went in there and up some stone steps by a dirty wall with a greasy rope for a handrail till he reached an open gallery hung with rags a flight of steps led into a courtyard where there was a fountain the water was drawn up from the fountain to the different floors by means of a thick iron wire where the buckets hung side by side sometimes the pulley jerked the buckets and splashed the water all over the court another broken-down staircase led still higher up and two russian sailors running down almost upset the boy they were coming in from their nightly carousals a strongly built woman no longer young with thick black hair followed them 
what have you brought home she asked the boy don't be angry he pleaded taking hold of her dress as if to kiss it i've got nothing nothing at all they passed on into a little room i need not describe it but only say that in it stood an earthen pot with handles for holding fire called a marito she hung this on her arm warmed her fingers and pushed the boy with her elbow you must have got some money she said the boy began to cry and then she kicked him making him cry out loud will you be quiet or i'll break your screaming head and she swung the pot at him the boy ducked his head and shrieked then a neighbour came in and she also had a marito on her arm what are you doing to the child felicita she said oh, the child is my own answered felicita and i can murder him if i like and you too giannina and then she swung the fire pot again the other woman raised hers to parry it and the two pots clashed together smashing them to atoms and scattering fire and ash all over the room the boy seized the opportunity to escape he rushed across the courtyard and out of the gate the poor child ran till he had no breath left at last he stopped by the church of santa croce whose great doors had opened to him last night he went in everything here was bright he knelt down by the first tomb it was michelangelo's and very soon he sobbed as if his heart would break people came and went mass was celebrated nobody took any notice of him but an old citizen who stopped and looked at him for a moment and then passed on like the rest the poor child was quite overpowered by hunger and thirst he became faint and ill after a time he crept into a corner behind the monuments and fell asleep towards evening he was awakened by someone shaking him he started up and saw the same old citizen standing before him are you ill where is your home have you been here all day were some of the questions asked by the old man after hearing what he had to say the old man took him with him to a little house in a side street near it was a glove maker's and a woman was sitting busily at work when they entered a little white poodle so closely clipped that the pink skin shone through jumped upon the table and sprang towards the little boy the innocents soon make friends with each other said the woman patting both the dog and the boy the good people fed him and said he should stay the night and next day old father giuseppe would go and speak to his mother he only had a homely little bed but it was regal to him who so often slept upon the hard stones and he slept sweetly and dreamt about the pictures and the bronze boar father giuseppe went out early next morning and the poor boy was not glad to see him go for he knew that he had gone to his mother and that he might have to go back he cried at the thought and kissed the lively little dog the woman nodded to them both what did father giuseppe say when he came back he talked to his wife for a long time and she nodded and patted the boy he's a beautiful child she said what a clever glove-maker he will be just like you see what fingers he has they are so delicate and flexible madonna intended him to be a glove-maker so the little boy stayed in the house and the woman taught him to sew he had plenty to eat and got plenty of sleep he grew quite merry and at last began to tease bellissima as the little dog was called this made the woman angry she scolded him and shook her finger at him so he went sadly to his own room it faced the street and the skins were hung up in it to dry there were thick iron bars across the windows and that night he could not sleep his head was full of the bronze boar suddenly he heard scramble scramble outside could it be the boar he rushed to the window but there was nothing to be seen help the signor to carry his box of colours said his mistress in the morning as their neighbour a young artist came down carrying his colour box as well as a huge roll of canvas the child took the box and followed the painter 
they took the road to the picture gallery and mounted the same stairs which he remembered so well from the night when he rode the bronze boar he remembered all the statues and the pictures the beautiful marble venus and the painted ones too again he looked at the madonna with the infant jesus and st john they stopped before the picture of bronzino where christ is represented as standing in the underworld with the children smiling around him in their certainty of entering heaven the poor boy smiled too for he was in his heaven now you may go home said the painter to him when he had put up his easel might i stay to see the signor paint said the boy might i see you put the picture on this canvas i'm not painting yet said the artist taking out a piece of charcoal his hand moved quickly and his eye rapidly took the measures of the great picture though he only made a few light strokes there stood the figure of the saviour as in the painting why don't you go said the painter and then the boy wandered dreamily home again sat down on the table and learnt to make gloves his thoughts were all day in the gallery and therefore he was clumsy and pricked his fingers but he did not tease bellissima in the evening when he found the house door open he crept out it was cold bright starlight and very clear he wandered away through the quiet streets and soon he found himself before the bronze boar he bent over it kissed its shining snout and then seated himself upon its back you beloved creature he said how i have been longing for you we must have another ride to-night but the boar remained motionless the little boy still sat astride of it when he felt something pull his clothes he looked down and saw the little naked clept bellissima the little dog had followed him without having been noticed by any one bellissima barked as much as to say do you see i am here what are you sitting up there for a fiery dragon could not have frightened the boy more than the little dog at that place bellissima in the street and not dressed as the old lady called it what would be the end of it the dog never went out in the winter without a little sheepskin coat which had been made for it it was fastened round the neck and body with a red ribbon and decorated with little red bows and jingling bells it looked almost like a little kid when it went out in the winter tripping after its mistress and now here was bellissima in the cold without her coat what would be the consequences all his fancies were quickly put to flight yet he stopped to kiss the boar before getting down and then he took the shivering little dog in his arms oh how cold she was the boy ran off with her as fast as he could what are you running off there with shouted two policemen he met and bellissima barked where did you steal that pretty dog they asked and took it away from him oh give it back to me cried the boy if you didn't steal it you can tell them at home that it be fetched from the police station and off they walked with bellissima this was a terrible business he did not know whether he had better jump in the river or go home and confess everything they would certainly kill him he thought but i would gladly be killed then i should go to heaven so he hurried home almost hoping to be killed the door was fastened and he could not reach the knocker there was no one in the street so he took a stone and hammered at the door with it who's there said someone inside it is i he said bellissima is lost let me in and kill me and then indeed there was an uproar his mistress was so very fond of bellissima she looked at the wall where his coat ought to hang and there it was in its proper place bellissima at the police station she cried you bad child why did you take him out he will die of cold that delicate little animal among all those rough men father giuseppe had to go off at once his wife scolded and the boy cried everybody in the house came to see what was the matter among them the painter he took the boy on his knee and questioned him bit by bit he got out the whole story about the bronze boar and the picture gallery 
it was rather difficult to understand but the painter comforted the child and talked over the woman and she would not be happy till giuseppe came back with bellissima who had been in the hands of the police and then there was great rejoicing and the painter patted the boy on the head and gave him a few pictures oh what splendid pictures they were comical heads and above all the bronze boar himself oh nothing could be more delightful it was sketched in a few strokes and even the house behind it appeared too oh if only one could draw and paint one would have the whole world before one next day in his first quiet moment the little fellow got a pencil and tried to copy the drawing of the bronze boar and he succeeded too it was a little crooked a little on one side one leg thick and another leg thin but it was like the copy and he was delighted only the pencil would not go as straight as he meant it to go the next day another boar stood beside the first one and this one was a hundred times better the third one was so good that any one could see what it was meant for but the glove-making went on badly he did the errands very slowly he had learnt from the bronze boar that any picture might be put on paper and the town of florence is a complete picture-book if only you turn over the leaves on the piazza della trinita stands a slender column and upon it stands justice blindfolded with the scales in her hand she was also soon put upon paper by the glove-maker's little apprentice his collection grew but as yet they were only copies of inanimate objects when one day bellissima came hopping towards him stand still he said i will make a beautiful portrait of you to put among my pictures but she would not stand still so he had to tie her up he tied her by the head and tail she did not like it and barked and jumped about and strained at the cord just then her mistress came in you wicked boy the poor animal was all she had time to say she pushed the boy aside kicked him and called him an ungrateful good-for-nothing wicked boy she almost smothered bellissimo with her kisses and tears at this moment the painter came up the stairs and this is the turning point of the story in eighteen thirty four there was an exhibition in the academy of arts at florence two pictures hung side by side attracted much attention from the spectators in the smaller of the two a merry little boy sat at a table drawing his model was a closely clipped little white poodle as the animal would not stand it was tied up by the head and tail with string the whole picture was so full of life and truth to nature that it could not fail to interest all who looked at it the story went that the painter was a young florentine who had been found in the streets and brought up by an old glove-maker and that he had taught himself to draw a now celebrated artist discovered his talent at a time when he was about to be turned out of the glove-maker's house for having tied up his mistress's favourite the little poodle when he wanted a model the glove-maker's apprentice had become a great painter as the picture plainly proved the larger picture was an even greater proof of his talent there was only a single figure in it that of a handsome ragged boy fast asleep leaning against the bronze boar of the via porta rossa all the spectators knew the spot well the child's arm rested on the boar's head and he slept sweetly the lamp in front of the madonna was a beautiful picture a handsome gilt frame surrounded it and a wreath of laurel was hung on one corner but a black ribbon was entwined among the leaves and long black streamers hung down from it the young painter was just dead end of section 38 recording by roger mathewson exeter england
Section 39 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Bell. In the evening at sunset, when glimpses of golden clouds could just be seen among the chimney pots a curious sound would be heard first by one person then by another it was like a church bell but it only lasted a moment because of the rumble of vehicles and the street cries there is the evening bell people would say the sun is setting those who went outside the town where the houses were more scattered each with its garden or little meadow saw the evening star and heard the tones of the bell much better it seemed as if the sound came from a church buried in silent fragrant woods and people looked in that direction feeling quite solemn time passed and still people said one to the other can there be a church in the woods that bell has such a wonderfully sweet sound shall we go and look at it closer the rich people drove and the poor ones walked but it was a very long way when they reached a group of willows which grew on the outskirts of the wood they sat down and looked up among the long branches thinking that they were really in the heart of the forest a confectioner from the town came out and pitched a tent there and then another confectioner and he hung a bell up over his tent this bell was tarred so as to stand the rain and the clapper was wanting when people went home again they said it had been so romantic and that meant something beyond mere tea three persons protested that they had penetrated right through the forest to the other side and that they had heard the same curious bell all the time but that then it sounded as if it came from the town one of them wrote a poem about it and said that it sounded like a mother's voice to a beloved child no melody could be sweeter than the chimes of this bell the emperor's attention was also drawn to it and he promised that any one who really discovered where the sound came from should receive the title of the world's bell ringer even if there were no bell at all a great many people went to the woods for the sake of earning an honest penny but only one of them brought home any kind of explanation no one had been far enough not even he himself but he said that the sound of the bell came from a very big owl in a hollow tree it was a wise owl which perpetually beat its head against a tree but whether the sound came from its head or from the hollow tree he could not say with any certainty all the same he was appointed world's bell ringer and every year he wrote a little treatise on the owl but nobody was much the wiser for it now on a certain confirmation day the priest had preached a very moving sermon all the young people about to be confirmed had been much touched by it it was a very important day for them they were leaving childhood behind and becoming grown-up persons the child's soul was as it were to be transformed into that of a responsible being it was a beautiful sunny day and after the confirmation the young people walked out of the town and they heard the sound of the unknown bell more than usually loud coming from the wood on hearing it they all felt anxious to go further and see it all except three the first of these had to go home to try on her ball dress it was this very dress and this very ball which were the reason of her having been confirmed this time otherwise it would have been put off the second was a poor boy who had borrowed his tail-coat and boots of the landlord's son and he had to return them at the appointed time the third said that he had never been anywhere without his parents that he had always been a good child and he meant to continue so although he was confirmed nobody ought to have made fun of this resolve but he did not escape being laughed at so these three did not go the others trudged off the sun shone and the birds sang and the newly confirmed young people took each other by the hand and sang with them they had not yet received any position in life they were all equal in the eye of the lord on the day of their confirmation soon two of the smallest ones got tired and they returned to town two little girls sat down and made wreaths so they did not go either 
when the others reached the willows where the confectioners had their tents they said now then here we are the bell doesn't exist it is only something people imagine just then the bell was heard in the wood with its deep rich notes and four or five of them decided after all to penetrate further into the wood the underwood was so thick and close that it was quite difficult to advance the woodruff grew almost too high convolvulus and brambles hung in long garlands from tree to tree where the nightingales sang and the sunbeams played it was deliciously peaceful but there was no path for the girls their clothes would have been torn to shreds there were great boulders overgrown with many-coloured mosses and fresh springs trickled among them with a curious little gurgling sound surely that cannot be the bell said one of the young people as he lay down to listen this must be thoroughly looked into so he stayed behind and let the others go on they came to a little hut made of bark and branches overhung by a crab-apple as if it wanted to shake all its bloom over the roof which was covered with roses the long sprays clustered round the gable and on it hung a little bell could this be the one they sought yes they were all agreed that it must be except one he said it was far too small and delicate to be heard so far away as they had heard it and that the tones which moved all hearts were quite different from these he who spoke was a king's son and so the other said that kind of fellow must always be wiser than any one else so they let him go on alone and as he went he was more and more overcome by the solitude of the wood but he still heard the little bell with which the others were so pleased and now and then when the wind came from the direction of the confectioners he could hear demands for tea but the deep-toned bell sounded above them all and it seemed as if there was an organ playing with it and the sounds came from the left where the heart is placed there was a rustling among the bushes and a little boy stood before the king's son he had wooden shoes on and such a small jacket that the sleeves did not cover his wrists they knew each other for he was the boy who had had to go back to return the coat and the boots to the landlord's son he had done this changed back into his shabby clothes and wooden shoes and then drawn by the deep notes of the bell had returned to the wood again then we can go together said the king's son but the poor boy in the wooden shoes was too bashful he pulled down his short sleeves and said he was afraid he could not walk quickly enough besides which he thought the bell ought to be looked for on the right because that side looked the most beautiful then we shan't meet at all said the king's son nodding to the poor boy who went into the thickest and darkest part of the wood where the thorns tore his shabby clothes and scratched his face hands and feet till they bled the king's son got some good scratches too but he at least had the sun shining upon his path we are going to follow him for he is a bright fellow i must and will find the bell said he if i have to go to the end of the world some horrid monkeys sat up in the trees grinning and showing their teeth shall we pelt him said they shall we thrash him he is a king's son but he went confidently on further and further into the wood where the most extraordinary flowers grew there were white star-like lilies with blood-red stamens pale blue tulips which glistened in the sun and apple trees on which the apples looked like great shining soap bubbles you may fancy how these trees glittered in the sun round about were beautiful green meadows where stags and hinds gambled under the spreading oaks and beeches mosses and creepers grew in the fissures where the bark of the trees was broken away there were also great glades with quiet lakes where white swans swam about flapping their wings the king's son often stopped and listened for he sometimes fancied that the bell sounded from one of these lakes but then again he felt sure that it was not there but further in the wood now the sun began to go down and the clouds were fiery red a great stillness came over the wood and he sank upon his knees sang his evening psalm and said never shall i find what i seek now the sun is going down the night is coming on the dark night perhaps i could catch one more glimpse of the round red sun before it sinks beneath the earth 
i will climb up on to those rocks they are as high as the trees he seized the roots and creepers and climbed up the slippery stones where the water snakes wriggled and the toads seemed to croak at him but he reached the top before the sun disappeared seen from this height oh what splendor lay before him the ocean the wide beautiful ocean its long waves rolling towards the shore the sun still stood like a great shining altar out there where sea and sky met everything melted away into glowing colors the wood sang the ocean sang and his heart sang with them all nature was like a vast holy temple where trees and floating clouds were as pillars flowers and grass the woven tapestry and the heaven itself a great dome the red colors vanished as the sun went down but millions of stars popped out they were like countless diamond lamps and the king's son spread out his arms toward heaven sea and forest at that moment from the right-hand path came the poor boy with the short sleeves and wooden shoes he had reached the same goal just as soon by his own road they ran towards each other and clasped each other's hands in that great temple of nature and poetry and above them sounded the invisible holy bell happy spirits floated round it to the strains of a joyous hallelujah end of section thirty nine section forty of fairy tales from hans christian andersen this is a library vox recording all library vox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by timothy nielsen www.mistatimay.com fairy tales from hans christian andersen translated by mrs edgar lucas ole lukage the dust man there is nobody in all the world who can tell so many stories as ole lukage and such stories as he can tell when night is drawing on and the children are sitting round the table as good as possible or on their little footstools in walks ole shut eyes he comes so quietly up the stairs without his shoes and opens the door so softly that nobody hears him and puff he sends a shower of milk into their eyes in such fine spray as to be invisible but they can't keep their eyes open after it and so they never see him he steals behind them and breathes upon their necks making their heads as heavy as lead but he never hurts them he does it all from kindness to the children he only wants them to be quiet, and the best way to make them quiet is to have them in bed. When they are settled there, he can tell them his stories. Then, as soon as the children are asleep, Ole Lukic seats himself upon their beds. He is well dressed. His clothes are of silk, but it is impossible to say what color they are, for it shimmers green, red, and blue every time he turns. He has an umbrella under his arm, one with pictures on it, and this he holds over the good children, and then they dream the most delightful stories all night long. The other umbrella has no pictures on it, and he holds this one over the children who have been naughty, and then they sleep heavily until the morning and have no dreams at all. I am now going to tell you about a little boy to whom Ole Lukage went every night for a whole week. His name was Halmar. There are just seven stories, because there are seven days in a week. Monday Now just listen, said Ole Lukage in the evening, when he had got Halmar to bed. First I will smarten things up a bit. And then all the plants in the pots became big trees, their branches stretching right up to the ceiling and along the walls, so that the room looked like a delightful arbor. The branches were covered with flowers, 
and the flowers were more beautiful than the roses. They had the most delightful scent, and if you tried to eat them, were more delicious than the very nicest jam. The fruit shone like gold, and then there were the buns bursting with the plums. They were splendid. All at once the most miserable grumbles came from the table drawer where Hallmore's school books were kept. What is that now? said Ole Lukage, going along and opening the drawer. It was the slate groaning and writhing because there was a wrong figure in the sum set on it, and it was ready to fall to pieces. The pencil was hopping and skipping at the end of its piece of string, just as if it had been a little dog which would like to try and do the sum, but it couldn't. Then there was Hallmore's copying book clamoring away inside its covers most pitifully. There was a roll of capital letters down each side of every leaf, each with a little one beside it. Then beside them letters which imagined they looked like them, but these were written by Hallmar. They looked almost as if they had tumbled over the line on which they had ought to be standing upright. See, this is how you ought to hold yourselves, said the headlines. So, to one side with brisk flourish. Oh, we should like nothing better, said Homer's letters, but we can't. We are so crooked. Then you shall have a dose of medicine, said Ole Lukage. Oh, no, they cried, and then they stood up as stiffly as possible. Well, now we can't tell any stories, said Ole Lukage. I must drill them. One, two. One, two. And then he drilled the letters, and they stood up stiffer than any headlines could stand. But when Ole Lukage went away, and Hallmar woke up in the morning, they were as crooked as ever. Tuesday As soon as Hallmar was in bed, Ole Lukage touched all the furniture in the room with his little wooden wand, and everything began to talk. They all talked about themselves, except the spittoon, which was silent and much annoyed that they were all so vain as only to talk about themselves, and to pay no attention to him, standing so modestly in the corner and allowing himself to be spat upon. There was a big picture in the gilt frame hanging over a chest of drawers. It was a landscape in which one saw tall old trees, flowers growing in the grass, and a great piece of water with a river flowing from it round behind a wood, past many castles and away to the open sea. Ole Lukage touched the picture with his wand, and the birds in it began to sing. The branches of the trees moved, and the clouds scuttled along, and you could see their shadows passing over the landscape. Now Ole Lukage lifted little Hamar up close to the frame, and Hallmar put his leg right into the picture among the long grass, and there he stood. The sun shone down upon him through the branches of the trees. He ran to the water and got into a little boat which lay there. It was painted red and white, and the sails shone like silver. Six swans, all with golden crowns round their necks, and a shining blue star upon their heads drew the boat past the dark green woods, where the trees told stories about robbers and witches, and the flowers told other stories about the pretty little elves, and all that the butterflies had told them. Beautiful fish with gold and silver scales swam after the boat. Every now and then they sprang out of the water, and back again with a splash. Red and blue birds, large and small, flew in two lines behind them. The gnats buzzed, and the cockchafers boomed. They all wanted to go with Hallmar, and each of them had a story to tell. That was a sailing trip indeed, 
Now the woods were thick and dark. Now they were like beautiful gardens full of sunshine and flowers. Among them were castles of glass and marble. Princesses stood upon the balconies, and they were all the little girls whom Hallmar knew and used to play with. They stretched out their hands, each one holding the most beautiful sugar pig which any cake woman could sell. Hallmar took a hold of one end of the pig as they sailed by, and the princess held tight to the other, and each had a share, she the smaller and Hallmar the bigger. Little princes stood sentry by each castle. They saluted with golden swords and showered down sugar plums and tin soldiers. They were princes indeed. Now he sailed through a wood, now through great halls, or right through a town. He passed through the one where his nurse lived, she who used to carry him about when he was quite a little boy, and who was so fond of him. She nodded and waved her hand to him, and sang a pretty little song which she had written herself and sent to Hallmar. I dream of thee for many an hour, Hallmar my own, my sweeting. My kisses once fell like a shower, thy brow and red cheeks greeting. My near thy first formed word addressed, thy last must be in parting. May you on earth by heaven be blessed, angel from heavenward darting. All the birds sang too, the flowers danced upon their stalks, and the old trees nodded, just as if Ole Lukic were telling them stories. Wednesday How the rain was pouring down outside. Hallmar could even hear it in his sleep, and when Ole Lukic opened the window, the water stood right up to the sill. It was a regular lake, and a beautiful ship lay close to the house. Will you sail with me, little Hamar? said Ole Lukage. If you will, you can go to the distant countries tonight, and be back here again in the morning. Then all at once, Hamar found himself in his best Sunday clothes on board a beautiful ship, it was heavenly weather, and they sailed through the streets, past the church, till they reached a wild open sea. They sailed so far that there was no more land to be seen. They saw a flock of storks leaving home on their way to warmer countries, flying in a line, one behind the other. They had already flown a long, long way. One of them was so tired that his wings could hardly carry him any further. He was the last one in the row, and soon he was a long way behind. At last he sank, with outspread wings, lower and lower. He flapped his wings feebly for a few strokes, but it was no use. Now he touched the rigging of the ship with his feet and slid down the sail with a flop onto the deck. Then the cabin boy picked him up and put him into the hen house, with the chickens, the ducks, and the turkeys. The poor stork stood among them looking quite depressed. What a creature, said all the hens. The turkey cock puffed himself up as big as he could, and asked who he was and the ducks waddled backwards, pushing against each other, saying, Quack, quack! Then the stork told them about the sunny Africa, and the pyramids, and the ostrich running across the deserts like a wild horse. But the ducks did not understand him, and they pushed each other and said, Are we agreed he is an idiot? Mm, yes, idiot he is indeed, said the turkey cock with a gobble. Then the stork became quite silent, thought about his beloved Africa. Nice thin legs you've got there, said the turkey cock. How much a yard? Quack, 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 grinned all the ducks. But the stork appeared not to hear them. You're quite at liberty to laugh too, 
said the turkey cock to him. It was a very witty remark. Or perhaps it was too low for you. He's not many-sided, he said to the others. It's good enough to amuse us. Then all the hens clucked and the ducks quacked. It was tremendous amusement they got out of it. But Halmar went along to the hen house, opened the door, and called the stork, and it hopped out onto the deck to him. It was rested now, and it seemed to nod to Halmar to thank him. Thereupon it spread its wings and flew away to the warm countries. But the hens clucked, the ducks quacked, and the turkey cock's head got as red as fire. Tomorrow will make you into soup, said Hamar. Then he woke up and found himself lying in his own little bed. That was an extraordinary journey old Lukage had taken him. Thursday I'll tell you what, said Ole Lukage. Don't be frightened, and I will show you a little mouse and he stretched out his hand with the tiny little animal in it. It has come to invite you to a wedding. There are two little mice who intend to enter a wedded state tonight. They live under the floor of your mother's larder, which they say is the most delightful residence. But how can I get through a little mouse hole in the floor? said Hallmar. Leave that to me said Ole Lukage. I'll soon make you small enough. Then he touched Hallmar with his wand, and he quickly grew smaller and smaller. At last he was not as tall as one's finger. Now, you may borrow a tin soldier's clothes. I think they'll just fit you, and it looks so smart to have on a uniform when one's in company. Yes, indeed! said Hallmar, and in a moment he was dressed like the grandest tin soldier. Be so good as to take a seat in your mother's thimble, said the little mouse, and I shall have the honor of drawing you. Heavens, are you going to take that trouble yourself, young lady, said Hallmar, and off they drove to the mouse's wedding. First they went down under the floor into a long passage, which was just high enough for them to drive through, and the whole passage was lighted up with the touchwood. Isn't there a delicious smell here? said the mouse, who was drawing him. The whole passage has been smeared over with bacon fat. Nothing could be nicer. Then they came to the bridal hall where all the little lady mice stood on the right whispering and giggling, as if they were making fun of each other, and on the left stood all the gentlemen mice, stroking their whiskers with their paws. The bridal pair stood in the middle of the room, in a hollow rind of cheese, kissing each other most energetically before all of the people. But then they were engaged, you know, and just about to be married. More and more visitors poured in. The mice were almost crushing each other to death, and the bridal pair had taken their place in the doorway, so that one could neither get in nor out. The whole room, like the passage, was smeared with bacon fat. There were no other refreshments, but for dessert a pea was produced, in which one of the little mice of the family had bitten the name of the bridal pair that is to say, the first letter of it, and this was something quite extraordinary. All the mice said it was a delightful wedding, and the conversation was most entertaining. And then Hallmar drove home again. He had been in very grand company, but in order to get there he had been obliged to shrink wonderfully, to make himself small enough to get into the uniform of a tin soldier. Friday. It is astounding what a number of grown-up people would like to get a hold of me, said Ole Lukage, especially those with a bad conscience. Good little Ole, they say to me, 
we can't close our eyes. And there we lie all night with all our bad deeds, staring us in the face. They are like naughty elfins. They come and sit on our beds and squirt hot water over us. Won't you come and chase them away so that we may have a good sleep? And then they sigh deeply. We will gladly pay you, Ole. Good night. You will find the money on the window sill. But I don't do it for money, said Ole Lukage. What are we going to do tonight? asked Hallmar. Well, I don't know whether you would like to go to a wedding again tonight. It's a different kind from yesterday's. Your sister's big doll, the one that looks like a man, and is called Herman, he is to be married to Bertha. Besides which, it is her birthday, so there will be no end of presents. Oh, I know all about that. Whenever the dolls want new clothes, my sister lets them have a birthday or a wedding. It has happened hundreds of times. Yes, but tonight it is the hundred and first wedding, and the hundred and first is the end of all things, so that's why this one will be so grand. Just look. Hamar looked along at the table. There was a little pasteboard house with lights in the windows, and all the tin soldiers presenting arms outside. The bridal pair sat upon the floor leaning against the leg of the table. They were very thoughtful, and they had reason to be. Ole Lukage, dressed in a grandmother's black skirt, married them. When the ceremony was over, all the furniture in the room joined in singing the following pretty song, which had been written by pencil, and went to the tune of the tattoo. Our song shall swing like the wind, like the wind, till the bridal pair are enshrined or enshrined, and they curtsied both like a stick, do you mind, for their wood inside with kid for a rind, hurrah, hurrah, wood and skin well combined, we'll sing it out loud to the rain and the wind. Then the presents were given, but they had declined any edibles, love was enough for them without anything else. Shall we go into the country or travel abroad? asked the bridegroom. And then they consulted the swallow, which had traveled so much, and the old mother hen, which had reared five broods of chickens. The swallow told them all about the delightful warm countries where the grapes hung in luscious clusters, and where the air was so mild, and the colors on the mountains were such as were not to be found elsewhere. But they haven't got our green cabbage, said the hen. I was in the country all one summer with my chicks. There was a gravel pit that we scratched in all day, and then we got a mission to a garden where the cabbage grew. Oh, how green it was! I can't imagine anything more beautiful. But one cabbage is just like another said the swallow, and then there's so much bad weather here. Oh, we're used to that, said the hen. But it's so cold, it freezes. That's good for the cabbage, said the hen. Besides, sometimes it is warm enough. Four years ago, didn't we have a summer with tremendous heat? For five weeks, one could hardly breathe. And then we don't have all the poisonous creatures they have abroad, and there are no robbers. Anyone who doesn't think our own country the best must be a fool. He doesn't deserve to live here. And then the hen began to cry. I've had my journeys too. I once traveled twelve miles in a barrel, and there's no pleasure in traveling. <sighs> ah. The hen is a wise woman, said Bertha the doll. I don't like traveling among mountains either. For first you go up and then you go down. No, we will move out by the gravel pit and take our walks in the cabbage garden. 
and that was the end of it. Saturday Are we going to have some stories? asked little Hamar, as soon as Ole Lukage had got him to bed. We haven't time for any tonight, said Ole, as he opened his prettiest umbrella. Just look at these Chinese. The whole umbrella looked exactly like a big Chinese bowl, with blue trees all over it, and arched bridges on which stood little people nodding their heads. We must have the whole world polished up for tomorrow, said Ole. It is a holiday, for it is Sunday. I must go up into the church tower to see if the little church brownies are polishing the bells so that they may sound well. I must go into the fields to see if the wind has blown the dust off the grass and leaves. My biggest piece of work is to get down all the stars to polish them. I take them in my apron, but first I have to number each one, and the holes they belong have to be numbered too so that they may go back into their proper places, or they wouldn't stick, and then we should be having too many falling stars. One after the other would drop out. Now I say, Mr. Lukage, said one of the old portraits hanging on the wall, I am Homer's great-grandfather. I am much obliged to you for telling him stories. But you mustn't puzzle his brains. The stars can't be taken down to be polished. The stars are planets just like our Earth, and that's the best of them. Much obliged to you, old great-grandfather, said Ole Lukage. My best thanks to you. You are the head of the family. You are an antiquity. But I am older than you. I'm an old heathen. The Greeks and the Romans call me Dream God. I have my footing in the grandest houses. I can get on both with big and little. You may tell the stories yourself. And then Ole Lukage went away and took his umbrella with him. I suppose one mayn't give an opinion now said the old portrait, and then Hallmar woke. Sunday Good evening, said Ole Lukage, and Hallmar nodded, and then he jumped up and turned great-grandfather's portrait with its face to the wall, so that it should not talk as it did last time. Now you must tell me some stories about the five green peas which lived in the peas pod, and about the cock paying his addresses to the hen, and about the darning needle, which was so fine that it fancied it was an ordinary needle. You may have too much of a good time, said Ole Lukage. I would rather show you something you know. I will show you my brother. He is also called Ole Lukage, but he never comes more than once to anybody. And when he comes, he takes them away with him on his horse, and tells them stories. He only knows two, one which is so beautiful that nobody on earth can imagine it, and one which is too terrible to be described. And then Ole lifted little Hamar up to the window, and said, Now you can see my brother, the other Ole Lukage. He is also called Death. You see, he doesn't look at all bad, as he sometimes does in pictures, all bones and joints. No, he has silver embroidered border around his coat. It is a hossor's uniform, and a black velvet cloak streams out behind over his horseback. See how they are galloping? And Hallmar saw how Ole Lukage rode off, taking both old and young with him on his horse. He put some of them before him and some behind, but he always asked first, What character have you in your mark book? They all said, Good. Let me see myself, said he. And then they had to show him the book, 
all those who had been very good or excellent against their names were put up in the front of him and were told the most delightful stories but those who had only pretty good or tolerable had to sit behind him and were told horrible stories they shivered and cried and tried to get off the horse but they couldn't do that because they grew fast to it at once but death is a beautiful Ole Lukic, said Homar. I am not a bit afraid of him. Nor need you be, said Ole Lukic, if only you take care to have a good character in your book. Ah, now that's instructive, mumbled Great Grandfather's portrait. It's some good, after all, to speak one's mind and he was quite pleased. Now this is the story about Ole Lukic. Tonight, he can tell you some more himself. End of section 40. Recording by Timothy Nielsen. www.mrtimmy.com Section 41 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Furlong. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Miss Edgar Lucas. The Swine Herd. There was once a poor prince. He had only quite a tiny kingdom, but it was big enough to allow him to marry, and he was bent upon marrying. Now it certainly was rather bold of him to say to the emperor's daughter, Will you have me? He did, however, venture to say so, for his name was known far and wide, and there were hundreds of princesses who would have said, Yes, and thank you kindly but see if she would. Just let us hear about it. A rose tree grew on the grave of the prince's father. It was such a beautiful rose tree. It only bloomed every fifth year, and then only bore one blossom. But what a rose that was! By merely smelling it, one forgot all one's cares and sorrows. Then he had a nightingale, which sang as if every lovely melody in the world dwelt in her little throat. This rose and this nightingale were to be given to the princess, so they were put into great silver caskets and sent to her. The emperor had them carried before him into the great hall, where the princess was playing at, visiting with her ladies-in-waiting. They had nothing else to do. When she saw the caskets with the gifts, she clasped her hands with delight. If only it were a little pussycat, said she. But there was the lovely rose. Oh, how exquisitely it is made, said all the ladies-in-waiting. It is more than beautiful, said the emperor. It is neat. But the princess touched it, and then she was ready to cry. Fie, papa, she said. It is not made, it is a real one. Fie said all the ladies-in-waiting. It is a real one. Well, let us see what there is in the other casket, before we get angry, said the emperor, and out came the nightingale. It sang so beautifully that at first no one could find anything to say against it. Superb! Charmon! said the ladies-in-waiting, for they all had a smattering of French. One spoke it worse than the other. Oh, that bird reminds me of our lamented empress's music box, said an old courtier. Ah, yes, they are the same tunes, and the same beautiful execution. So they are, said the emperor, and he cried like a little child. I should hardly think it could be a real one, said the princess. Yes, it is a real one, said those who had brought it. Oh, let that bird fly away, then said the princess, and she would not hear of allowing the prince to come. But he was not to be crushed. He stained his face brown and black, 
and pressing his cap over his eyes, he knocked at the door. Good morning, Emperor, said he. Can I be taken into service in the palace? Well, there are so many wishing to do that, said the Emperor. But let me see. Yes, I need somebody to look after the pigs, for we have so many of them. So the prince was made imperial swineherd. A horrid little room was given to him near the pigsties, and here he had to live. He sat busily at work all day, and by the evening he had made a beautiful little cooking pot. It had bells all round it, and when the pot boiled, they tinkled delightfully and played the old tune. Och, du lieber Augustin, all ist wiest week. Alas, dear Augustine, all is lost, lost. But the greatest charm of all about it was that by holding one's finger in the steam, one could immediately smell all the dinners that were being cooked at every stove in the town. Now this was a very different matter from a rose. The princess came walking along with all her ladies-in-waiting, and when she heard the tune, she stopped and looked pleased, for she could play Ock du Liber Augustine herself. It was her only tune, and she could only play it with one finger. Why, that is my tune, she said. This must be a cultivated swineherd. Go and ask him what the instrument costs. So one of the ladies-in-waiting had to go into his room, but she put her pattens on first. How much do you want for the pot? she asked. I must have ten kisses from the princess, said the swineherd. Heaven preserve us, said the lady. I won't take less, said the swineherd. Well, what does he say? asked the princess. I really cannot tell you, said the lady-in-waiting. It is so shocking. Then you must whisper it. And she whispered it. He is a wretch, said the princess, and went away at once. But she had only gone a little way when she heard the bells tinkling beautifully. Ach, du lieber Augustine. Go and ask him if he will take ten kisses from the ladies-in-waiting. No, thank you, said the swineherd. Ten kisses from the princess, or I keep my pot. How tiresome it is, said the princess. Then you will have to stand round me, so that no one may see. So the ladies-in-waiting stood round her and spread out their skirts, while the swineherd took his ten kisses, and then the pot was hers. What a delight it was to them. The pot was kept on the boil day and night. They knew what was cooking on every stove in the town, from the chamberlains to the shoemakers. The ladies-in-waiting danced about and clapped their hands. We know who has sweet soup and pancakes for dinner and who has cutlets. How amusing it is! Highly interesting, said the mistress of the robes. Yes, but hold your tongues, for I am the emperor's daughter. Heaven preserve us, they all said. The swineherd, that is to say the prince, only nobody knew that he was not a real swineherd did not let the day pass in idleness, and he now constructed a rattle. When it was swung round, it played all the waltzes, gallops, and jig tunes which have ever been heard since the creation of the world. But this is superb, said the princess as she walked by. I have never heard final compositions. Go and ask him what the instrument costs. But let us have no more kissing. He wants a hundred kisses from the princess said the lady-in-waiting. I think he is mad, said the princess, and she went away. But she had not gone far when she stopped. One must encourage art, she said. I am the emperor's daughter. Tell him he can have ten kisses, the same as yesterday, and he can take the others from the ladies-in-waiting. But we don't like that at all, said the ladies. Oh, nonsense! If I can kiss him, you can do the same. Remember that I pay your wages as well as give you board and lodging. So the lady-in-waiting had to go again. A hundred kisses from the princess, or let each keep his own. Stand in front of me, said she, and all the ladies stood round while he kissed her. Whatever is the meaning of that crowd round the pigsties? said the emperor, as he stepped out onto the veranda. He rubbed his eyes and put on his spectacles. 
Why, it is the ladies in waiting. What game are they up to? I must go and see. So he pulled up the heels of his slippers, for they were shoes which he had trodden down. Bless us, what a hurry he was in. When he got into the yard, he walked very softly, and the ladies were so busy counting the kisses, so that there should be fair play, and neither too few nor too many kisses, that they never heard the emperor. He stood on tiptoe. What is all this? he said when he saw what was going on, and he hit them on the head with his slipper, just as the swineherd was taking the eighty-sixth kiss. Out you go, said the emperor, for he was furious, and both the princess and the prince were put out of his realm. There she stood crying, and the swineherd scolded, and the rain poured down in torrents. Oh, miserable creature that I am, if only I had accepted the handsome prince. Oh, how unhappy I am. The swineherd went behind a tree, wiped the black and brown stain from his face, and threw away his ugly clothes. Then he stepped out dressed as a prince. He was so handsome that the princess could not help curtsying to him. I am come to despise thee, he said. Thou wouldst not have an honorable prince. Thou couldst not prize the rose or the nightingale. But thou wouldst kiss the swineherd for a trumpery musical box. As thou hast made thy bed, so must thou lie upon it. Then he went back into his own little kingdom and shut and locked the door. So she had to stand outside and sing in earnest. Ach, du lieber Augustin, allest wiest weg. Alas, dear Augustin, all is lost, lost. End of section 41. Recording by Michelle Furlong.